All right. Hello. Welcome to my stream today. Um, it's going to be fun. We are going to be talking about Rust, WebAssembly, Web UIs, um, a lot of really cool stuff. Um, yeah, let's give people a moment to kind of join on. Come say hi in the chat if you're here. Um, I'm going to maybe post some stuff on social um, here for a moment. Let's see what we got here. All right. Yeah. Now it works. Uh, I don't know what was up. YouTube was being weird. Hey. Hi, everyone. Yeah, let's kind of get this going. I gotta, I'm just going to get this up on Twitter and whatnot. I'm a, I'm a little bit behind the times here because I was actually just doing a podcast on Pod Rocket pretty much back to back. So um, I have not put up the live thing. Yeah, hey, yeah, thanks for joining on. Um, actually, I'm going to see if I can even present my screen. I remember that one time that, you know, all right, let's see here, profile. Yeah, it's working, sweet. Let's, uh, let's find, find this. A lot of cool stuff this week in JavaScript, but not in JavaScript. Um, gonna talk about that a bit later, but let's just give people, it's tough to go on, let's go here. Live, talking Rust Web API UIs. And I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna drop my Twitch thing because that's that's nice. Twitch.com slash Ryan Solid. Hopefully that's right. Whatever. Alright. Alright, how's everyone doing today though? I noticed a comment um, that I, I probably wanna mention here in a second. Uh about my love of types and types, uh, TypeScript. And I think that might be, uh, um, I think, I think it's a, a misunderstood, misunderstood is the best way I can put it. Cause I am, while I might have made comments about TypeScript, I, uh, how should I put this? Um, I am not a hater of TypeScript. Um, and I'm not a hater of typed languages. I've used actually several typed languages. This is in regards to this comment here. Um, I actually just think that types in JavaScript are kind of awkward. I think it's, it's actually TypeScript that is tricky. I've used like, um, you know, a number of other typed languages. Um, it was just, it's, it's actually TypeScript specifically, which I find awkward. Um, I kind of joked with uh, Prime the other day that, um, you know, about learning Rust, and, I'm, and I was like, oh, it's got to be better than TypeScript, right? Um, so that, 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 I just want to clarify that. I, I'm not a hater of types. It's just that I think it's hard to type a language that was made to be dynamic. And then, like, it's just difficult to act like the types are always there. Anyway. Uh yeah. How, how how's everyone doing? I I just like streaming this off because now that I'm an affiliate and you get those terrible ad rolls, we got to give people a few minutes to actually join on. And I'm not cool enough to have one of those intros. In fact, I think someone made one of those intros for me. You know, like the like, you know, now waiting with the cool music, but then I'd have to figure out how to actually link it up. So yeah. Yeah, so what about Pocket Rocket? Yeah, no, I did a solid start uh, po um, podcast. It should be out probably, hopefully, towards the end of the month, maybe early New Year. But yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Is Rust the next TypeScript? I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll find that out today. I heard there's like some other fun stuff with Rust, you know, like compile times, but like I, I don't know anything. We're gonna, I'm going to learn everything today. So, yeah. This is a good point. TypeScript when consuming packages is a completely different story than writing packages consumed by others. Yes, definitely. And I, 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 on both sides, I think you, you should be writing TypeScript because the benefit for the end users is huge to have that API all typed. It's beneficial if you're writing an application, you should be writing in TypeScript. So like everyone should be writing in TypeScript. It's just, I don't have to always like it because it's, 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 it's like that, I think I've used this before. It's like that, like what was it, Batman 
not Batman Begins, the middle movie, the one with the Joker, who wears like the thing we deserve versus the, th- you know, the thing we need or whatever. I, I'm a terrible paraphrase on that one, but that's the, how I feel about TypeScript. I'd be, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to touch rust myself today. I, this is, this is like a learning kind of first experience here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I know there's a lot of interest in rust. Yeah, yeah, no, that's the, the, the real streamer. That's when I'll be a real streamer when I when I figure out how to have those cool intros. Yeah, JavaScript is awkward. It kind of like lets you do anything and everything. Um, I guess it's kind of like Vue. We like Vue. We like JavaScript. So yeah, I know. All right. How many engineering hours do you think we'll waste the next decade making WASM wow, widget? You. Nothing that we do today. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is interesting. I think there's, I think there's clear trade-offs, and I think those trade-offs will exist for a long time. I don't think it's, I think the narrative right now is too simple, and I think we'll get into that today. Yeah. All right. Uh, sarcasm. Yeah. No, it's good. Once you go TypeScript, you can't go back. Yeah, yeah, that's what I hear. Honestly, for me personally, I don't find this the case. Like, honestly, I, I, I like enjoy going back to ty- uh, JavaScript. I just know from like a principle standpoint, like it's the wrong move. Like everything should be written in, 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 uh, in TypeScript. It's just like, it's just one of those things. Like, you do what you do. You do the right thing, not necessarily the thing you want to do. Um, I do wonder if there's like a better typed language. You know, it, it's just, I, it's the gap, right? Like, I don't want to pretend that TypeScript and JavaScript are equivalent. Like, that you like that you can do every... Because, like, like th- there's things you want to do with TypeScript. You want it to achieve a certain goal. So you can't act like you can do everything in JavaScript if you're on that. Like, technically, you can do everything in JavaScript, but you might not necessarily achieve that goal. And if that's the goal, we shouldn't pretend like TypeScript is like a superset of JavaScript in a sense. It's, it's a subset. Um, but like, I, I'm, I'm talking very much on like semantics here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So have I wasted enough time yet? <laughs> oh, interesting correlation. Is, is this last holdouts because you were pro- CoffeeScript devs probably. I, I don't know. Like for me personally, yeah, CoffeeScript is like the opposite of TypeScript and completely aw- awesome in like a different way. It's like the it's like showing what like sometimes you can have two different extremes that are awesome. It's just the middle, the compromise that sucks. And CoffeeScript is kind of like that opposite side of things. Yeah, and it definitely made me not want to switch to TypeScript. Okay, enough t- just lingering around here. Yeah, 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 exactly. Proxies, functional programming. Okay. Um, I'm just, you know, we're doing a good job wasting time. Um, we, we probably, we probably need to, to actually get this going, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, I love just shooting stuff with you guys. Okay. Yeah. You much like types of more after use of flow type. Uh, no, not uh, the JavaScript type. I don't. I don't know. Honestly, I feel like if the language was typed in the first place, then that's what I'd be wanting. Because otherwise, you just invent a new language that looks kind of like the old language, which is fine. But I feel like we we need, we we need that. Anyway, yeah. Uh, explain your issues with TypeScript. Yeah, let's go back. I think I already put this up. Um, Type proxies, functional programming, JSX is another one. The, I bet that's a small one. They, they literally assume all JSX is like React. Like you literally can't make a JSX element a div. You like you can cast it, but you can't just go like this div is a div. You just like can't do it. Anyway, I'm I'm just ranting off. Let's let's actually get this rolling for once. So I I would like to welcome Greg to the stream. Eh? How you doing, Greg? Hey, great. How are you? I'm I'm pretty good. I'm just as as you might have saw there. I'm just kind of talking TypeScript with people because everyone loves TypeScript, and I, I'm, 
I think it's a necessary, like, I think it's necessary, but it's not like my favorite thing. I'm actually, as I said, I'm not anti type languages. So I'm very interested to learn more about, about Rust, but TypeScript is hard because of what it tries to force on JavaScript, in my opinion. Anyway, right. sorry. Um, but yeah, how, how about you tell us a little bit, bit, bit about yourself, Greg? Uh, who are yeah, you? Sure. I am, um, my name's Greg Johnston. Nice to meet you all. I'm the creator of the um, Leptos web framework. I am a, a freelance developer. Um, and I basically got into Rust because I had shot myself in the foot so many times in JavaScript. Um, like I have a day job um, that's 60% of my time. I freelance 40% of the time. I'm a parent 40% of the time. And now I'm an open source maintainer 25% of the time, which adds up to a, a large number. And I have had so many times where it's like a Wednesday morning and I'm a one man freelance show and all hell breaks loose in production on something. And it was because um, a function I could have sworn would never return undefined returned undefined. And then I tried to access some field on it or whatever. And it's so I actually got into um, got into Rust through my own um, my own bad practices as a JavaScript developer. So I do most of my most of my work that people paid me for is in um, Angular originally. And now I, I've done some work with clients using Solid, um, which has been a great experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, but I've Rust is sort of since I first got into it a couple of years ago has been a language I'm really excited about and being able to write my own projects and my own applications in kind of full stack rust is how I got to where I am. So I see, I, I, like I saw Nova. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just want to say, I saw um, Nova in the chat and just want to give a shout out to like an actual rust expert. I'm a, I'm a, a happy rust user, but there are some people who are real um, titans in the rust community. Um, so good to see you here. Yeah. Cause what I want, I just want to pause a moment on angular. Um, yeah. So when you say just I want to clarify, when you say angular, do you mean angular or angular JS? I just want to know which one. I mean, angular. Okay. which I started on probably Angular 4 or something and is now right. on Angular a gajillion. F um, 15. Yeah, I think yeah. 15 just came out, yeah. Yeah, it sounds right. Um, I, I, most, of my, most of the Angular stuff I'm working with is a kind of legacy, and I have done some updates recently, but I'm probably running older versions of, of Angular than that. But Angular is actually kind of how I got into the reactive programming stuff through that kind right. of Angular RX. Oh, like, yeah, RX, yeah. Originally, yeah, yeah. Um, just in that, yeah. like I, people, people maybe don't know this. This is just a tangent about Angular before we start. Um, like a lot of Angular tutorials and things lead you down a really bad path because RxJS is sort of deeply embedded in that framework. Like they use it for Angular core libraries and stuff. Like their HTTP client is built on RxJS, but it doesn't actually drive the change detection. So a lot of these Angular tutorials and stuff will have you create an observable, subscribe to it, and then like set um, stateful variables from the subscription. Right. And there's actually this other thing that you can just put this async pipe in a template in Angular and it will manage all the subscription for you and clean up properly. And okay. it's super clean. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. Just one question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 this is highly un irregular, but my wife is called like three times back to back. I need AJ's asking what the sound is. I just got to answer this. Sorry, stream. Just give me two seconds. Okay. No problem. Ryan, I'm just yeah, keep if you want, on Angular. Yeah, yeah, yeah you just, just keep going. Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so anyway, so like a lot of, um, I don't know if you all have used Angular or not, but a, a lot of um, kind of good practice in Angular is you want to compose these observables in a way that you can write the observable within the body of your function. And then you kind of um, subscribe to it in the template and it displays it. Um, and you have these kind of observable streams that you're creating with all of their um, operators and adapters and stuff. Um, and that was kind of how I got into the the reactive. It's it's a little bit of functional reactive programming, um, but it's almost the opposite of Solid JS. If you're familiar with Solid, like you have to start by combining these um, these observables explicitly, and then you do operations on them. Uh, and it's kind of like you have this dependency array up front, and then you're doing these operations on it. Um, so anyway, like seeing, I, I kind of tried to recreate that sort of thing in. Um, in Rust a couple times. And once I sort of found solid in the last year or two, um, it became really clear that you can actually do that kind of reactive programming without um, without the dependency arrays needing to be explicit. And that was, that was pretty exciting. So a lot of how I kind of ended up doing this was through, okay, iterations on what does React 
activity look like in Rust and the, the solid JS. And I know, I know Ryan, you didn't invent signals, but like the, the solid JS approach with the auto tracking um, signals is a really neat solution to a lot of problems I had run into with RxJS of like combined latest of, and having like six different observables you need the latest value from and that kind of explicit dependency array. Right, right. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, no, and that makes a lot of sense because like I, I'm not, there were people who follow the channel for a long time know this. I actually tried to use uh, Rx type primitives, like because there's a TC39 proposal for R, for like for observables, and I was like, okay, I'm going to build solid off spec. I'm going to use web components and I'm going to use observables. And like there was this time in 2016, 17, I was like really following um, uh, Anders Daltz and like like Cycle JS and all that stuff. And I was like, I was like. Maybe I'll build something kind of like Knockout, but with RX. And it was just like, I was fighting like every single part of it from like Cold's uh, producers to like freaking, uh, like you, like how, like only behaviors have values. You can't pull from RX. Like, so like, yeah, I can, I can, it's like, it's really good for streams, which makes sense. Uh, it, it's like, it's a transformation thing. It's not, it's not particularly great for trying to like do a bunch of course synchronizations in like 50 different places at the same time. So yeah. um, they work, they can work together if you can pipe them together, but it, for the, like the core of the UI framework, I don't think it's necessarily the right choice. And I think that's why the Angular team is actually looking at signals. I, I, um, I've been talking to them a bunch actually. Um, and we're going to be talking to them a bit more soon. They're definitely exploring what it means to have this kind of, I don't know what to call it. Like, I don't know if it's lighter, but like this type of reactivity. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. So yeah, okay. So that's how you got the reactive uh, perspective, of kind of playing around, or doing stuff yeah. with Angular. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I mean, want to get into it? Want to talk about Rust WebAssembly? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, we we could probably we could probably get started right pretty quick here. I always like tend to dwell on points for way too long in tangent, but yeah, yeah. the truth of the matter is. Um, I don't really have anything more to say about Angular. Um, <laughs> um, but okay, I, I do have a, like one question yeah. for that. Like, just out of curiosity, because um, as people know, Leptos has uh, some inspiration from the signals and work I've done in Solid. Um, how how did you, in, in case I missed this when I was on the off the headphones, how did you actually find Solid in the first place? I'm just curious. That's such a good question. Um, I think what happened right is. I um, I was doing this stuff in Angular, and I'm like, okay, how do I compose these reactive, observable, you know, chains in a functional way? And so I'm just like anybody else, googling stuff, whatever. And I kind of learned about functional reactive programming, which is its own kind of paradigm, right? Which um, is really tricky, honestly. Like I I had a lot of I actually that my first Rust. UI library was a functional reactive programming library. And it, I found it just really hard to implement basic stuff because I think, I think a lot of us think in terms of mutations, like I would like to add a to do to this list. I don't want to listen for the events of add to do and then do this other thing to get an ID out of some, like it was really hard for me to think in those ways. Um, right. And so, but I always knew kind of reactive, reactive programming was interesting. Um, and I think it was really around the time, um, you know, I was kind of doing this work on my own, trying to develop different ways of like reactive programming in Rust. Um, and around, I feel like around a year ago, Solid really had a big increase in popularity. And I just started seeing seeing mentions on, you know, front end Twitter type worlds. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll check this out. And then it was, it was pretty immediately obvious to me. Um, I had also, I guess around the same time, probably I um, played around with Sycamore a little bit, which is kind of the the original um, solid inspired Rust framework. Um, and there are some things I don't love about about Sycamore, um, but it kind of clicked like, okay, this is this solves a lot of the problems that I had found difficult in, in particular. And we can talk about this. In, hmm. It's really hard. I, I was using this async stream based approach in Rust, which was a lot like an RxJS type approach, except right. that in, in Rust, it's really hard to combine two streams and get the latest value of each one and do some work with them. That kind of RxJS composing combine latest or yeah. like combine latest. It, okay, right. And in Rust, because of the ownership model in Rust, it's it's actually quite hard to do that. And I had to sort of create a, a way of getting around that. Um, 
and it's just messy. Um, and then seeing that kind of auto tracking model um, really clicked for me. So I kind of knew, okay, I'm mostly working in Rust. Um, I really like this SolidJS model. Obviously, like practically speaking for me, it's a lot easier um, if I'm doing work for somebody to be doing it in, in JavaScript um, just in the sense of, you know, being able to hand it off to someone else in the future or whatever. Um, but I was, I have a lot of control over things. So I was able to do some projects in solid and kind of learn. Um, and it just makes sense as a model to me. So people will notice like the implementation is actually pretty different in some ways. And in other ways, it's like a port of DOM expressions. Um, but right. the, the reactive implementation is, is pretty different, but a lot of the APIs are really similar to solid. Cause I think in a lot of ways, they're just kind of the right um, approach. I mean, that's funny. I've thought about it for a long time. So it's, that's where I get the most friction. It's funny. It feels like because people see the benchmarks and they see, they get the overall red thing, but then it's the APIs where they're, where they're like, they're like, and, and, and don't, there's the right use of the right case, I think. But it's, it's, it, I have to say almost more definitive statements so that people don't like do really terrible stuff and not realize why. But yeah, I, that's, that, that is interesting because I know Sycamore and Leptos did slightly different choices on the API side of things, but we can probably look at that much, much later on. We're, when we We're going to look at, at it and in, in particular, I'm going to show off Sycamore 0 0.7 and then how, um, which is the last version and then how Sycamore 0 0.8 and Leptos kind of solve some of the problems that you get out of like a Sycamore 0 0.7 and earlier in different ways. Um, so that'll okay. be kind of a little later in what I what I was going to show off. Okay. Well then, yeah. Uh, let, let me. I'm going to actually throw a banner up here. It makes it easier. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, wh yeah, where are we starting right now? What should I call this banner just so I can have a good marker? Um, should we start with start Wasm? With some very simple. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Start. Start with Wasm. Then we'll do a little bit of Rust, and then we'll do vanilla okay. Rust. Uh, All right. Wasm. All right, then I'm going to just do this. All right, let's just do this. Here we go. All right, so perfect, great. Yeah, tell tell us a little bit about Wasm uh, and awesome. yeah, yeah. So so Wasm WebAssembly um, is basically one of the four programming languages that can run in your browser. So you obviously have HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then there's this mysterious fourth thing called WebAssembly. And it's, it's basically a compilation target for compiled languages. So um, it's a binary format, it's um, platform independent, and the browser will compile it to native code. So you can use it to compile um, Rust, Go, C Sharp, whatever compiled language, C++, C, um, into this WebAssembly binary format. And then it gets streamed down to the browser and compiled into native code and runs. So in the same way that um, if you load a website, it might load some JavaScript, parse the JavaScript, run the JavaScript. You can load a website, which will load a WebAssembly file, which it has to do via JavaScript. Um, but it will then download the WebAssembly, compile it, and run it. So it's basically a way of writing um, the kind of code you would write in JavaScript for a browser in other languages. And rather than compiling Rust to JavaScript or something, you can compile to this WebAssembly target and then run um, run code in the browser. Right. Um, it's funny. The, the even though you just gave a great explanation, the chat's more focused on the fact that you called HTML uh, a language. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> right. But no, I, HTML is a language. Like if you look, I people like. I don't know, programming or what is programming or what is coding, that's the whole thing. But if you have some kind of defined syntax and semantics that performs a certain behavior, I think it counts as a language. Yeah, well, I mean, what is it if not a language? Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so and it, it, so I was saying this to you before the, the stream started, but I hear two kind of um, takes on Twitter or Reddit or whatever about WebAssembly, which are both pretty wrong. And so it's very common to see um, somebody posts like, man, WebAssembly is amazing. In two or three years, everybody's going to be writing their, their whole apps in Rust. They're going to compile it to WebAssembly. They're going to ship it down to the browser. And you're going to render your whole UI in a canvas. And it's going to be super fast and amazing. Um, this is not a good idea. Can explain that. And then the, like the, the smart money conventional wisdom response is somebody comes into their replies and is like, no way. Wasm is way too slow in accessing the DOM. If you want to write your back end in Rust or whatever, 
do that and then write a nice front end in Svelte, Preact, maybe some solid. Um, and, you know, that's the way to actually do your DOM stuff. Um, and those are basically both wrong. Like on the one hand, it's, it's a terrible idea to create a whole UI rendered in a canvas and ship that down to the browser. The browser mm. already does that work for you, right? Like if you ship down a megabyte of WebAssembly in order to render widgets in a way that you can't style with CSS and that's totally inaccessible, like you've just wasted so much of your time. And, and if you're and Google, the Spotify and, team or whatever. <laughs> yeah, this is an and Google's money, apparently. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're on the Flutter team and you want to do that, whatever, that's 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 your call. Um, but like, don't do it yourself, right? Um, and like, granted, you can do a lot of work to make the accessibility and stuff happen. Like that's that I'm not I'm not meaning to trash them, but I don't think that's the future of the web. I think the future of the web is the web platform. Um, and it turns out that like WebAssembly, there are some actual performance limitations um, on WebAssembly's access to the DOM right now, but um, that's all else being equal. So like everything else being equal, a solid JS implemented in Rust compiling to WASM will be a little bit slower than a solid JS in JS. But solid JS in JS is so much faster than something like a Svelte, a Preact, a React, an Angular that Leptos, solid JS in Rust, is going to perform better than Svelte, even though people think of Svelte as being really snappy, um, because it's right. like the architecture swamps that overhead from the WASM. Um, right, and and that's that's largely why I wanted to kind of bring you in and start talking about this, because this is a, a trend that I started noticing about ugh, just over a year ago. I was like, I've been watching, I, you know, like I just kept watching the Rust libraries, just kind of like teeter up, 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 you know, across it. And it was kind of interesting to me because like, um, I'd heard this Dom story and I had some experts, you know, people who'd basically suggested as much to me and talking about how, when this new blank thing comes out in WASM, you know, it'll do it. And, and then, and it would be like, and then every time that conversation happens, they're like, well, you know, maybe two, three years, you know, like it just like very loose conversation. I was just like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bother here, but I, I was still like, it, it was kind of hit this point where I, I like there's a bigger like I'd see Rust bind gen, which would, I guess we'll talk about in a minute, but I'd see it move up, you know, and then get to a pretty good place. But then the gap between the vanilla Rust and the frameworks was significantly larger than the gap between the fastest JavaScript frameworks and vanilla J JavaScript. And I was trying to figure out like why that is. And I, I thought part of it might just because JavaScript's got so hyper optimized on its tooling like around it that like you don't write JavaScript and get JavaScript. It, like JavaScript doesn't exist without build tools. And essentially like we've already kind of gone to a point where we're like compiling our JavaScript and maybe we've just gone so crazy down that like local maxima that like this is the truth. And but then I started when, when Rust library started showing better performance and showing up. Um, it was because they'd taken a different approach. They'd actually looked at SolidJS, for example. And I realized, that, you know, maybe this is different. And you offered a much better explanation for that. Yeah. And like there are real, so, so I should say that the main one, right, uh, what you're talking about is that I think it's, it was originally called the interface types proposal, which would allow WebAssembly to directly access the DOM. And right now, everything has to go out through this bridge via JavaScript. Um, and that includes some, due to uh, some annoying things, um, the cost of shipping strings across that is pretty high. So, uh, and of course, like creating DOM nodes is entirely strings because you have the tag name, you have all the right. attribute names, you have attribute values, you have text nodes, the entire page is strings. Um, so obviously there are ways of minimizing that, like using template node cloning and stuff like Solid does, like Leptos does. Um, but there is a real cost, it's just that if, so if we could get that interface types, it's now on the third iteration of that. It's been like four or five years. It's not anywhere close to happening. Um, in theory, yeah, the WASM frameworks could be just um, ounce for ounce as fast as the JavaScript ones. Um, but we don't need to wait for that anymore. Like we have, there, there are other things that are a little slow, like load times are still a problem um, with right. WASM binary size and stuff. Um, but in terms of just the raw DOM manipulation, um, that's just not the actual thing limiting performance anymore. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, and th that's, that's a really key um, observation because 
it's it, it not being the dom itself but being the things around the dom creation means that you can just maybe approach things a little bit different and and get you know get more get more performance and I, i'm gathering that's what you have done with leptos but part yeah, of it might have been yeah. changing to the reactivity model um that allowed you kind of to kind of bypass what people typically thought that bottleneck was versus yeah. it was very common early days for people to imitate vdoms and like react and they maybe they hit those bottlenecks like bigger for some reason or or i think so I um and i think that you know maybe there are different reasons for that but i, I think that's a big part of it is the is the what's the architecture that you're choosing. Um, and I think that Rust's ownership model led a lot of people early on. And by early on, it's like you know three, four, five years ago um, when people first start these Rust WASM frameworks into a VDOM type approach. And we'll, we'll see that once we start looking at a little Rust, like the, the U, U is the kind of big, um, biggest, most used Rust web framework and is a VDOM based kind of React style library. Um, there's something really clean and beautiful about their code because it fits really well with the Rust ownership model and the borrowing model. Um, right. It's just that in order to do that, it's actually hiding a huge abstraction, which is the whole virtual DOM runtime, which is making it slower, right? So, and obviously you can have fast VDOMs, um, but it's like in order for you to feel like you're writing this really clean, beautiful Rust code, it's actually hiding all this stuff. And you hear this with React, I think, sometimes too, right? It's like, this is just JavaScript. It's like, well, the reason it can look like it's just JavaScript to the developer is that you have 70 kilobytes of JavaScript in the background letting you do that, right? Um, right, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's always a lot of that. Svelte actually is usually the, my favorite example of that. <laughs> Although they don't claim to be just JavaScript, but then in a, just JavaScript in a different way. Like the reason you can just write let count and have that update is a ton of other stuff going on like javascript yeah. doesn't work like that i no. and to be fair all frameworks have this to a certain degree and it's not just because of compilation it's like because as i said react does their jsx compilation but like even when you look at hooks and stuff um i was in a conversation with jay phelps uh you know very prevalent in uh rxjs uh i think he worked at netflix um you know like uh he was saying that like he basically said that react had created their own language he said that even solid had created its own language essentially even if it wasn't the compiler side it was actually the the semantics around like like how you write stateful code and i think that was fair um but n not all these things are equivalent i think it's fine to just not pretend that it's just plain JavaScript, right? Like it's, I think this is something you've always done well is just acknowledging here's something that's a feature of, of solid as a library. And that allows you to build it out of primitives that then like you can reuse somewhere else because it's not part of the language. The, the only thing is the, the JSX transform. Like I, I understand the idea of talking about reactivity as a language, like that's a domain specific language type type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, I think that the, it's usually the users of, frameworks, right? Who are like, ah, oh, Svelte is just plain JavaScript, let whatever equals whatever. And it's like, yeah, in order to be just plain JavaScript, there's so much going on behind the scenes to make you feel like that's true. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and they, the, with its own set of trade-offs, so they said, you know, where the complexity gets pushed. One of my favorite examples is I, I've been really focusing on the role of escape hatches and stuff. And that's like my new unifying theory on this. Why, why React it has its friction point is because like every framework has escape patches. You always need those control pieces. Um, you always go beyond what they can do. And uh, the farther the framework gets from what it's able to perfectly abstract, even in those es escape patches, the, like, the more detached the developer feels in the idea of complication. So f when p people are sitting there complaining about use effect in React, they're complaining about the escape patch. Um, and I feel like, uh, like that, it, it kind of comes into like the distance we get from that is kind of, yeah, I don't know. Th this is just something I've been kind of thinking about in terms of web design, that this is actually, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, one of those ranges or something that you could maybe use as a metric to decide like where, like a, the qual a certain quality of your framework, like a certain characteristic that actually might matter is actually like, I, I don't have a term for this yet, but yeah. essentially based on how well, like escape hatches uh, match with the model. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think it's actually time now to actually get started on actual 
stuff. So like maybe maybe you got some stuff to share with Let's us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so first, I'll just say um, before I throw up a little a little Rust on the screen for anyone who does not know what Rust is. Um, Rust is a systems programming language, which means its main function is an alternative to languages like C++ and C. Like if you don't know, Rust is really um, the closest sort of cousin in comparison is, is C++. Like people switch from C++ to Rust. It doesn't give you some of the control that like a C does, but it's also much closer to the, to the machine than um, something like JavaScript or even something like you know Swift or Go or whatever. Um, I, I got one part of the question. I've heard Rust is the cure for cancer. Can you confirm? Um, no comment. Ferris, the, uh, there, there's a joke in there about Ferris the crab and cancer and, and whatever, but I don't know what it is. Um, okay. But so, so basically, the, the, the values of Rust are um, memory safety more than anything else, um, performance, and then I would say like expressiveness and developer experience. Um, so I'll just put up, I'll start sharing my screen and, and show yeah. you what the heck I'm talking about. All right. There we go. Let's get you in there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Can you get crabs from using Rust? Uh, chat is great. Okay. Good times. <laughs> so are we good? Can you see this um, this Hello World? Uh, I can see it. Yeah. I mean, I is this the this was the size we agreed upon, didn't we? We could, can you try one more? Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I um. So basically, right, like, you know, this is just Rust in VS Code, right? If I if I run this, it's going to compile it, and then it's going to print Hello World, right? This is not right. complicated stuff. Um, so when I'm talking about memory safety, um, this is what I mean. If, if you look at Rust, it's fairly familiar. If you're, you know, a JavaScript user, you can probably understand what's happening here. Fn is function. Main right. is going to be what runs. We've got the curly braces. Um, so instead of const and let in JavaScript, we have let and let mute mute for mutable. Um, okay. So let's say if I say like, let x equals zero. Good type. Um, x equals two. All right. This is an error, right? You cannot assign twice to the immutable variable x. Nice. It's okay. Make it mutable. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to make it mutable, right? That's fine. Um, I can do, you know, x plus equals one, print line, X and this is just going to print three, right? Um, so it's, does string know, interpolation work with just like any kind of quotes? Then is that just like a thing? So this is yeah, this this print line thing. Um, this is there are a couple of macros like this in in Rust. Okay. Um, so you have this um, quotes and then the curly braces, and you can put a simple variable name in there, or if you want to add other things, it could be like x times two here, right? Um, and right. You can put another little expression, and it's going to give us six. Um, okay. But so this is, you know, whatever. Um, but the reason that Rust cares so much about this mutability stuff, right? Um, you have three different things. You have a value that you own. You can have a reference to something which um, you don't own. Or you can have a mutable reference to something, which means that you're allowed, you don't own it, but you're allowed to change it. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, okay. You can have as many immutable references to something as you want, but there can only be one mutable reference. And if there's a mutable reference, there can be no other immutable references. So that's actually um, really that's actually really awesome in a sense, because yeah, like that's exactly. what I struggle with reactivity freaking all the time. I, you, you want to control that mutation. You don't want to just like pass something around a billion places and have everyone mutate it. Exactly. So this is just defining a, a little data structure we call data. It has a field called value. Um, I32 is in a 32-bit integer. integer. This is the kind of yeah. thing that you get in kind of lower level languages um, yeah. that if you're I just using JavaScript, you might not know, but. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, a VEC, that's an array. Okay. Um, I, yeah, this is bringing back memories. Uh, I, I did a lot of C plus uh, before I did C sharp um, and even there, you know, vector, right? The, the difference between uh, different array-like structures actually matters here. Right. So this little colon question mark is to do like a, a debug. 
Okay. Oh, right. Because I didn't. So, so you're seeing me. You're seeing me program live in Rust, right? Um. So this this prints a debug version of something. You can't just print a vector as a string. And now it's okay. telling me, um, you actually didn't derive the debug trait on this data struct. And it gives you these really helpful error messages. Like it told me, consider doing this. And so I'm going to just derive debug on that, which just means that it knows how to print the kind of debug version of it. Um, so you see this, and that's just a basic push statement, right? Like I'm pushing, okay. pushing a value onto it. OK. Yeah. Um, so now let's say I want to get the last value of this. So I'm going to say let last equals data uh, two. We've got a three okay. value thing, right? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. So is it is it very common to use a snake case for function names? Yep, it's all it's all snake case. Um, okay. So and it will actually cargo the um, Clippy, which is the little lint tool, will actually yell at you if you do camel case or anything else. Um, oh, okay. And so, right, so now let's say we've got this do stuff to the list function. Um, obviously, in this case, it's, it's really stupid. You'd never do this. But when you're working with um, you know, data across a whole application, you do stuff like this sometimes. Okay. And that's going to take a, a mutable reference to the data. Right. Um, and it's going to do some work on that data. Um, so let's say it just pops something off the list. OK. And we're going to print last. Um, you see the problem? Does anyone else see the problem here? I'm not a Rust problem. So I've taken this. This is actually not a problem in JavaScript, but it's a kind right. of logic error. Right. So I've taken a reference here yeah. to the oh. last item in this data vector. Gotcha. And now okay. I've done stuff to list, which has and now passed. there's nothing there. Yeah. Yep. So in JavaScript, someone correct me if I'm wrong. In JavaScript, where you have a garbage collector, um, each of these things, each of these data structures yeah. is an object that you create it, now the garbage collector knows that it exists. And so yeah. it's tracking all of those every references. What's yeah. As long as la yeah, as long as last exists, you're not going to lose reference to it. So, so last, right, has a reference to it. So when you pop it here, it's no longer in the data vec array, but it does still exist here. Rust right. doesn't add the overhead of the garbage collection, right? So these things um, the actual size in memory of this is four bytes. It's just that I32. Thir the, the wrapping struct yeah, bits, is yeah. actually just, yeah, is actually just um, only exists at compile time, right? It, it compiles away, um, which is something Rust tends to call like zero overhead abstractions, right? So you can right. do stuff that compiles away to nothing, um, which is more efficient at runtime, right? However, um, this is the problem. You're trying to solve the problem of memory safety without a garbage collector because garbage collectors have lower performance than not garbage collectors. Yep. Um, but if you do this, um, you now have a dangling reference. And a dangling reference means a reference into memory that has basically been freed. Yep. So when you create these things, you're allocating memory for that vector. And now the compiler basically can't guarantee what's in that memory. Because you've popped this thing off the stack, um, it off the end of that vector, I mean. It could be um, still the old data. It could be total garbage. Uh, it could have memory that was handed back to the operating system has been allocated to a completely different program, right? It, it can't guarantee anything about that. And this is the source of like a huge number of security issues in C, C++ um, right. code is these kinds of memory errors. And there are lots of different kinds of memory errors. Um, none of this has anything to do with front end, right? Um, right. We're in the browser. It's a sandboxed environment. WebAssembly is sandboxed, just like JavaScript. The worst thing that happens is your program crashes and you get an error in the console in the browser. Um, but these kinds of optimizations are the reason that Rust and C++ are the most used languages for WebAssembly. Because right. if you have a garbage collected language, you have to ship the garbage collector inside the yep. WASM binary. They're working on um, garbage collection for WASM now. Um, oh. But okay. yeah, it's like stage three, I think, at this point. So they're starting to implement stuff, um, which is cool. I mean, it'll be really good for things like Go. Um, but basically, like, it, it's part of what makes Rust so efficient relative to something like JavaScript, especially if you're going to like run it on the um, on the server, right? 
a, right, a, yeah. a Rust server is much more efficient than a JavaScript server because it's able to do these kinds of optimizations because it is a systems programming language. Um, but you have to follow these borrowing rules. So when people talk about fighting the borrow checker, this is the kind of thing they're talking about. Well, okay. I want to have some kind of immutable reference to something, but I also want to mutate it somewhere. Um, and if you just step back a second and you think about creating a user interface in a language like this, um, user interfaces are all about being able to mutate something yeah. from something else. Like if you talk about any kind of event listener or whatever in, in the DOM, um, it's about yeah. this thing needs to have permission to mutate this at any time. And that's exactly what Rust hates. Um, so we're going to look at um, how you actually do it. Right. <laughs> okay. And this is where we're going to start getting into, into some, some WebAssembly stuff. So um, ignore all my imports and stuff up here. So we're going to do okay. just like a bunch of vanilla, um, uh, vanilla Rust and WAS and BindGen stuff here. I'm using a, a build tool called Trunk, if anyone's curious, that does like live, live reloading and stuff um, and a dev server and so on. Um, but this is basically just, you know, a, a Rust binary file, just like the other one with an empty main and a bunch of other junk I've put in here. Um, and let's just see, like, uh, first of all, I'll give you the, the really vanilla WAS and BindGen version. Then we're going to use some Leptos helpers that will just make things a little okay. less cluttered. Um, so let's say let window equals WAS and BindGen window. Right. And what, what WAS and BindGen, this is yeah. like... I, I I was talking about it in the benchmarks because it's like the like the I called it the vanilla version. So this is just yeah. something that exports all the like DOM or web APIs. Like yeah, and I actually typed typed the wrong thing too. So Wasm BindGen is what generates uh, is is kind of the glue, the bridge between WebAssembly and JavaScript. And then yeah. there's a separate package called WebSys, which they, it's cool. They actually take um, what are called Web IDL um, files, inter, in, Web Interface definition language probably i think um yeah. but which which actually define like all of the web standard apis and they use those to auto generate rust functions okay. and then bind them to the, the javascript so when we do this like let window equals web sys window um this is calling out to the the window you know window yeah. object you have in your javascript right um but you see it, it returns an option which is we in rust we don't have undefined we have um and we don't have exceptions. So we have option, which can either be some value or none. And then instead of exceptions, there's this result type we'll probably see in a second. So when you call window, um, this kind of makes sense, right? Because there are environments you could be in. Um, I can't think, like, do you have window in web workers, for example? I, I don't know where you don't um, have it. Um, we, I mean, we don't have window in node. Right. But. So I, you know, I guess I guess it's it's not guaranteed that you have access to a window yeah. object at any given point. Okay, um, so in in Rust we can handle this in a better way. Um, the sort of messy way is just to say dot expects. Um, so this just unwraps it. It's going to just crash if there's no window, but we're running in the browser. There will be a window. Okay, okay. and then we're going to say let document equals window dot document. Let body equals document dot body. Okay. Except I'm pretty sure this also returns an option, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> because there might not be a document in the window. Okay. There might not. So be this a this is how you this is how you help it make the nice error messages. Because yep. so when like, it, this, now when it panics, it will give you that expect message. Got you. Okay. You could just do um, dot unwrap, which just panics with unreachable code or something um, as the message. Expect is kind of the nice one. If you are writing real application code, you shouldn't be unwrapping or expecting this much stuff. But we just we know that there's going to be a body on this HTML page. It's it's okay. fine. Okay. Um, okay. So now let's just say, um, you know, let p equals document dot create element. Yeah. P. Um, so p dot strange seeing snake case like this. Uh -huh. I mean, I use snake case for years on databases and on backends, even in CoffeeScript and JavaScript. But to seeing it for the function names is the one that's that's yeah. taking me a moment. Yeah. Oh, and see, like, again, I'm, it, this is why Rust Analyzer is great. It's giving me some help here. Um, oops, we're getting covered. But um, so, like, even creating an element returns a result because that could throw an exception, I guess, of some kind. Okay. And so uh, okay, it, okay. It, you know, it prevents you. 
Um, set inner text is coming to me here because there is no set inner text. There's inner text yeah. and you can assign it or there's and what um, I meant was set, set text content. Right, yeah. Okay. But so but that's, like that's really calling it as a function. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Because instead of, we don't have getters and setters in rust. And so, uh, I could say, um, P dot text content is a function that returns option string there may be some text content and if i want to set it i do set text content okay interesting see so okay yeah this is just interesting because as i said those apis are generally from a javascript standpoint people view them almost like they're just plain properties on the object you know just like assign it or, or whatnot so okay right um i i don't actually know what port i'm on okay 8081 cool so that's um hello wasm and if i want to change this um make sure i'm actually in the right place is where you see the compile time comments. Okay, hello, Ryan. There we go, right? So yeah, I'm gonna yeah. make this probably a little bigger for you guys. All right. So this is this is you know this is pretty basic um, DOM manipulation stuff just done in Rust in a way that's um, a little messy. Uh, but what we're gonna do, I think, is just do a kind of basic counter example where we're going to um, have a counter with a value with a plus one button and a minus one. Sure. Button. Um, so let's start. Um, with just the increment button. Uh, at this point, I am just going to switch over to using some leptos helper things that wrap some okay. of these error messages and stuff. Um, so this like okay. create element function. These are internal things. Like if you're actually writing leptos code, you wouldn't be using this stuff. Um, yep. Create element button and increment dot set text content. The, the 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 get the get and set functions are really funny to me, just because like like they're almost the the default, like almost like the expectation that you'd have a get and set function, um, which is refreshing to me for some reason. Yeah, and it's I would say it's it's the sort of thing that's not common in actual native Rust code. Like you wouldn't okay. have a getter and a setter like that most of the time. You would have a mutable reference to something. I mean, maybe if you're trying to provide an API, you might do that. Um, but you'll notice none of these, like when I have set text content here, yeah. This takes a plain reference, not a mutable reference. Um, right. And that's part of this wrapper thing. Like you're calling out to JavaScript, which has no concept of this mutability. You're trusting right. if I call this function, JavaScript is going to handle this thing. It doesn't have that Rust ownership going on. Um, right. OK. OK, so now we've got our two, our two buttons, right? Um, except that I didn't append that one. And if you see it giving me these errors, right, this again is Rust being like, hey, um, this might throw in an exception when you append that child. Right now, you're ignoring that exception, and that's fine. But it, it does give a warning um, just to tell you this, this may cause an error. Um, right. Anyway, so I click these buttons. Nothing, nothing's going to happen. Um, do you want to see the really messy version that involves a lot of boilerplate for an event listener or just use the quick version? Uh, yeah, we can probably use the quick version. It's <laughs> fine. So. We're going to just add click handlers to these things. Um, so I'll just acknowledge that it's not this simple usually. OK. Exactly. Um, but it, that's just wrapping stuff. Again, you would never have to do right. this if you were using an actual WASM framework. Yeah. It's just the some of the bridge code. Um, so this is, yeah. a, this, is a, this, is a, um, this is the closure format. This is the same as open parenthesis, close parenthesis would be. Um, okay. And I actually probably will leave out that move for now. So I'm going to define a variable that we're going to call um, uh, count. And it's going to be a mutable, mutable variable because we're going to change it. And when you click the increment, it's going to add plus one. Okay. I'm just going to wrap this. Um, and then what do we want to do? Like we probably, um, we're going to do the old school, the event listeners are both going to update that um, that paragraph. So we're going to do okay. p.set yep. text content, content sum. I love that. Like I've done this exact demo in JavaScript before, oh, essentially. Yeah. This is the, uh, no, this is great. This is cause this is this is how I teach solid. So seeing this is actually really awesome. Okay, and it's telling me that my closure is supposed to take one event, one argument here, and it took zero. And great, this doesn't need that. And okay. this it wants me to type because I do that automatically in the framework, so it's mad at me. Oh, good. Okay, so now it's giving us an error. Sorry about the weird formatting here. This is saying um, this closure may outlive the current function, but it borrows hmm. p. 
which is owned by the current function. So what that means, right, in what, this function is running just like a solid component. It's a setup function. So this is going right, to run yeah. once and then end. And when it ends, all of these, um, all of these Rust variables I've created are going to be dropped. They no longer right. exist. It's, they're out of scope. But it tells me, but you're trying to access it from this long lived yeah. um, closure. Bet. So it yeah. says just add move and that will move it into the closure. Fine. We're going to do that. I think it just gave me some error I couldn't see. Good. Huh. Now it says borrowed here after move. So I moved it into the closure, then I try to append it to the thing. So let's just move this up above that. You get huh. into this stuff with Rust sometimes where if you have something that you actually can borrow um, and then you like move it in somewhere else, um, you, you can just reorganize the order of the code um, and not cause yourself that problem. Okay, so let's see if this, um, there we go. Okay, so we've nice. just created a button that you click and it does something, cool. All right, now we're gonna have a little fun. We're gonna do the exact same thing All right. on the decrement. It's going to get mad at me, uh -huh, because now I've already moved P in here and now I'm trying to move it in here, right? So this, we're going to do something that is, it starts to get into why some of this stuff is awkward in Rust, and you start to see some of the framework solutions. So we're going to do let p equals p.clone. This okay. clones that paragraph, which is just a reference to a DOM node. So it's pretty so it's not clone, it. It's not cloning the actual DOM node, it's, it's cloning it's the wrap. Not, it's not element.clone node. It's yeah. just cloning that reference. Um, so that you now own it, you can put it in both places, and it's going to work. So we're going to do plus one. Yeah. All right. Are you ready if I do this? Yeah. All right. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. You've so already plus one. cloned it. OK. Went so to it's, minus. Updating the same, it's updating the same paragraph element, right? Um, but we just created a stale closure <laughs> because I moved this count in here. Yeah. So now there's a mutable variable inside this closure called yeah. count that starts at zero. Right. And there's another immutable variable inside this closure called count that starts at zero. And right. when we click this, it updates count to one and it sets the text. But it doesn't update this outside yeah. thing. It updates what's inside the closure, right? So yeah. when we do this, it's one, two, three. And then when we do this, it's starting at, and then if we do this again, it's starting back at five. We have two completely separate state full variables that are updating the DOM, which is a okay. Bad this reminds me of uh, coffee script. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to actually, so that you can kind of see the solution, I'm going to wrap it in this in this state structure. Um, and so we're going to go back in here. Um, we're going to call it state instead, and state is going to be count zero. And let's try let's try doing this, and let's see what the compiler yells at us about. So we're going to do state dot count minus equals one. Okay, so you're equals. boxing it now. I mean, this the the, the term I use this in JavaScript. You're you're boxing it essentially, like you're keeping one reference and like you yeah, do this would, a lot. I would call it. Um, I would say like I'm wrapping it in this in this struct. Why is it not? For, but it? but what I'm getting at is it, it, this is like use ref, right? Like in React, they like they, they they have use ref so that they like there's a dot current on it, and they do it so that they can keep the reference to the same like ref, but allow the mutation of the sub property without losing reference to the ref. Yeah, we, like we will get to actually doing that right now. It is not doing that, okay. um, and I'm actually really curious about why this is compiling. So basically, the, the, the problem here, right, is that we are moving this state into, um, into the first closure. Yeah. And then we're trying to move it into the second closure. Um, but we can't move the state into both of those closures. We could do it with a really simple count value, because that's just a number. And so it gave us that stale closure thing. Um, OK. But when it's a structure like this, we haven't told it. You can just copy this and move it around. Um, okay. And so I'm I'm actually genuinely a little curious. I've I've 
clearly done something wrong here because this should not compile. And I'm curious as to why it is. Maybe it's, let's see. I'm looking at Maybe chat right now. I'm only accessing the count and it's copy. You are only copy moving the count, count member. You're only moving the count member, which is copy. No, okay, oh, this is awesome. This is actually a new Rust feature. This is disjoint capture. Sorry. Okay, so this is something. <laughs> so I've continued to foot gun myself. I thought it wasn't going to be an issue. But actually, um, the issue here is that it, it, it Rust is now smart enough to know I'm not actually trying to capture that entire state structure. Yeah. I'm only yeah. trying to capture count. So it's actually still, um, it's still, it's still just moving the count like it was before. Um, because, oh, that's so, that's so great. I must have actually, when I was running this earlier, I wonder if I was on a, a lower version or something, because it, this, this used to be a compile error, but the, the compiler is now smart enough to know I'm only accessing count. And so it can just move it in. It doesn't fix our still, still closure problem. So right. let's say, um, we do something totally different that, that's no longer a counter, right? But we're going to have it set that count value is now a string. Okay. Here's the error I was hoping for. Okay, so it's going to be a little hard to read over here. If I go into the terminal and if I do cargo check. Good. So now it says the value was moved into the closure here, right? To set yeah. it this first time. So it's no longer available to be moved in here. Okay. Huh. Okay. So now we have to do the kind of wrapping that, that you were talking about. Um, so the way that we opt into some garbage collection in Rust is with um, RC, which is a reference counted pointer. It basically wraps this thing. It lets you clone this so that okay. now you can move it into two places at once. So now the, the reference counting wrapper owns this state. And we're going to hand out two different references to it. Um, so we're going to do just like we did p equals p.clone. We're going to clone that state yeah. too. And then we can move it into two places. OK, now we've got a new error. That's progress in Rust, always progress in Rust. Let's see. Hmm. OK, we cannot assign to data in an RC because we can't have two mutable references to the same thing, right? Hmm. Um, so an RC has to only be immutable data. So you were talking about escape hatches earlier. So this is the sort of um, Rust escape hatch <laughs> that you use in this kind of situation. So it's an RC wrapping a ref cell. Um, what ref cell does is it basically moves the borrow checker to runtime. Okay. So instead of at compile time checking to make sure there can never ever be two mutable references to the same thing, it checks at runtime to make sure there isn't a mutable reference and an immutable reference. Um, and so the way that we do that is we add this borrow mute count, um, state.count.borrow mute. This is very interesting. And what I mean by that is th this clearly is a language that cares a, a lot about um, control in terms of like immutability, mutability, like assuring that you can't like get yourself in a weird state caused by like you know mutation but in order yep. to do this you enter a whole realm of new language to explain uh this like describe this system like yeah yeah and the, and it's and it's a performance thing right it's because the values are like in this order <laughs> memory safety performance um developer experience expressibility like I'm, I'm kind of sad we're not seeing the awesome dx stuff of rust we will see that in a few minutes um right but the reason right is that you could wrap every single thing in this that is overhead that's not necessary for 95 percent of the variables you're declaring and yeah. so the it's like the performance difference between rust and other things is you you're opting yeah. into this kind of um, runtime. It, it makes stuff. sense. It makes sense to me. Every let variable in Svelte is a signal, but does it have to be right? It's exactly. the same kind. Of it's exactly the same thing. Um, and it's okay. So, oops, because I changed the port. Um, so now we've got this right. Um, okay. Okay. So this is what we wanted. I mean, the counter thing is now broken because Rust got smarter yeah. than I am. 
Um, but we are able to access that to change it from both of the things. I promise it's not the stale closure. Thing. Um, so that's the, that's, this is going to be right. This, this is awkward. Nobody would want to write UI code like this. This is why frameworks exist. And so right. the interesting thing, right? When, when, when you do demos and you look at JavaScript, um, frameworks and different models and different patterns, a lot of it is about how do we drive change? Like right. we mutate, we mutate a variable and nothing happens. So how do we then say, and now update the DOM. And that's true in the Rust UI stuff too. And in, um, you know, WebAssembly UI stuff, I guess in general. Um, but it's not just that it's, it's ha not only how do we change, how do we update the DOM when we've changed shared state, but how yeah. do we make it comfortable to share state when this kind of pattern with a, a long and you know a, a closure that lives forever that is a callback when an event fires that can mutate something is really uncomfortable for rust's model um yeah in c plus plus it would be fine because you could just give it a pointer to that state variable and then it could update that however it wanted um yeah but that's how you create like memory errors right that, that's why that's why rust is a language right to prevent the kinds of errors that can come about when you're just passing out pointers like that willy-nilly. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. I, I guess it's it's probably useful to, to pause and ask like, if there are questions at this point, yeah. if there are things that you want to talk about, um, I might stop sharing my screen for a, a second if I can figure out where, uh, stop screen. I, I, I can also stop, sorry, if, if in the future, I can always stop sharing the screen. Mm. I, so it's, it's easier because then you don't have to go through that again. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I think this is I think this is interesting for a moment. Uh, mostly, and it was that last comment, and maybe this makes more sense to the C plus programmer in me or whatever. It, but um, it, it's funny because we we went from C C plus, and we got to like C sharp, and we got to this thing where it's like, okay, we're auto garbage collecting. Like that was the progression where we're like, okay, don't worry about pointers and references that much. Like we're we'll create data structure and stuff so you don't have to worry about that anymore. And we'll take care of it as you know, go dot net and all, all that Java, whatever. But what this did was at that same fork in the road back then was like, okay, no, no, okay. I mean, we need references. Like, you, you need to be able to point to things in memory, but we're not going to give arbitrary pointers, if I'm understanding this right. So, like, you, yes, you can keep a reference to something, but you can't, uh, like, share that, like, you could you could keep along that d derived train of where that reference is, but you can't just be like, yeah, pointer, 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 pointer. Like, e so it's like, it's very intentional. And by basically removing half of the language to deal with that, it ha it required new concepts, but it meant that like um, things are much more restricted, much, uh, you kind of get rid of this uh, like whole category of problem, if, I, if I'm yeah. understanding it. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, and this is why like the, to be fair, Rust in the front end space sometimes feels like overkill because you can't cause the kind of security vulnerabilities you can in like a server um, with a memory error in a, a tab in Chrome, right? However, the thing is, um, yeah, right. This is this is the question. Um, so the, the thing is, um, I, I'm going to finish a thought and then happy to talk about that. Um, single language stacks are really good. Um, like we all love having a single language stack um, in terms of being able to write you know, an app that's one app that's JavaScript all the way down, or that's Rust all the way down. Um, and the problem is Rust or C++ running on the server is just way faster and can take much more of a load than JavaScript running on a server. So if you're gonna write something that's the full stack in one language, it's actually kind of awkward that we've taken JavaScript, which is super well suited to the browser, and put it all the way down into the back end. And now we're just being able to take back end languages and put them into the front end because some of the rest stuff is it's overkill in the browser, the kind of memory safety, but it's absolutely dynamite on the server because it lets the compiler do these incredible optimizations that give you this really good server side performance. Um, so like, I don't know if anyone saw uh, Primogen has been doing this little like Leptos versus React benchmarking thing. And we, yeah. we got it down to the point where it's this crazy animation. He's setting, he has 1900 DOM nodes to make a little terminal. And then he's setting the class on each one of them reactively to make an animation of scrolling text. It's a ridiculous way to do something. Um, but we got it to the point where the Leptos version is like 15, 20% faster than React. 
on the browser. Right. Yeah. On the server side, it was able to take 30, 30, sorry, 30 times the load. So like the response time for 150 simultaneous connections to this Rust Leptos server was 250 milliseconds. To get a 250 millisecond response time from the Fastify React yep. version, he could only have five connections. So the Rust, the Rust version could take 30 times the connections as the JavaScript version that's, on the server. That's impressive because, I mean, React is not a spectacle uh, on this side, but when we're talking about other frameworks being faster than React in JavaScript land, it's like a five times faster, not a 30 times faster kind of thing. Right. Like, 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 like you on a throughput thing, you might see, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'd say the, the, in some really constrained, crazy benchmark, I might see 10 X yeah. against react and JavaScript, but that is the, that's like using some like super contrived example and using like Marco. Um, yeah. so like, it's like, it, yeah, that's, 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 yeah, it's, it's like, it's almost, it's basically a whole order of, magnitude beyond what even the fastest javascript yeah yeah yeah. and so and that's like huge right and and i'll be honest right one of the cool things about the web is that i i think in some ways that the unsuitability of javascript for the server has driven a huge amount of innovation in things like edge runtimes and stuff right like it's actually driven really cool innovations in how do we make stuff really fast even with a slower language well and it's paired with the problem Um, i mean maybe you might have opinions on this side but it's that the, on the browser perspective, the network is the bottleneck yes. more than even the backend server. So if we have to optimize, like when you consider about the network travel, we talk about hydration, we talk about like that whole side of things, um, savings that we can make on that side are feel like they're like a hundred X like, or, or like, 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 so like I've made this kind of comment before that this is my, it depends on the scale of your JavaScript app. Like, if your app is not that big, it doesn't really matter. But, like, th- I've made this comment that I- improvements on the front end that come from using JavaScript on the back end are actually make a bigger difference to your users than th- the improvements you can make on the, ba- on the back end. And, beca- and it's paired with the idea that, like, this terrible mentality that you can always throw more money at the, your back end. Uh, like, so even with that five, you could get, go, go up to 30 by add, adding six servers. And right. you, there's actually no solution on the front end to get that kind of gains unless you do that. So I've, I've been very strong on the JavaScript on the back end for that reason. And But I acknowledge it's because we're trapped to have JavaScript on the front end. This is not a property of JavaScript itself. Um, it's just the property of that fact that you need the JavaScript framework um, on the front end and the back end to have the same knowledge to be able to optimize for the front end. So that's that's been my whole position on this, right? And why I've been exactly. like very skeptical I'm not skeptical. I've been like, it's very difficult and why people have had a hard time with a lot of my message here because they're like, well, we like our backend languages uh, and they're trying to do the split. I'm like, no, the, the, if you actually want to get the best for your users, you can't do the split. Use the same language on both sides. And I, even if you hate JavaScript, you'll do better for users if you suffer th- through this um, for stuff that is like very view oriented, like the rendering, like sure, like pull all the APIs, any like any of your expensive business log, pull it all out of the JavaScript. Don't do that. But like the actual rendering piece, having that information on both sides, um, it, it can make a bigger difference overall because of the constraints of the browser. But the, it's, but it is those constraints of the browser of only running JavaScript why we're here today. Whereas if there were other language options that could be as viable on initial load as JavaScript, which I don't think yes. we've actually got there yet, um, then the whole equation changes. But that's why I'm so pushy on JavaScript on the server right now, even yeah. though all my backend friends cringe terribly, is because literally that's how you can, can make the best sites right now. Yeah, and for sure, like if like time to interactive right is the the silver bullet that javascript still has over any web assembly approach period um i mean the web assembly compilation is is super fast but com- you know comparatively speaking um if you build the same app in in solid js and in leptos or anything in the wasm space the 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 time to interactive the, the load times are just going to be way faster in whether that's solid start svelte kit whatever and like the the the, you're exactly right. The JavaScript loading time swamps the server response time in a lot of ways. And in fact, like let's be honest, especially because we have this JavaScript glue code, I would be willing to bet that if you did this in a 
a Rust WASM framework and you did it in a JavaScript framework, especially the the you know ones we like, um, the JavaScript glue code for Leptos is probably the same side as like Solid Core, <laughs> right? Uh, unminified, it's like twenty KB. I don't know what it would okay. be minified. It's probably you know right three or four or five or something. But you right. you know it's not just the WASM. It is actually the JavaScript glue to do it. Um, I'm going to turn on my light because you're not going to be able to see me in about five minutes because I forgot it's December. Um, and I'll be right back. And what do you think? Do people want to see how we could um, implement a kind of pseudo redux in about five seconds as, as a, a solution to some of these problems? Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's 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 move that over in a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this is this is definitely an interesting zone. I th I'm glad everyone is is here with us because um, this is. I think there is a. I think there's a lot of interesting questions being answered here. Oh, cool. Yeah, sorry, I was just talking a bit while you were going doing that. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think it's it's definitely very. It, because like, if there's potential to change that equation, um, at least in some way, it's 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 probably going to be around here. So yeah, okay, mm -hmm. let's 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 keep yeah. on going with the, so, the stuff. I mean, per that conversation we're just having, right? Leaving aside the load times. Um, if you could provide the right abstractions at a framework level to get around all of this messiness about shared ownership and mutation, um, then the Rust front end thing starts to look more attractive, right? Because the hard part that we've been looking at is like these RC, ref cell, wrappers, all of that stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm going to show just one other way of getting around this in pretty vanilla. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll look at like you, we'll look at Sycamore, we'll look at Leptos. Um, okay. So I'm going to start sharing again. All right. I have to do that. See, see, I still control it anyways. And you got yep. the little hider, the little bar oh, at thanks. the bottom. Yeah. So this is, this is why I will hide in the future. Just tell me and I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, okay. So, um, there's a little bit of like a kind of maxim in Rust worlds, um, which is you can either communicate by sharing memory or share memory by communicating. In other words, right, if, if I need to, um, if I have two separate things that are running, like my two different click handlers, I can either synchronize the state between them by sharing some chunk of memory, like this wrapped state, yeah. Or I can synchronize between them by sending messages of some kind. Um, so what we're actually going to do is do like a tiny, if you're familiar at all with, yeah, yeah. Because you're talking about shared memory and stuff. Just, a question came up, and I know it's not exactly related, but I just want to understand some, because I know that the system language, you got like a multi-threaded kind of type logic and all that, but the browser and stuff, we, we don't. And someone was asking, uh, can you do concurrent code in WASM? Um, and... And along those lines, well, Rust core value is safe concurrent code. Wonder if there's are ways to make the framework even faster. What is the initial? Okay, this is not related. Yeah, so I, I just, I, yeah. So, Rust Rust core value is safe concurrent code. Yes. Are there ways to make the framework faster using concurrency? No. Are there ways that you can do concurrency in WebAssembly? Yes. It involves using web workers and then using the web APIs. Like, is it message channel that you use? I don't, I'm not familiar yeah, with yeah, 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 yeah. And we already know. Yeah. And web workers, we already know the overhead for that, at least today, is not worth it. In we know it's yeah. not going to speed up your... If, if they introduced actual multi-threading in the browser, right, then that would be a different... Uh, it, it, sorry, within the... Yeah, it's, it's just not going to happen, right? Because everything that we're doing is single-threaded. And in fact... This RC ref cell stuff I'm doing, this is the single threaded version. There is a multi-threaded version that you would use like if you were doing code on the server or for an app that you're running on your computer. Um, it's, it has a little bit more overhead. So we're actually optimizing for the single threaded case in this example. Um, okay. And somebody asked about pointers. A, point, a pointer is just um, a reference into a particular place in memory. Um, and that means that um, you, know, you can... Uh, you know, when you allocate memory, right, you get this pointer into that. It's like a JavaScript, a reference to a JavaScript variable refers to some object that like is in garbage collector land. A pointer is like a raw pointer into memory. Um, 
and it's the yeah, way that you deal with different objects and different languages and, and stuff. But um, yeah, how, it's sort of how, not, not important for what we're talking about necessarily. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of how the best way to explain it, right? Because when you get the reference, you have the the reference to the thing. So you like you have the thing, right? And then with a pointer, you uh, like you almost unwrap it. But to get back to the reference, like it's it, it's the actual it's the thing that's pointing at it that you can pass around. Yeah. Does that? I, yep. I don't. I hope that I, probably worse explanation than your explanation. That, but no, that, to... that's fine. And I don't actually do a ton of like the real systems programming stuff either, so it's totally fair. Um, the and what I would say is the danger with pointers is that a pointer is literally a number that's the address in memory of that object, which means if that if that memory is deallocated, like in in C and C plus plus, you manually allocate memory and then you free it. And so if you still have a pointer into memory that you freed, that's a pointer into garbage that's not going to behave the way that you're expecting it to. And that causes right. all these memory safety issues. And um, the confusion for JavaScript developers here is that we implicitly kind of pass references without even realizing it. So you don't realize where that dif difference is. Like when we're dealing with objects and stuff, like mm -hmm. I, I think, I think like, uh, I know there's a difference in JavaScript language specifically why that's like not the case and why we tell people not to think about bypass by reference, but um, and re value rather. But the thing is, like, uh, you you never think about this in JavaScript, but like in most languages, when you're trying to like pass an object into a function, it's not like you're actually talking about like when it's not like a simple primitive value, you actually have to talk, like say where it is like yeah. it's not yeah yeah and rust abstracts over a lot of this and that's what the whole borrowing system is so like when you see me do things like um you know this and symbol i should have explained maybe a little bit more yeah. of this with references um this i, I recognized symbol, it right away yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Is, not is, everyone else is, would have no not if you're if it's a bunch of javascript developers this and is taking a reference of something so it's saying hey i'm not trying to take ownership of this object I'm just referring to it, which means I can access it immutably. Um, I can access its fields. I can do some stuff to it, um, but it's not mine. It's a reference. It's like showing, it's like pointing me to, to somewhere else that owns this thing. Um, so we so we did this whole thing, right, with like the, the state being wrapped in an RC, ref cell, and so on. Um, but there is another way to do this, right, which would be, um, to create an enumerated type, we'll call it message, and it's just going to have two variants. So this is how you do enumerated types in, um, in, in TypeScript, right? This would be like type message equals ink or deck, right? Um, so it has two possible values. Um, they have a lot more capabilities than the, than the JavaScript ones that we might not see in this example. Um, and then, so we're going to try to do this like communicating um, sharing memory through communicating. So yeah. instead of directly mutating this state, what if I created something that was like um, message sender, message receiver, uh, and this is a just a channel that's going to be able to take four messages at a time. Not not important. Um, and these, this is going to need to be mutable. So what if I send a message saying, hey, I want to increment this thing instead of, um, instead of trying to mutate this, this value. So we're going to do message sender okay. dot send increment. Um, and then on the decrement, we're going to send a message saying, let's do the decrement. Um, so these event listeners, um, we don't need those clones anymore. This um, this compiles. It doesn't do anything, it, nor does it compile. Great. OK. So this this needs to be mutable. So so we need to clone the message sender again, because it's okay. the same exact problem that we've had, right? Um, right. And I think this one, we should just be able to move it. Yeah. Okay. So that compiles. It's not going to do anything. Um, what if I then take this message receiver and this is going to be asynchronous. It's, um, 
a little awkward. This is how you spawn a, a, a you go out and you listen for a promise, right? You uh, you have to do it explicitly in in Rust. Okay. Um, what if oh, I right. say like future? Is that what the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a a future is a is a promise in Rust. Um Okay, so this line right says um, this is going to give me an iterator of of futures of promises. This next, so every time I call next, it's going to give me a, a promise that will resolve when there's a message that I'm awaiting. And while there's some message, um, we're going to do some stuff. So let's go back to our count example. Yeah. So this actually works. So we're going to declare the count here, and while we're getting this message. We're going to just see what the message is. This is how we do a switch, right? Interesting. If it's increment, this, increment. This is, okay, right. So, yeah, it's an iterator because I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking it's like generator, but not, okay, okay. Yeah, you, so. it, it's, it's a stream. A stream is basically an iterator of futures in, in, in Rust. Um, but like, what I'm getting at is it, this will just like run on its own, right? Every like message, it's like the, the next, is it kind of like, is it like a yield in a generator? Like, cause like what causes it? Like you're not calling this function every time to like, you're not pulling, right? Like, right. So it's, it's a push pull. So this, this is a, this channel is a kind of push pull um, asynchronous system. So every time we send one of these messages, it, yeah. it, it resolves the promise we're waiting for in this receiver. And then okay. this, this await resolves and we have, some message. This is just a way of getting that that value. Yeah. Um, and so then we can do. Let's hope this works. Oh, this is just because I forgot this needs to be some. Okay, that compiled. How do I, let me shrink this. All right. The first working incrementing and decrementing counter. <laughs> we did it. We did it, guys. We made a counter after an hour and a half on stream. Um, but the, so, so the point of this actually, right, um, yeah. was not the counter, which is a dumb example. It's right. that um, this is the, exactly the kind of um, state machine reducer pattern that you see in a lot of state management libraries like Redux. Right. Um, this is you have some state. You have some enumerated type of messages, um, and then you have things that dispatch. I forget what it's called in in Redux. Um, these these event listeners are dispatching a message. Yeah. And then this thing. Now this does not scale um, because we've actually um, we we for reasons that don't matter. This is the only place we can use this message receiver. So we would have to drive our entire DOM update from right yeah. here. But maybe I mean, that's actually not so stupid. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm going to just throw out there that Redux's whole pr approach was having one single global store essentially. Like, I, I, obviously, in practice, you didn't put everything into the Redux store, but there were definitely proponents that said like you sh you should like that was like a design architecture that you're going to put everything in Redux if you wanted to. Right. But right. you okay? So you're saying though, just like following here, kind of on this progression, you're saying that. Basically, okay, if you can't mutate everything, uh, hoist it up and use a message system because then you don't have to worry about the borrower. And, and then the thing is that I know about this, and maybe I, I don't know if everyone knows about this, is when you start going to this kind of like single driven message system, something like a Redux, even X state to a certain degree, um, it's, it's, it's basically set up for immutability. Um, yep. because like you're, you're getting, you're losing any local information about mutation. You're basically just saying, okay, give me some instructions. And generally the easiest way to communicate that involves like, you know, you, you start with maybe messages, but then you're like, okay, I'm just going to make reducers or whatever. You're, you're going to like yep. essentially build out this whole system, uh, where you're doing what I call coarse grain, uh, change. Yep, exactly. And, and this is our reducer function, right? We, we could have we could have done this more neatly. We could have made this an update function on that state type. Um, and maybe that's actually what we'll do. We'll call it state dot update message. And over here, we're going to. Yeah, now you're right. writing your reducer, essentially. Yep. I mean, um, yeah. Update and take a mutable reference to self and it's going to take a message. Take that message. Type. 
Yeah. And now you see how I added this other thing. This is where Rust does start to have the, the, the DX and the um, expressiveness in, in things like pattern matching. Um, right. So I've just added this, which you could do this with a, a tagged union type in JavaScript, right? Um, but this right. carrying other data inside an enumerated type is is not as straightforward in JavaScript. Um, right. Yeah, so there's there's our reducer. Increment, plus one. Decrement, yeah. minus one. Yeah. And yeah. then this pattern matching really can be pretty advanced, right? So I'm saying, and if the message is set name, and if name is Ryan, then do something else. And right. now Rust is complaining at me because I'm missing a match arm. <laughs> What if name is not Ryan, right? Ryan, so right. For yeah, this, branch, right, that, yeah. this is just, I'm going to ignore that for now. But that's that's how you can implement these kind of state machines. The sort of thing that you might um, reach for Redux or XState or something is pretty um, comfortable to do in native Rust code because of the power of this pattern matching um, and so on. But so this model, right, like we just invented Elm. Um, yeah. If anybody's familiar with Elm, right? The way that the Elm model works, it's model, update, view. And so yeah. you have a model, you have an update function, and then what you would do is literally have a, a view function. Um, that is a that function of that. Why? Yeah. That it takes, takes an immutable reference to yourself. Yeah. And then you're left with this problem. Um, now you need some kind of a virtual DOM or something. Um, so we're actually yeah. going to um, kill this here and, and look at you, which is exactly this. Right. Yeah. This, this, this It's funny because I feel like in JavaScript, this was not the logical appro uh, like approach to get to here, that the React team actually came from a little bit out of left field, yeah. um, applying kind of these, these, pa these patterns. And like, it, like... It, even though like mechanically like because you're in javascript and you have to do stuff certain way anyways like it might not be as th that big of a difference this is where like react's best practices kind of derived from um you know outside because that was a, the thing is before react we were doing we had like declarative views and updates and reactivity and all this stuff but react was like uh this is kind of messy we need we need more structure we need actually more rules or best practices and they they borrowed it from here essentially exactly because in javascript world right we don't have memory safety issues if you mutate something in an unexpected place right but you can still create logic errors by doing that i yeah. have personally written bugs in production that are unwritable in rust in javascript by mutating right. things you know, and you've, you've done examples you, on stream, these deeply nested objects, and all of a sudden you forget to do a deep clone, you do a shallow clone, and now you're mutating the object from some other component. And the thing is, and I, I don't know if this is, is like, you, you're you a little bit lucky because you were using Angular, not Angular JS. If you actually went back before that kind of influence, we had something in all JavaScript frameworks called two-way binding. And yes. um, that's probably... <laughs> people will get on my case on this, but like one of the most dangerous patterns when you have a system that um, is event based, like when you have so many different abilities to uh, like update things from all over the place. Um, two way binding becomes a little less of a problem if you have better control mechanisms, but um, it's still very dangerous. And almost if you kind of walk into that world of where React came into, where everything was like two-way binding, it was just like mutate, mutate, you know, like popping popcorn everywhere. Um, yep. So, And that's not going to cause a memory safety issue. You're in a browser. It's a different sort of thing. But yeah. controlling that, I mean, that's that read-write segregation. It's the same idea of controlling what you can mutate where. Um, and that model, when you're doing it in Elm, which is a totally immutable functional language, or if you're doing it in Rust, where you really want to know um, because the, the, the problem, right, of that RC ref cell thing, right, is it, it, when you wrap something that way, it allows you to take those mutable references at runtime, which is nice, but you still have to write your code in such a way that you're not simultaneously mutating something in two places. So if you get, particularly with reactive libraries, it can be tricky. If you get into a, like a create effect, 
you know, if you're trying to read something and set something within the same, it's nested, it can get a little bit messy. You know, like you're mutating something out from under yourself and all of a sudden you've got an infinite loop or whatever. Um, so that the, the, the sort of clean APIs of this mutability, this, this almost a mutable phase and this immutable phase um, are what's so appealing about the, the Elm thing. And in Elm, it's all just immutable. You do that sort of stuff that you get in JavaScript where it's like, you know, an object and you're, you know, you know you're, you're spreading the object so that you're not mutating it, whatever. Something like um, you, you actually can write beautiful code. So this is you, this is, uh, I okay. took this example straight from their repository, um, but it, it's almost identical, right? In a funny way. So you've got your message with increment and decrement. <laughs> yeah. You've got the, the state struct. They have this component trait. So this is how you implement a, a trait for a Oh, structure. okay. So, you, you, sorry, I thought you was like React, but it's like straight up Elm, isn't it? We're going to see the two, the two, the two modes of you. Okay. So they have a functional component version now. Um, so it's straight up Elm, right? Because you've got this message type. That's the yeah. message. Properties is component properties. So Elm is ideologically opposed to components. The entire thing is supposed to be one big tree. You has components, absolutely. Okay. Um, but so you've got this create. This is how you create the state. I'm um, just used to like the three defined section. When you ever look at any Elm code, it's like one, two, three. And I'm, exactly. I'm just seeing that block in front of me right now. Exactly. Yep. So you've got, you know, your, your model right here. Uh, oops. Right, right. And then you have the three functions, create, update. Yeah. And it's the same exact thing I just wrote. Um, yeah. Note this, this update function returns a Boolean of whether it, the component should re-render. Okay. There you go. Yeah. That is super powerful because you can do things where you update state, but you know that you don't need a re-render. It's a way of controlling the, yeah, the should, DOM. Should component update. Yeah. Yep. Um, should component update. Exactly. And then you've got your view. Um, and maybe if you're not used to reading Rust code, you might not appreciate how elegant this is. This is really, really beautiful and really, really a clever solution because you have three, you have, you have two distinct things. You have an update function that takes yeah. a mutable reference to the state of the component. Right. And then you have a view function that takes an immutable reference. And so you know you're able to write ordinary Rust code without those wrappers right. of RC ref cell everywhere. When you have a click, they have this neat little neat little guy, this context that you're passing in okay. has a link associated with it. And then you do dot callback and it dispatches a message. Gotcha. Um, and when you do that dot callback, that sends a message to the runtime that's handling the component. Yep. It calls the update function with that yeah. message, it mutates the value, it tells you you should render, and then you get into the mess. Well, um, I mean, um, before the mess, I just want to say is React wishes that you couldn't update state while you're in the middle of rendering, right? Like that, this, like literally the view code here can't actually update state. Like it's like impossible yep. for it yep. to update state is what yep. I'm seeing here. And yep. just so I understand, HTML exclamation mark, this is like a macro of some sort, like how yes, are we getting... Uh, it's like exactly. tag template literal. It's, it exactly. looks more like JSX. Uh, yeah, this what, is, what is no, this? No, this is this is great. This is great. Um, so, job in, um, in Rust, right? There's something called a um, a proc macro, procedural macro. There are a couple different kinds of macros. Macros run at compile time to modify your code. So a, a proc macro like like this, right? Actually takes a stream of Rust tokens and transforms it into a stream of other Rust tokens. So it's basically okay. doing a JSX transform at compile time, um, but it's native to the language. It's not like an external thing. Um, and so you write these proc macros using Rust code. And so pretty much most of the frameworks have some kind of thing like this. They call it different things. We call it view. Um, but this basically lets you write a very JSX type there are a couple of things that are different. Like you notice, we have to wrap the strings in quotes. And then in you, you also wrap them in curly braces, which is a little awkward. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is JSX, right? Um, it's it's pretty close. You get just, advantages. Just a second. Yeah. Just a, just a second. Sorry. Did, did we lose the stream for a minute? Or OK, if people are saying it's back. Sorry. I think the Twitch stream dropped for a second, but I think we're good. Oh, okay. No. Um, OK. Yeah, so this Sorry. this HTML, this is this is giving you VDOM, right? This is this is your JSX. Um, this HTML type is oh look, they even give it to you. Pub type HTML equals V node. <laughs> so that HTML right. that it's returning is just a virtual DOM node. Um, so so this is super elegant, but it relies on a whole 
runtime because the only way that you can define this totally declarative, immutable DOM right. like this is to have a virtual DOM that's powering the whole thing. Right, because um, there, there, there isn't, a, there isn't a, like, you don't replace all the DOM nodes every time, and this is literally a render function. Um, exactly, exactly. And, and so the, the secret, right, this is why, right, Rust, this, this stuff is a little awkward. You, you, you need that RC ref cell wrapping somewhere, and so they just do it. When you, when you implement component, it wraps it around this data structure, just like we had in our example. It's wrapping this in those escape hatches, but you right. as the user don't see it because what it does is it just does that borrow mute that we did and then it runs the update function. That's interesting. And then so it the takes state that borrow does the view. Mm -hmm. So the model is still defined outside of the component. Like you, you say, like this is the structure of my state. Um, and then you ex like implement. I'm gathering that's like uh, extend. It's like a class. It's like yeah, built. this is just yeah. This is just the way that in Rust you implement methods on something. Um, so okay. you have you don't have um, function update. This is like invalid. You could never do this for defining okay. um, a method or a, a function on something. The, the data structure itself is defined with its data. And then you do a separate impl block to do methods. So I could do like. Um, OK. Uh, and then. You know, you can do whatever you want. So this is this is a trade, um, like an interface. Okay. Um, yeah. And you're implementing that interface for this data structure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then once you've done that, right? You says if you give it a component, I know what to do with a component. What I do with a yeah. component is I wrap it and I run right. it in this event loop. Uh, I give it this context, and I let it dispatch these things. And when it dispatches them, I go through my whole little loop. Um, gotcha. Yeah. The downs. So this is super clean. Really nice, a um, lot of advantages to it. It's almost like you have a separate little Redux store or a separate little state machine powering each yeah. component. That gets super verbose, though, because now for every single component you want to define, there's no such thing as a function component in this style. You're defining yeah. a data structure. You're defining a message type. You're defining all these functions. And to, to yeah. do like a very simple set state is like, OK, now I'm going to go up here. I'm going to add something else. Right? It's just. Uh, People don't like the developer experience of that for, for you know, good reasons. So you get um, in you a functional component version too, which is um, going to look more familiar maybe to folks. Um, I added a bunch of comments about the implementation here that we can ignore for now. Okay. So this is, this is, now we're defining a function component. It's that same function app which returns that HTML type. And now we've got yeah. let state equals use state. Um, Interestingly, it doesn't return an integer. It returns a type that's called use state handle. Um, okay. And then you've got your callbacks. These are a little awkward, right? Because now you've got let state. You, you have to manually clone that state now and then right. move it into this wrapped callback. But then you can do something that's state.set. So it's a little bit like a set state kind of thing. That's funny. So you're like inventing hooks here. Okay, these sorry, are hooks. Continue. Yep, yep. These are hooks. This is exactly inspired by React hooks. This comes after React hooks, and it's a way of doing exactly that kind of hook, hooks based stuff. Um, but you know what? I looked up what use state handle is. Okay, it's use reducer handle. Fine. What's use reducer handle? <laughs> Value sorry, is an is an RC. I'm I'm laughing because in React, this is also an implementation detail. You use state in React is actually built on top of use reducer. I, I just it's, yeah. It's, it's, I, I don't know about the process of developing it, but it's it's very clearly React inspired, and it may be the sort of thing where they it, implementation is inspired too. Um, but if you if you look at what a use reducer is, okay, you've got a value that's wrapped in our good old friend RC, and then you've got a dispatch, dispatch function. So it's almost like every use state is a mini component, component. in the old style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now, okay, you've got that stuff. Um, callback, by the way, that's another RC type. Um, use state handle set is is kind of interesting. It's doing that same. Uh, it's actually not interesting. It's doing that same component work we talked about. Um, so just just out of curiosity, are, do yeah. people like this came after? So I guess people do pref like using this like this approach. This is what of, they're moving to, and you get benefits, right? Because just like with React hooks, you get composability, you can compose hooks, yeah. you get right. this sort of inline, um, I could create another use state here yeah. much more easily than, than that three part thing. 
Um, but you start running into those same React problems. You said like, oh, this is great. You don't have the issue of mutating state while rendering. Um, this gets you into all the same kinds of issues because this is a render function now, right? So yeah. this is going to rerun every time. So you need to do all that same React stuff of uh, what does it mean for this to be stable between re-renders? I mean, it's, it's all the same stuff. Um, and you just, you know, it looks very similar, same JSX, whatever. But so in, in a sense, they shrank the components down that they had into those individual states, but not in a React, not in a preact signals, excuse me, kind of way. Because every time any of the states you have, like if I create another state, yeah. um, it's going to re-render the whole, whole yeah. thing. So even though um, I had this other thing here, right? Current state two. Yeah, yeah. Um, in a sense, this is a micro component, but it is going to cause the whole outside to re-render. Um, yeah. And so it's it's fine. It's a fine grained implementation of a coarse grained. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, this is this is React it, hooks. Yeah. Or or it's actually maybe it's like Vue, right? It's it's not really fine grained reactivity, so that's different. But it's, right, but it's the, finer grained primitives driving a, a coarser thing. But right. it, it's React hooks. It's React hooks. Yeah. Because like underneath, it's just calling like set state essentially like update like dispatch message redo recall render function well it's interesting because the reducer function that they create for this use state i yeah. that's what i did look up the, the the reducer function is just like blow out the old value of the use state and set it which makes sense because you're doing set state um but it's like these are fine grained in their cycle but okay. that that cycle doesn't, it, it, it then calls when this updates, it calls update on the whole component. Um, it calls Interesting. Rather, on the whole component. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so I see, I see what you're saying. That's why you were comparing it more to viewer preact signals. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's yeah, not a yeah, great yeah. comparison. Um, but, but yeah, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's somewhere in between React hooks and, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so that's that's the kind of VDOM. This is the main, this is, you know, the big library with 23,000 stars on GitHub or whatever. Um, I want to take a look at, where do I have Sycamore 7? Good. I want to take a look at Sycamore. Sycamore is... Um, I, I remember this. this. This framework was called Maple originally. It was called enough. Maple. It's a little confusing. Yep. Um, but so Sycamore is like the, the original kind of solid inspired REST framework. Um, I used it a little bit. There are some differences from, from Leptos, whatever. Um, but you can, now you see, right, this is a solid type framework. So where did my REST analogy go? Um, so you have, you know, let counter equals signal new um, yeah. increment. Uh, but wait a second. Okay, we still have to clone the counter because this is right. Rust. So we're closing, cloning it. We're moving it into this closure to set it. Okay, right. We've got this stuff about dereferencing a, a variable, um, all this kind of stuff. Um, I gave you, okay, or this shorter version, right? Um, so now you have this like cloned macro so that instead of manually okay. cloning stuff, you can do this. Okay. You can just tell it clone this and move it in. Um, it doesn't show off really well in this in this example, but let's say I had um, let counter two equals signal. How about I do like a create effect? Um, so funny, like the little syntax things that I'm familiar with because of like C type languages that the audience might not be familiar with, because that's interesting. It, it, this Rust doesn't have a new operator. Is it just like, is that a static method on the? That's like, exactly what? right. Yep. So this is, so it's, it's sort of a convention that you define a, a new. And so, right. So when you have this, this is a static method on the signal type. So yeah, apologies right. to any JavaScript right. people who have no idea what we're talking about. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not the most important, but so what I want to say, right. Was look at this, um, uh, this, let's call this create effect. Um, Sycamore, this is Sycamore 0 0.7. I want to be super clear. Sycamore 0 right. 0.8 solves this problem. Sycamore 0 0.7 and prior, um, this is not a dependency array. Um, right. You don't need dependency arrays. It's fine-grained reactivity. It will, it will auto-track its dependencies. But you end up having to create a dependency array of sorts because you need to clone those, count, those, those signals to move them into the closure. So that same awkward right. stuff to move it into the closure that we were doing earlier, um, 
you had to do totally unnecessarily. Um, right. And the rest of this example is the same exact stuff that we've seen. Um, so Sycamore 8 and Leptos are both trying, both kind of attempts to solve this problem in different ways. Um, just, can, I, can I see this a little more? Like, spend a oh, second. Can you scroll down? Yeah, yeah. So uh, they also, they're using uh, a different syntax. It looks like Pug. I know it's not, but it's probably, this is probably like hyperscript type syntax or equivalent instead of the JSX syntax. I just well, it's funny, that. right? Because you still need to view macro because yeah. this stuff looks like more like a Rust data structure, but it's not. Um, and it's got this parentheses for attributes. It's got these braces. This is, as far as I know, their own domain okay. specific language. I don't think anybody else uses this. Um, it reminds me of Pug, which is funny. Uh, oh, I've okay. used a lot of white, white space matters uh, templating languages from the early 2010s, and mm -hmm. they look like this a lot. Even Marco concise mode looks like this a lot. Anyway. Right, right. Um, but so it's basically, and yeah, sorry, I kind of scrolled through this, but to give it credit, right? Um, you've got your your signal, you've got this increment that's setting the signal, the decrement yeah. that's setting it. Um, we don't need to talk through all this because it's the solid stream, right? But um, when you do these event handlers and this get, this is fine-grained right. reactivity. So this, like solid, this is a setup function, not a render function. And it's just going to cause this text node to update over and over and over. Even with the funny wrappers, this already looks cleaner in a sense, in my opinion, than the the new U function components. I, interesting, I, interesting. I, but that's just because I, I, I know the clone is awkward. It was yeah. just there's something, there's a bunch of extra stuff in there. I, I, I don't... And the, in the, the U functional example, we had to clone it too. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I it just, this just seems noisier. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, just... yeah, yeah. Okay, so Sycamore 8, right? Um, uh, there are two types of, um, I, I hesitate even to get into this, right? But there, there's something called copy in Rust and there's something called clone. Yeah. So co cloning a data structure is like, I can clone a string, which is going to copy all the bytes in that string and give me a new string. Um, I can clone a data structure. It gives me a, a deep clone of it, right? That's a totally separate structure. That gets a little, it's actually maybe a confusion in the Rust language, which is a problem, but with something like RC, which is that reference counting pointer, in that case, cloning it actually is, because you're cloning the pointer, not the object inside it, it still, it still refers to the same thing. So the RC yeah. is the same. And that's why we were able to share that object between two things. Um, there's, so that's cloning. You have to do it manually. Yeah. Um, there's something else that's copying. And so for a value type, like a number that's super yeah. small in memory, you can just copy it. And you can copy something if it's small in memory and if just copying those bytes of memory gives you the exact same thing. So if I take two and I copy the bytes and it's two, those mean the exact same thing basically, right? Like a two is a two. Yeah. The stale closure thing we got into is that it's not the same two. <laughs> It's now a different, right. it's now a different two. Um, but so if you copy something, you can then move it into a closure without having to clone it explicitly. Okay. So when you look at this, look at how much better Sycamore 0 0.8 is than 0 0.7. This is the whole component. So create a Sycamore. Yeah. yeah. Then we have the increment callback, the decrement callback, the same exact template. That's it. There's none of the cloning. You'll notice create signal returns a yeah. reference to a signal. A reference right. is a copy type. And then just like um, we're wrapping those escape hatches, a signal internally is doing yeah. that wrapping, but you don't need to worry about it. It's just giving you yeah. a reference back to the signal. You can move it around, whatever. Um, anybody with Rust experience um, may start getting nervous um, because this reference now has a lifetime um, lifetimes are one of the trickiest things to work with in Rust, in my opinion. Um, it, it, they're one of the things that trip people up the most in terms of like fighting the borrow checker or whatever. Um, it's a really clever way of solving this problem. It does involve some unsafe code in their internals and unsafe code in Rust doesn't mean something is necessarily a problem, but it means you're opting out of some of the safety guarantees of Rust. Right. Um, because, right, this in a sense is not 
legit. You're creating a reference to a signal. The signal is going to be dropped after you run this function. And then these closures are accessing that signal. So right. Sycamore actually does really clever stuff where they have this scope. They introduce this, yeah. you'll notice, in between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. Um, the scope now owns the signal. And the huh. scope actually also, um, I have to look back at their internals. I think the scope owns the event listeners. Like the, they, they do it in a clever way so that it can't, it doesn't cause problems, but it is tricky. Like they've had, they've had issues. They have an open issue right now in their repository with like a, a problem that one of the Rust safety checking tools has given them with their implementation. Um, right. It's tricky to do this. It also, um, once you start, I don't have an example to, to look at, but once you start, um, using child components and things, you get into problems because the lifetimes have to match up. So you start doing these like generic lifetime annotations um, on things and it gets just, this is just a lifetime. It, it, like it gets complicated pretty quickly because it's dealing with references because you're still living in that world of memory safety when it's giving you right. references to something. Um, and I'll just show you a little leftist code. Um, of the same exact thing. This is, I think, probably the example that's on the readme anyway. You you have scope as well. Are you, we have so scope using, as well. The, using yep. the same kind of mechanism? Yeah. Yep. We have um because I love you, Ryan, we have read write segregation here by default. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, that's a lot And then it's the same exact thing, right? But so you'll notice what this is returning is a read signal, not a reference to a read signal. But right. then we're somehow still moving it into this closure without copying it. Uh, right. Sorry, we're copying it. We're doing that without cloning it. Um, and then it's, you know, you'll see it's a JSX type syntax again. Um, right. This has actually turned out to be super handy because you can do things like, um, uh, so I can do like class equals, if I knew any tailwind, I would be able to actually do this. Um, tailwind yeah. CLI just works with this because it actually does like mm. pattern matching on things that look like JSX. And oh, I guess that's cool. Our syntax is close enough to a mix of JSX and Svelte because we have some like, yeah, of this stuff going on. Um, yeah, yeah. That it will actually Tailwind just works with it. I didn't realize I've never used Tailwind before. Somebody yeah. asked and they're like, "Hey, do you know if Tailwind works with this?" And I had no idea. I just use CSS and they tried it and it just does. So that I mean, it's an advantage to using something that's a not a standard standard, right? Um, right. But this is this is the same thing. But the way that we solve that problem is. Um, rather than giving you a reference that can copy into stuff, the signal type is actually just like a small ID, a numeric ID that's a reference into the reactive system. Right. Um, so if I, uh, this read signal structure, this is a little noisy, it, you can ignore this. Um, it just is a runtime ID and a signal ID. And both of these are basically array indexes. Ah, okay. So when you're passing around a signal in Leptos, what you're really passing around is just some kind of index into the reactive system, which is really handy because it means you can copy yes. it super easily. That's like eight bytes. Um, you can pass it around. It doesn't have a lifetime because it, it, you know, you can pass it around, you can throw it away. It's a stable reference into the reactive system. You can that means serialize that, no, it. I, yeah, that's what I was going to go. This means that every single reactive node actually has a, a, a stable ID. Uh, yep. And the reason I did that was not for resumability reasons. I mean, when I wrote it this way, I had an eye on that idea. Um, but the reason I did it was for Rust memory and ownership reasons, because now all of the signal values and all of the subscribers and everything live inside one runtime data structure. And it just hands out these IDs. And so all your effects and all of your callbacks and stuff just have a little ID. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you can you can serialize the whole reactive graph. If you run it once on the server, you've got all your dependencies and the entire thing is like just these short little numerical identifiers. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's just a slightly different way of solving that same problem. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, and just for clarification on this part, mm -hmm. um, you, you guys don't have the over, what I call the overwrapping problem because it's still runtime reactivity. You can, like, not everything needs to be a computed. You can just pass around expressions as functions, essentially, or like 
closures. Yeah, move blank. And yeah, yep. this is still a thing. Okay. Yeah. Totally so legit. yeah. And then at the point of execution on the server, you would just like, col you'd be collecting those nodes anyway. So you can then just grab the IDs off them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I have not, I have not tried to do this, right? You, you, this is what you would do because he, here's the issue. This is the the big problem, and that Quick has done so much work to try to solve. You don't actually, it's not actually that um, hard to serialize the reactive graph if you implement it in this kind of way. What's really hard is, is the closures, to know yeah. that yeah. this thing depends on set count. <laughs> and I think to do it, we would have to wrap every single one of these in some kind of a macro. And it would be it would be hard. I think it would be easier for solid because you're you you can already it, because the compilation isn't baked into the language as much. You have a little more yeah. flexibility in it. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's still really hard. I mean, it's really hard because what all the, what you need to know is not just which signals update which effects, but which callbacks update which signals. Um, and that's the hard part to get out of this at runtime because you don't run these on the server. So you yeah. can't track it like at SSL. Yeah. yeah, and what uh, really smart stuff that Quick does is they like, they with their uh, event handlers and JSX, they, they like add extra annotations. It, it, it's not like they can, comp like Marco, we, we had a cross file compiler that like literally analyzes the whole thing and knows everything at compile time. Mm -hmm. And that's what Marco 6 does. Quick does a hybrid. It just annotates it with the necessary information so that when it hits it again at runtime, it can collect it in a certain way that it knows. So like it's it's kind of like the 50-50. They didn't want to have a compiler that spanned across all the files. So they compiled in the information so that they could hit it at runtime. Um, right. Anyway. Right. Yeah. That's yeah, it, it's very that's very, very clever. Um yeah, so this is something that like was it's funny, one of the first issues on you know anybody opened in the repository was like, consider adding a resumability like quick. And it's like, yeah, thank you. That issue is gonna be open for a little while. Um, but it is, I mean, people are clearly excited about these approaches. And oh, there's the one other yeah. thing that I would I would note is like we do have this um you can just set count, um, right? Or you right. can this That's the function version. Yeah, it's yeah. A mutable reference to the thing, and this is really handy for stuff like um, if you're working with a big array. Like one of the differences in the JS framework benchmark stuff is when we're mutating an array, we can actually mutate an array. It's it's almost like everything. I've never used create mutable in Solid, but it, maybe it's like that. Um, it's like every signal you can mutate it internally, yeah. which means you can push something onto uh, a, an array, a vector. Yeah. which means you don't have to clone the entire thing, which it definitely is a saving. The de-optimization there is that every time you call the update, even if the value doesn't change, it's going to trigger um, its dependencies because um, you, you're telling it that it's updating. And if you do a check inside here, uh, yeah. we, we could put some bounds that require something to be... Um, right. The challenge on the reactive side, because technically we have create mutable and we also have produce, which lets us do it, is mm -hmm. that the proxy overhead is not insignificant and I, right. I do, like if you and if you do something with a proxy and you're like i'm going to unshift i'm going to put something at the front of the array it, it changes the index so it literally goes through every element of the array and it hits the tr proxy getter through the like the or the center, yeah. like literally moves everything one by one up the array so like you'll like if you have a thousand element array and you unshift you do a thousand pro like a thousand proxy hits yeah, so, it's funny. There's there's a guy in our community who's working on um, a new renderer right now, which is really cool. Um, but we had a very similar issue where it was like, why is why is remove row so slow? And it was like, oh, he's doing this key diffing, and because removing the first row spat out this result of removing one row and then moving 990 rows, 999 rows up one. It's that same like when you're mutating something, sometimes you accidentally. Um, uh, you caused these issues in in the rest of your implementation. I think improvements of proxies have kind of changed the equation, and maybe I like I should look at it again sometime. But like generally speaking, when I tested it early on, it was it was like it, for like stuff that JS framework infrastructure, it was just like clone the array. It doesn't matter. Like compared to yeah. actually like hitting the proxy overhead. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, it's super, it's super interesting. Uh, this like the serialization app. So that, uh, yeah. as you mentioned, it, it's more than that to, cause you have to, you have to replace the lexical scoping. That is mm -hmm. the other trick 
um, to doing the resumable stuff. Uh, could leptos be more quick? Like, yes, or someone actually literally, yeah, right, literally exactly. asked. And, then, yeah. and, then quick, and it's interesting because quick, like, this is actually where I've been sitting in stuff. And maybe we talk a moment about this because people are here. It's like mm-hmm. people don't realize this about quick because of like they use reactivity and like people and they use it to wake up stuff too. So people are like, Oh, okay. So like, what's the difference between solid and quick or whatever. And, and what they don't actually realize is quick is more like preact than it is like solid. Like it's actually a VDOM library that like when you update a signal, you rerun the whole component or load the whole component in the page. Um, but what they've done is they figured out like, if you get the signal all the way down to the VDOM, like you can just update the one thing and not ship the component for that one specific case. So it's actually the same as preact signals. They have that trick where if you get the signal all the way into the VDOM, the biggest difference is quick saw solids API and was like, Oh God, this is really like the preact signals way is kind of like a really awkward because now you're like is signal. Like you're suddenly in this weird zone where you're like, having the check and you have two different types of things like signal versus not signal and you have to design your components that way it's really awkward dx and 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 so the guys from quick were like no no we want to do it like solid where like we don't care but so they use their compiler to kind of go yeah could be signal like like essentially and if they lose the optimization trail anywhere like if you go count plus one they're like okay this might not be signal so now we're going to pull in the whole component again but like they let the you know get most of the dx benefit of solid still there but i, I want to point out that like they 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 are not a fine grained renderer so that's why like like it, it doesn't have the same kind of performance profile mm-hmm. of leptos or like solid that we're talking about here mm-hmm. um but it, the problem is when you go into fine grained renderer and fine grained on this stuff uh it, it's 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 even harder like to be able to do those things like those those look kind of like pre act style hack t- uh, kind of thing that we're talking about here doesn't won't work for you anymore like because literally like the whole system is worked off these partial pieces and like that's what Marco that's why Marco Six has been taking so long it's it's literally yeah. the fine grain stuff plus the compiler um, yeah. like there's nothing else like that but yeah. th- this is where the challenge is because I, I, I was sitting there with Manu and, was, and we were like I, I, we, were, we were like what's more I was like I think this is going to come down to like the, the splitting what's more important Quick's ability to fine grain async split the JavaScript code at those points or composability of your of your hooks because like mm-hmm. they're kind of like hesitant they're like uh, like derived signals and like hooks and stuff requires a lot more dollar signs and a lot more like you don't need to but like it's, it's a lot more work to do composition but they, they also don't want to lose the ability to not set, send the template so they're like okay maybe we can inline computed um you know which is what i call the overwrapping problem um but they're not sure they want to give that power to the end user because then it's like this whole the, 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 their boundaries on dollar sign boundaries just explode um exponentially so like this is kind of one of the the challenges here where we were sitting here um, talking quick and solid was that like a perfectly fine grained renderer might make resumability um, more challenging from the serialization standpoint like mm-hmm. um, but not resumability sorry resumability could be fine because resumability is just not execution stuff you could make it resumable but the the lazy loading code bit yes. would be would be very difficult. Yep. So that that that's kind of an interesting point. I just wanted to make out because we were talking yeah. about on terms of that distinction that that um, it, it isn't resumability. I think you can get resumability both ways because resumability is just about not running the code and being able to unwind um, like some of the closure, like it, the, even the granularity of unwinding the closures only matters perhaps as far as the code blocks in which needs to execute and uh, like when so like. I, I, I think it'd be interesting to play with that granularity and mm-hmm. loosen it up because like shipping a bit more extra JavaScript code doesn't really matter if you're not running it. Right. So, so like, like it, I'm obviously on large JavaScript, that's not true, but like on, on smaller JavaScript, that's, that's interesting. So that's, that's why I like, I'm kind of like in this interesting place because like, I think the merger of the, the concept that we're doing of Lepto solid here and quick might be very very difficult um to like it's like that cost triangle like yeah. I, right now marco 6 is the only thing that I, um that i know that can somewhat 
like probably solve it, but they're even they're not doing the fine grained async splitting of the code. I think that's right. like a really challenging ch- challenging piece. Like basically, I, they might be at odds with each other. Essentially, like the fine grained performance uh, versus the fine grained lazy loading. Like they they, they might actually, um, you know, like it, it's like the trade off might be a real real thing and we, we might have to figure out where the right balance is between which side needs to um get uh loosen up a little bit if we want to get both solutions i i, I know this is a tangent but it was just something i was thinking about and the problem right now is like we're very much in our own camps because i'm like i would not give up composability for anything right and and then i, I think they're very attached to their lazy loading code thing so um, right. It's going to be interesting to see how this develops. Sorry, I just went on a tangent. I don't know if you have any thoughts or you no. It's great. I mean, and it's it's really interesting in the Rust WebAssembly conversation. Uh, just to kind of loop back to the state of WebAssembly, and I have um, this will I think lead into a last little demo that I I want to do. Um, the biggest weak point right now of WebAssembly is code splitting, and it's actually kind of interesting because WebAssembly does streaming compilation, so you usually have one monolithic WASM file, but it gets compiled as it streams down chunk by chunk from the server. In the in the sense, you know, JavaScript, you have to wait for the entire JavaScript file to load, and then you can uh, parse it and execute it. Um, but WASM, because it's compiled, can, you know, the compiler can arrange things in such a way that um, each section can be compiled independently as it, as it comes down. And so the files tend to be larger, but there's almost a weird way in which like the JavaScript bundle splitting and code splitting is almost a way of creating streaming compilation for JavaScript when it's native in, in WASM. But the problem is that you can then get that main.js down really small and do interesting things with lazy loading code and stuff that right now you just can't do in, in WASM. There is a tool that's just come out that's for um, mscripten, which is sort of the more the C++ ecosystem of, of mm-hmm. WASM yeah. that allows you to split something. And it does this interested like instrumented run it's called wasm split and it and it kind of splits your file into two um and it almost makes it look like it's just a slow synchronous function call the first time you call something in that other bundle so it helps with that initial load time um but the load time is like the time to interactive as you're downloading in that streaming wasm is still a is still a problem um so part of what i've been trying to do is how do we develop patterns like remix patterns like solid start patterns that work before your WebAssembly has actually downloaded. Um, right. I have this this demo I'm just going to do. There, there's this great build tool someone in the community made called um, Cargo Leptos, which does like a um, it's almost like a like a live reloading dev server, but it compiles both the WebAssembly for the client and the the server side. Um, and I was I was just messing around with this before we we got on the call, so. It, there's okay. a chance it's broken, like any demo that you've just built before before you start, right? Um, like every single stream, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> you know, I don't know why it actually needs to be recompiling right now, but that's fine. Um, but this, so this example is basically um, to show you while it while it compiles. Um, this is our kind of solid start e type thing, right? Um, oh, it's because I have Rust Analyzer on. Maybe if I mm, that's going to cause me problems. Whatever, we'll let it go. Um, so if you if you look in this right, it, this is just a single file application basically. Um, it's checking if you're on the server, and then SQL X is kind of a type checking SQL interface for Rust. So it's accessing the database. Um, it's doing this register server functions, which we'll see in a sec. Um, okay, and it's defining this to do structure, and then we have these server functions, um, which you all are familiar with. We define yeah. them up in this scope. But this is defining a function that if you call it on the server, runs the body of it. Um, and if you call it that's, on the client, does an async call out to the server to run it. Um, <laughs> that's cool to see that even here, because that was yep. like one of the new things that we were just playing with. But uh, I know. This, and you guys are the first other framework I've seen do this now. That's I cool. really I really felt Fred's comment at that panel that you were on for what are you excited this year? Stealing whatever Ryan's doing. Yeah. Um, there, there are a lot of benefits to someone else innovating and then you pick up the good pattern, right? But so we've got this, you know, this is like get to do is whatever. I, um, you know, we've got one to add a to do, delete a to do. Yeah. Um, 
and then it's you know a, a very similar nested routing right um creating a resource to load the to-dos using this get to do server function right yep. this um this is a pattern i'm still trying to figure out how we handle um mutations right or, or how you how you know when to refresh something so we actually have these uh, a multi-action and a server action and I have this little version signal on them, and every time they run, this updates, um, which means if you if you depend on them in your resource, this is a regular resource. If you depend on them yeah. in this resource, um, right? Whatever we, we call the second we, argument, it's gonna rerun. It's gonna recall this get to do's every time you mutate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the like thing, that, the, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because our our thing is we built. I mean, that part was like easily built on top of resources, but more than that, we actually built a lot of this mechanism around the concept of routing. So like, exactly. it was like, it was like, if you do a mutation, um, and we got this from Remix, that idea that like, we will just refresh all the data on the route. Um, and, but then when you do forward navigation, we're only fetching the data for the new partials that come in. I'm actually yep. documenting this kind of behavior and the difference between new navigation versus update semantics, because I'm working on a new generalized requirements site proposal for taking, if you've seen our movie zap demo at all, the one with the mm -hmm. client side hybrid routing, like this, like we basically send no JavaScript and have like a single page app experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of optimizations and stuff that people that we haven't done and that people aren't aware of and I'm trying to spec out what it would look like if possible to make a make this hybrid routing uh, universal solution uh, mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. sorry little tangent uh, but yes no that's that's fine I need to actually check yeah good okay um, right so here this is just um, you know crash um, there we go uh, so this is having some kind of issue when it should be reloading whatever um, but you can see that little pending state, right, for a few seconds while it's doing that work. Um, and then it should be reloading this data and it's not. Um, so this is great, like this is cool. This is a progressively enhanced form, right? Like we like that right. stuff. Um, if you look down here, I have this nice little multi-action form component yeah. that's connected right. to this action. action. We, it, yeah. It's awkward to do add to do dot form, right? Like you have, um, but it's the same right. kind of thing. Um, yeah, felt kit went in this direction, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sounds yeah, good. I'm actually, sending the arguments here as a URL encoded um, form data type thing, yep. right? So you yep. can actually add arguments here. Um, if I had like an input type equals hidden. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's name the... equals whatever. I could add that yeah. as an argument up in my server function, right? Um, yeah. And the benefit of doing it that way instead of with JSON is um, is this, that we're, we're just going to hope works, right? This is the thing I was I was fixing right before we started. I'm going to turn off yeah. WebAssembly. Okay. Oh, so oh, this is interesting because you, what you're saying is progressive enhancement has even a higher bar benefit for WebAssembly because yes. it's not even just it's not even just yes. turning off JavaScript. It's like it works without WebAssembly. So yeah, of you course. You tell me, you tell me that time to interactive matters on this application, right? right. The, the the cost of WASM. And time to interactive. This is interactive. This yeah. is interactive with WebAssembly disabled. This is fine. The links work if there were links. The form works if you structure it correctly. This is a multi-page app written yeah. in a, a nice Rust front-end framework running with no WebAssembly at all. Um, yeah. It's much better if, uh, you know, if I don't screw it up, of course, and if, it's, you know, if it can do it and it actually gets the stuff right. Um, it's much nicer to do the progressive enhanced form. We had that nice little optimistic UI for a second. Like that's cool. That's that's good. Yeah. But I think this is the way forward for WebAssembly stuff in a lot of okay. ways. Because that makes sense. I am not smart enough to solve the code splitting problem with WebAssembly. I hope that somebody else is. That's so out of my wheelhouse. But this kind of stuff of um, progressive enhancement, right? Now we have just a Rust server side app. I'm I'm putting an artificial delay on this because it's all on localhost and it's a SQLite database. It would be it would be you could not see the change um, just for the optimistic UI, but I mean, you now have a super fast Rust web app that works even before WebAssembly is loaded. Um, nice, yeah. And that's a pretty good deal to be able to write that in an isomorphic full stack way, as if you're writing front end code. You've got this co-located server function up here. 
doing its thing. Like, I really like this pattern. I, um, I stole it from you. I stole it from Remix. I appreciate you all very much for the work you've done. But I think this is the way forward for, for WebAssembly stuff because this can be a super fast app and then it benefits from the WebAssembly on top of it. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I, I mean, you might have not heard my long rants on PE is no replacement for proper hydration and can be confusing. But the difference is I'm also talking in a zone where JavaScript frameworks are using that for as a or like for complacency, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. But the, on like you know what I mean. Like I, I've had long, long debates with the remix guys that like like there's a if if you land on a page and you click a button and like again, this is I mean over exaggerating, but like like you click a button and does a full page reload versus if you had waited like l- l- half a second later and it wouldn't do a full page reload. Like the the right. actual the experience drop off is actually cons- considerable, um, right. which is why I didn't like people. I didn't like the argument that uh, progressive enhancement is like a replacement or like uh, like like the, like it it it, it right. removes our responsibility to solve hydration. Right. But on the other hand, um, this is also, as you mentioned, like WebAssembly is not at a place where we can actually solve those problems. Whereas in JavaScript, right. I think we are in a place where we can solve those problems. Right. So like, I, I think this, I think this makes a ton of sense in terms of getting like adoption and stuff in, because like now you can go look, okay, like you don't have to necessarily suffer it. The page will work. Um, you like Th- this this is a very compelling argument for people building full uh, UIs in, in WebAssembly. As I said, uh, progressive enhancement is important in general because yeah. JavaScript doesn't always work. There's so many reasons why you want to build uh, things that are progressively enhanced. It's really uh, it's funny we call it progressive enhancement, but it's really the other thing. Uh, was it uh, um, graceful degradation? Degradation, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. That's what it, that's what it is. Yeah, um, yep, so, exactly. And I think I think because not even if you're on like an older iOS or older Android, it might not even support WebAssembly at all. Like you may have a device that just won't load it at all. And if you have one of these faked, you know, button on click equals navigate somewhere, that's going to be the world's most frustrating app. You've server side rendered an app that does nothing. No, you want to build with good patterns based on actual HTML elements like A and form and then progressive enhancement yeah. because the, the, the degradation is so much more likely with WebAssembly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is this, and this for this is a very compelling story on your side for closing that gap because you're not going to, as you mentioned, you, you're, I, we're not going to the time to interactive. It, like it's not going to, it's not gonna, like JavaScript's going to have that. Like that's where we're working right now. JavaScript's going to have that for a while, but with this, you can legitimately say like it's probably okay, and you got to do this. Like this makes it very viable um, because right now the biggest legit argument against wasm is the initial load like it's mm-hmm. it's 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 that the dom updates as you've shown are not a concern like mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the other stuff so this yeah this is this is very powerful um mm-hmm. someone's asking like what the bundle size for uh for like leptos was earlier in the stream and i, I didn't want to bring it yeah, up yeah, right yeah. now yeah yeah so i was just loading it to see if i could actually um check that out and i just compiled the release build let's see if this is a useful number okay so so the release build i have not done everything i don't think i even set the flags of how to um yeah okay good i did so this is 473 kilobytes of of web assembly um that will for the to-do app yeah yep yeah yeah. that'll gzip down whoops um that'll gzip down to oh i i turned off the server that that's probably 100 kilobytes gzipped um, right, which oh, is okay. You know, yeah, I mean, a hundred, a hundred kilobyte, kilobytes uh, to do MVC is basically Next.js. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, right, 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 right. So if you're comparing to Next.js, right, yeah, it, we're killing it. If you're comparing a solid, solid start Svelte kit, we're not. Um, but it's yeah. important, right? Like I would say, four, four-ish, three or four years ago, Mozilla published a, a, an article on their streaming compilation, and what Mozilla basically said was. Um, at this point, Firefox's compiler can pretty much compile WebAssembly as fast as it can come in over the network. So like if you're on a, a cell phone with less power, it can compile it pretty much as fast as your cell data can send it in. And if you're on a desktop, it can compile it pretty much as fast as your Wi-Fi can send it in. Um, and that was three or four years ago. And the other browsers are all have all cut up and all that too. Um, and it's kind of like 
there are definitely load time impacts. The more, the slower a network you are on and the lower power the hardware, the more you notice it. Um, and that's why we're doing the graceful degradation stuff. But it's not, it like is 100 kilobytes gzipped too much to wait for for most user interactions in most applications. This is a very right. simple app. The, the thing that actually get us on bundle size are actually serialization and deserialization um, of data because it has to be typed. Um, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, mm, but I see. There, there are things that bloat the code. Um, this is fairly hefty. Like those counter examples, those counter examples would have been um, 55 kilobytes un, un gzipped, 10, maybe 10, 15 kilobytes gzipped. And Leptos is kind of hefty. Sycamore, you can get a component that's down in like maybe 40 kilobytes. So that's like 10 kilobytes gzipped. Um, at that point, that's not, um, but that's for a counter, right? I mean, that's nothing. But the run times, like, yeah, it's the, the actual run time for this stuff is smaller in WASM terms than like React and okay. React DOM are in JavaScript terms. Um, right. So, yeah, because someone was asking about the scaling of like as it grows. So the component size is a bit larger just because of that. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it, it scales poorly because there's no code splitting, right? Like, for sure, the more the more you add and the more different kinds of data you're serializing and deserializing. Um, and there are certain gotchas, um, but it, it, you know, it can scale up to being um, a megabyte in a release build for an application, right? And that's a lot to download. I mean, gzipped maybe 300 kilobytes. Um, that's that's a big ask for, uh, you know, time to interactive. Um, but again, that's why like some of these exploring some of these patterns is important. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, and, and there's a whole class of like apps that don't care anyway. So like if, if, if you can at least make it, it just needs to get to that point where people can use it and it doesn't, they don't sense the clunkiness. If you can get yes. to that point, then um, that's, that's interesting. I, you know, especially if, if there are, you know, people who were like, yeah, I want to build everything in Rust. Like, yeah, why not? I mean, I don't know what language Figma is actually written in, but it's I, it's it's WebAssembly, right? Um, as its output, I assume it's C plus plus or something. Um, there's a reason that like Figma is the best known and most used WASM based app because uh, who cares about load time? <laughs> you're you're sitting in the thing, you're doing design work. It boots up faster than Photoshop would, um, and you know whatever. Um, so I, I think that that is like never you know they're never going to rewrite eBay and use WASM, right? Um, yeah, yeah, but. There are lots of other apps. I mean, it's like that spectrum you were showing the other the other week um, in terms yeah. of are, are you on the high performance really an app app thing or not? Um, yeah. No, I mean, I've got this, a, the, oh, you sorry, gotta go. I've got to go. Is that what you're saying? Minutes. Yeah, yeah. I was, yeah. So I was just gonna say. I was I was just looking at the questions and stuff and seeing if there's anyone because yeah, if you have a question, you probably don't have time, but you can try and get it in here quick. Yeah, like um, but yeah. Yeah, I was just I was just gonna say that yeah, like I think it was really cool seeing the other frameworks because like it, it it looks like the work you're actually doing along the lines of like going more it's kind of like the solid fine grain uh, approach is actually making a better Rust DX story as well compared to yes. like like you and the more React style because yeah. this is the way it fits in and then you, you you've gone and created uh, you, you like a, a SSR wrapper is this like a separate package like what is this? Um, oh yeah, so that's built. So that's built in. It's the same. It's the same as um, okay. how Solid kind of has three different outputs for the JSX transform. We have kind of three different outputs. So the the um, that view macro, if you're in SSR mode, that's just producing strings um, right. that all get you know the holes get filled in and they get concatenated at runtime um, and and so on. So yeah, it, it just exists SSR mode, client side rendering mode, hydration mode. Um, we may even be able to consolidate client side rendering and the hydration with the, the new work that's being done. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just built in. It's just part of the app from de part of the uh, framework from, from the beginning. That's really awesome. Whereas uh, you, you just shipped, you just shipped SSR in U 0.20 like last week. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Which is also uh, exciting. I think the thing we talked about before was that uh, question about web workers, but I think the what we talked about before was that like using WASM doesn't change the equation on web workers. Like essentially, if if web, if web workers weren't good enough for JavaScript, they're not going to be good enough here. Okay, WASM is not a magic bullet for anything. It's a way of compiling other languages 
to run in the DOM with the same exact limitations as JavaScript in a lot of ways. Would laptops be able to compile individual WASM buzzers for each page in an app so that, yeah, so they're acting about code splitting. Um, yes, I, I have done that. I had an earlier iteration of something where I was doing individual web components that were running a really tiny VDOM and then it was like acting like islands in an MPA architecture. You run into right. all the sorts of problems of coordinating state and stuff. I just decided to do something different. Um, and it's yeah. awkward because in, in Rust, yes, you can compile those all separately. It's a little difficult to, you have to kind of do that manually. It's, a, it's annoying. Um, and you run into the same problem because one component, if it needs to you know, deserialize serialize data, be doing something, it can still blow out its own individual bundle. Um, and you may still need it to be on the page. So it's it's a possible solution. You you can do it. If you want to go MPA, you can compile all those pages separately and so on. Um, but then you're doing an MPA, right? All right. That's great. Well, I know you got to go now. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I learned a ton. I think everyone here learned a ton. Um, honestly, thank you so much. Uh, it was it was so, so awesome being here. Um, and enjoy the rest of the stream. Uh, actually, is there anything else you want to plug? I, I think you should drop, if you, if you can get into the chat, or maybe send it to me in private chat, any kind of links or anything that we should uh, plug for you before you drop off. Um, we should do that. Sure. I'll just, I'll just drop a link to our, our uh, repository here. And seriously, if, um, you know, if you're interested in getting into Rust, um, check it out, check out you, check out Sycamore. Um, yeah, just, just go for it. Oh, and I'll put my, my uh, uh, Twitter handle too. Is Sorry, is this? Are you dropping into the into the? Put it in the, the YouTube the, chat. I'm sorry. Yeah, perfect. Okay, that's awesome. All right, cool, Greg. Uh, awesome. We'll talk again soon. But thanks see for you having all. you. Super Have fun. A good one. Take care. Yes, yeah. The stream is not over though. Um, I, I imagine a couple of you might drop off, but we still got uh, this week in JavaScript where I get to talk, give my opinion on all the stuff that's been going on the last little bit. But man, that was awesome. <laughs> Seriously. I, I, like, I knew about this work going on. Um, I, I, we didn't show this on stream, which is funny enough. We can, I, I'm going to share my screen for two seconds, and I'm actually going to show you something. Because we were talking about performance and you know talking about you know this stuff. But l let me actually paint the picture for you, um, which we haven't actually done here. Is that we, we didn't, I'm surprised at no point during the stream we pulled up the JS framework benchmark. Um, because this is what spawned this whole conversation. Right, uh, and that, like, let's let's get in here. Th th this is infam infamous table thing here. But if I just want to kind of like, this is what he meant when he was talking about performance at the beginning. And I'm gonna drop off a, a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. But look, we, we saw it today. We saw you. We saw you hooks. Um, we saw. Let's let's put some stuff in there. Let's, we saw salt. Let's talk solid. Um, Wasm bind gen. We talked about that today. Let's talk, we t what else did we talk about? We talked about Leptos, we talked about Sycamore. Um, uh, we probably can't do any comparison without putting React in there. Uh, Vue, we should probably grab some vanilla JS. And what else do we want? Uh, uh, Vue, vanilla JS, um, <laughs> Redwood. Uh, or did I grab Sycamore yet? Sycamore, yeah, I got it. Uh, we we just grab Svelte because Svelte is a is a performant JavaScript framework. Um, yeah, what what else we got? Yeah, I think uh, Preact probably. I'm just trying to get like all the 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 big markers that I can get there. Blazor, yeah, you know we 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 should put Blazor in to be fair. Um, Blazor Wasm. Um, there's also Blazor ahead of time. I don't know what the difference is on that, but let's put them both in. Uh, we don't have live view here. This is a client side updating framework. Yeah, let's put lit in here. Why not? Uh, Lit's version's kind of cheating a little bit by the rules, but I don't really care. It's not going to make a difference. Um, okay. And I think that's good enough for now. I think we have we have the big ones. Okay. Cool, and let's let's just take a look at this for a second. So I didn't mean to full screen it that way. I wanted to just do this, okay, and just kind of understand where where the shape of things are these days. Because 
uh, to the surprise of no one, Blazer is just not anything. It's way over here, right? Oh, I, I missed I missed one. We didn't actually talk about it today, but I I, I was informed that Dominator actually um, is sort of gaming this benchmark a little bit, um, which I was not aware of. Apparently, they do the Mikado thing where they uh, um, kind of like you use a custom data and sinuous where you do this custom you kind of opt into a custom data format which makes the updates one for one instead of actually uh making it so that you can just use normal data they're actually like gaming it a bit i didn't realize that but uh dominator is another u framework okay or so not you sorry uh wasm framework okay so this is the reason i want to talk about this is just so that you can kind of understand that the WASM frameworks are actually in the mix here with the JavaScript frameworks, right? So vanilla JS obviously is the fastest, right? But WASM vanilla is is very close. It's just this is basically the same thing written with directly with the uh, WASM APIs, and it it is it is surprisingly close. It, you know, there is some overhead. On some of these things, but it, it is actually surprisingly close. So this, maybe they're starting at a, at a like, a slower basis, right? And then uh, we got solid here, right? So solid, solid sits here in between. But Leptos is only a few points behind solid. And if you look here, what he was commenting on was while solid is faster for creation, um, they're they're they. They've actually got us on a couple of the uh, update benchmarks. I need to look at this one. I think it's slowed down, but they actually have like a couple points where they're they're mostly losing is on creation and removal, essentially like big DOM operations where you have to add a lot of nodes or clean up a lot of nodes is where Leptos is trailing. Right, it's right there, and then you get to Lit. I told you Lit's cheating a little bit. But it's not like a big deal. I mean, it, it's that it's all it's it's only like it, it makes a difference of like 0 0.04. So lit should be maybe closer to view, but it doesn't really matter. Then you get dominator, which I also said is kind of doing a bit of a gaming here. Then you get view and sycamore, which are basically right next to each other. Again, wasn't paying the create cost. Then you get to svelte, which is over here. And preact and react and then you and Blazor over here, uh, but just to show you that like from the update performance standpoint, updating the DOM is not the bottleneck per se. We're we're actually got got to a place where Wasm and most of the popular ja like JavaScript frameworks are like you you know like they're very close. Uh, quick is not quick here per se. I mean, they're not bad, but I, my understanding is that they're around preact. Um, again, it, it, think about it. It's a virtual DOM that updates with signals. It, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know if they're slower or faster than preact. They still have to get their implementation, but I would imagine that it would look a lot like what we were looking on the preact signal stream. Okay, so how's lit cheating? Uh, 801 is, what they're doing is they're putting the selected UI state in the data model. Uh, in this test, there uh, there is a, uh, a bunch of rows. This is a table benchmark. And uh, it's basically like a to-do list, essentially. Um, you, you draw a bunch of rows, do simple CRUD operations on those rows, and there's a selected state on the, on the item rows, right? And if you put, if you have a global selected state that projects onto all the rows, like row one is selected, row two selected, um, that's how the benchmark is set up. But if you put the is selected on every single row, then you get a slight performance optimization because when you change from select, like it's 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 only order of two, like you only need to cha change two rows. You change the currently selected and the unselected one. Um, so if you know, if you basically set it on one row. You just have to know to unset it on the other one and set it on the other uh, and set it on the new selected row, the one you click on. Whereas if you do it via projection, like you have select rows twelve, um, generally with the way the rendering works, you have to like literally iterate through all the rows to make the change. Um, it's not cheating in the sense that it's 
um, other frameworks you do that sort of optimization under the hood. It's more that like the authoring experience, the whole point of this test is like write something in a certain way so that you're not polluting the the UI model with um, with like local state. And uh, th this that's why it gets flagged for it, if that makes sense. Yeah, a DX chart. It'd be it'd be hard to. I think DX is subjective. One thing that is interesting is is that you can look at the implementations in code. This is very important to this kind of benchmark because, like, I, I love I love looking at this kind of stuff because then you can go in and you can be like, okay, what does it take to to render it? Right? You know, in Solid, we got a few function components. We create some state event handlers, and then we have our JSX, and we're done. It's pre pretty nice, but you can also like go in and see, um, you know, you can, you can look at any of these. I think the code side by side is actually really important. Like what we can see leptos actually, I'm kind of curious what it looks like. Um, there's yeah, again, here's the, the setup code, then, um, bro model. Okay. This is where they build the data. Um, so this is all set of code and then we get in our app, we have our couple signals, we have our event handlers. And then here is that same thing that we were just looking like. Look, even the four component. This is this is very very solid. Um, they didn't talk about it, but the it, leftos like signals being uh, tuples, or tuples or whatever you want to say, and like having that the control flow components and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So and there's the the mount function. So looks cool. But you know you can go in here and you can see other stuff too, like. Uh, let's look at Svelte. I know this one because I think I wrote it, or I did the Svelte 3 upgrade. Um, this main Svelte, you know, it's interesting. This is actually, you know what? This is backwards. It's funny. Svelte now puts the script tags on top, but because the original implementation was Svelte 2 and I wasn't com aware of that convention, when I updated it, I, I kept the script tag on the bottom. It doesn't really matter much, but you can see the same thing, right? Here's that view code, and then in here you have your setup, and then all your Things. The thing is, this benchmark is very simple, that almost all the implementations look the same, which made it really easy to go through and kind of categorize them. Right? So, yeah. How did Microsoft manage to make Blazor slow? The funny thing is, Blazor is, Blazor is just... I think it... I, part of me kind of wondered if like what what they were kind of trying to do on the prototype side like i know they had a lot to accomplish and maybe they they went for i think they probably went for like a compatibility standpoint they're like can we take this net setup and let you do everything you do with it and see if it works because like you're right if you start from a minimal standpoint and go okay this does nothing let's let's see if the performance would be viable you wouldn't you wouldn't end up with with this you know like cuz like it, oh, it, these benchmarks you know you know they're synthetic whatever but I, I've used Blazor apps, like the real world demo version of Blazor. It's, it is noticeably slow. I remember once I was, the Chrome Dev Tools had a bug and I, I loaded the Blazor version for the real world demo in Lighthouse and it gave me uh, like a hundred. And I was like, what's going on? Nothing else I did, did a hundred. They did like 99 or 98. I did like, I, I, like Svelte and Solid were like right up there and Blazor got a hundred. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I looked at the trace and Blazor took so lo long to load that it, they thought the, that it was done. They thought like the white page was was it being done. Um, like it, like it went for like twelve seconds. It, it was a bad run, I think. But it was like it it, it 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 was it was just like it went so long that they like they assumed the page would have had to have been done. Um, anyway, like. Yeah, one one of one of those kind of scenarios where something's just kind of like way out of the range. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, this this is this is a interesting thing. But I just wanted to show like I think there's trade offs here. Like if you look at the kilobyte weight, like. I don't know if there's something about this runtime. We're, we are seeing that you can tell which ones are the web as assembly ones, right? Well, actually, that's not completely true. React also is like the same size. Like here's here's a perfect example: Leftos and Re React. Like React is basically the same size as the the, the web assembly frameworks. 
Um, you is a little bit larger, and bl- again, I don't know what they're doing. Like Blazer makes Ember look bad. I, I honestly, I, I I I have no clue. Maybe it's the implementation. Um, but yeah, other thing you're gonna see is that there's some overhead on some of the, the memory side stuff. Like th- there's again, this is being very granular on this, but you can you can tell again very clearly which ones are fast web frameworks and which ones are WASM or React. Um, so, yeah. No, no. Bla- Bla- Blazor, Blazor doesn't even get yellow. Oh, wait, yes. Um, the, the load time isn't that... Like, the, the actual... This is basically a client-rendered page... So the time it takes for the blank page to load the scripts actually um, isn't any worse than anything. It looks like React is actually the worst here. Um, so yes, the, Blazor did get a green on one slide. But other than that, it, it's even struggling for yellow. What's the fastest VDOM right now? Um, it's a tie. And we'll talk about that during this week in JavaScript. Like... I mean, let, let's clear it. I, 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 I'm trying to remember if there's anything slower than Blazor. I, I don't think there is. Let's just look. It's hard to say. At times there have been. Oh, yeah, yeah, Chew. And I don't know what Forgo is, but Chew, Chew is. But even they have, like, a few good points. Blazor literally isn't good at anything uh, from a benchmark standpoint here. Um but I mean, it's all point of view. Like Alpine JS, which is really good for like the lightweight JavaScript stuff, kind of like a petite view, is what way back at the back of the list next to um, like that Ember Starbeam thing, uh, the universal reactivity and Blazor and stuff like that. So like sometimes like this isn't showing everything in its best light is the way I, I should put it. Like it's not like this might be forcing some things into use cases that they weren't designed for, like um, managing tables and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think I missed everything. Uh, I, I'm, and this is Alpine three as well. When they switched it to the, the view core, I think older Alpine was actually worse. I think it was on the other side of blazer, like, uh, Alpine two. Um, yeah, the funniest thing is. I, I've been kind of joking for a while that uh, that um, uh, what, what's I going to call it? Uh, I'm going to change my view here. But that like solid should just take back blazingly fast because you know it's been like five years now that we've been like at the front of the benchmark. Um, you know, like you know, it's a meme. But I was like, no, let's let's just like legit. It's like it's retro cycle. Let's let's do it. Um, but but the funny thing is the original blazing. Lee fast framework has made a comeback. So again, um, let's, let's, uh, let's get ready for this week in JavaScript. Give me two seconds here while I get my, my Twitters in the right zone and not share stuff that I shouldn't be sharing on screen. God, I should, I need to do this off screen from now on because of freaking Twitter circles. Um, I only ever show my own profile, so it's it's not a it's typically not a problem, but like uh, uh, I, I just it's worth pointing out. Okay, where are we now? All right. God, what week is it? I guess it was Wednesday when we uh, when we last had a stream. Okay, got that. Got that. What else do we got to talk about? I'm not going to talk about this on on this week in JavaScript, but just a side note: I was talking about Angular earlier. Um, this was a I, I just I had to bookmark this little little quote here because it, it was pretty sweet, um, at least from like where I'm standing. Is that uh, I was talking to them looking at signals. We're definitely learning a lot from SolidJS. We've been having Quick for 10 years at Google now, and that's definitely a product we're getting inspiration from as well. So they're talking about where the future 
of Angular is going. I, I love this, though. This, this is a nice acknowledgement. Minko, if you don't know, is the basically... Uh, he's the 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 lead on Angular now. He's the he's the, he's the, he's the one in charge. Not charged from managerial standpoint, but he's like the he's the, he's the he's the lead of Angular. So um, it's it's sweet. As I mentioned, even seeing the, this kind of inspiration, like I, basically um, the talking about leftovers, it, the fine grain reactivity was part of that breakthrough, which caused Wasm to actually be viable. So I mean, that's pretty sweet. Knockout will always be the tr thank you, Ben. Uh, always in my heart, right? All right, so I think I think I think I have everything I need for the for for for, for this week in JavaScript. Um, yeah, let's. And I'm just I'm gonna start with that. So let's do, let's just do this. You got you you all ready for this week in JavaScript? All right. All right. All right. And we're a little earlier. I think this time might work a little bit better for people. Just like the half an hour means all my like meandering at the beginning means that we're not like super late when we get to this point. So yeah, if, if that's a thing, comment. Also, uh, l let me do a Theo thing right here for a second. You know, please like the YouTube thing. It should be somewhere over here. It's funny, I'm not full screen, so that's not working, but... Uh, it, seriously, it helps. Um, if 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 you're in there, please please do like um, like the YouTube video. Um, yeah. So anyway, okay. Let's 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 get this thing rolling. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah, I nailed it. Okay. All right. Actually, let's do that. I'm gonna go full screen for a second. Gonna take a swig of water because I can. Show off solid merchandise. All right. All right. I'm a little decked out today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, I people are stopping watching the stream now. <laughs> you can always go to. SolidJS.com slash store. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'm 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 just I'm just playing. All right. Um actually sorry, give me two seconds. I want to open up one more Twitter tab, um, just in case um uh what I want to do is I want to uh in case there's anything SolidJS specific that I want to pull up. Cause it I keep on forgetting that there 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 has been um there's been there's been a lot of cool stuff that's been going on in, in our ecosystem as well, um, and I think I, I think I should remember to showcase that. Yeah, I yeah, it's right here. Perfect. Okay, now I have caught everything. Now I am ready. Um, I believe. Let's see what do we got in comments. Don't forget about Twitch Prime. Oh right, right, right. Yes, Twitch Prime. For you who do not know, Amazon. If you signed up for Amazon Prime, you get a free subscription on Twitch, which you can give at no cost to you, to your favorite streamer. That's how he says it, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? You just you just add it, and guess what? You're, you're just giving the money to me. You're taking away from Amazon, um, and it, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm very submiss. Uh, yeah, I'm... Oh wow! Thank you, AJ. I this is I have to remember. Thanks for the hint. I have to go back and look at it. This is the first time anyone has given me gift subs. Um, thank you so much. Uh, no, I'm serious. This is this is amazing. Um, I I I'm new to this whole um, Twitch affiliate subbing thing. So um, this is so awesome. Oh wow! More gift subs. I'm um, insanity later. I, I now, now I can't say that. What the, the, a hype train is close. Okay, sweet. I, I this yeah. This is the first time that that they have informed me that a hype train even exists. I I I'm definitely not twitching properly. So, um, thank you for making this seem almost like a legit stream. <laughs> oh, thank you, 
Seriously, what's this Christmas in December? Great comment. Thank you. Uh, uh, nice. I've been informed of a hype train is the most hype sentence. Yeah. If I was a, if I was better at the streaming thing, it might actually work. But no, seriously, legit, thank you. Um, oh yeah, Prime Sub from Excalo, thank you. There we go. We 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 are talking about Prime Subs actually worked. So <laughs> thank you everyone. Um, I appreciate it. Okay, okay, okay. Let's let's actually let's actually do this for real. Okay. Um, I've been killing enough time. I know there are streams out there where people just sit there and interact with the chat for like an hour and then do some actual content, but that's that's not um, that's not my game. So let's let's just do this. Um, banner, let's do it. I'll get there one day. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. If Ryan becomes a streamer, all his frameworks get signals. I mean, we're we're already getting pretty close, but. Yeah, I mean, if if that's how we push it, if the stream popularity is how um, is how frameworks make their decision, you know, part of the decision matrix, then yeah, that that would be interesting. Oh man, <laughs> good times. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, yeah, we got another prime sub from uh, I, I never know how to pronounce it. Bland Criver. Thank you. Um, I need to keep on switching to Twitch. Oh yeah, yeah, hype train. That's, that's crazy. Level four hype train. That's uh, having, being, having zero hype until this point. That's, that's, that's pretty big. Yes. Okay, fine. You want to plug? Here you go. Thank you, AG for the gift subs. Here's a plug FS jam. Um, I, I have no qualm saying that it's one of my two favorite podcasts. Um, Pod Rock and FS Jam were great to me right from the beginning. And what I love about it, talking to hosts, always felt legitimately interested in the future of web dev and what we talk about, similar to the stuff we do on the stream, which is good because I've been on podcasts, some even more popular podcasts, and everyone seemed kind of like blase, not interested. Um, th this is one of the, this was, these guys are, are legit. They feel, it's got that same vibe that you get from watching the stream. So very good podcast. All right, God. Oh, B Woody is continuing the gift sub they got from AJ. Okay, sweet. Yeah, I, I. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's funny. Okay, I, I haven't missed any more Prime subs, hopefully, um, or subs. Okay. Um. All right, let's just uh, keep this going. I don't even know what a continuing gift sub is. Someone might have to explain that to me. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, that's fine. We, we, we're, we are actually talking about JavaScript. Or actually, I guess we were talking about Rust. But now we're going to talk about JavaScript, right? Um, all right, let's let's do this. Sorry, I've been I've been talking so long. People are starting to leave. OK, OK, let's 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 do this um, for real. I even have a cool intro that I haven't figured out. I, I've been cutting the video, so I could publish these separately. I just haven't done it yet because it takes work. All right. Now it's time to talk about this week in JavaScript. Um, okay. So this week in JavaScript, for me, has been a few distinct conversations, per se. Um, this wasn't necessarily the biggest news week, but there was a lot of interesting discussions and I that I think that'll be a lot of fun to to look into um but before we get into that I'm gonna do a quick shout out here um SolidJS New York meetup um sponsored by Babel um this is my first time going to New York I'm actually going to be there um so um this is our second New York meetup but uh I'm pretty excited about this one uh just simply to meet people from the East Coast that I have not had a chance to meet yet. So, um, yeah, if you're in the area, you should check it out. Um, it's on uh, December 13th. And, uh, yeah, I'll be there. I think Ben Ben Holmes will be there. Um, David, core team, uh, several others. So, yeah, come check it out if you're in the area. 
And let's keep on going. Actually, before I get into um, to some of the heavier conversations, I'm going to do a couple quick uh, solid shout outs just from the ecosystem. Um, one of them, uh, I don't know if anyone saw this, was uh, Solid Final Form. Uh, this is a port of a React library, but it, it they added some solid um, elements here using a combination of solid primitives and directives to kind of get that form library. So it's, it's pretty, pretty sweet. You should check it out if you get a chance. Um, someone, I think last stream was like asking if we had certain form libraries. This is, this mind you is more of a proof of concept than an actual library, but there are quite a few. Um, this is another cool one. I know it's on. Um, Quick has ability to put other components inside Quick, kind of like Astro does. And, uh, uh, Guillermo here has been working on this, uh, pretty tirelessly asking questions, working through the problems. And now you can use your solid components inside quick, um, which is pretty cool. Um, like this is, this is full, like server rendered and hydrating, um, using, you know, you can still kind of, because they're included into quick, you, you can use quicks rules of hydration for when the solid code loads. So it's an interesting angle, something you might want to try out. Um, also, uh, 1.0 release of, uh, uh, Papanazi. I don't know how to say this, but this is the web UI, um, component library that's built on mitosis. So they basically wrote the components once in, uh, mitosis, which is kind of like a solid inspired flavor of JSX. And then it outputs it in every framework here. So as you can see, we've got Angular, Preact, Quick, React, Solid, Svelte, Vue, Web Components. Like, essentially, this is might be the first framework-native UI component library because it was able to do, do it this way, where you write the code once, and then it's written specifically for... Um, the specific framework to integrate with it. This is this is really cool. I think this kind of approach, I don't know about necessarily, it'd be interesting to see how far we can push mitosis in this direction, but I think it's really cool to see this kind of path of being able to optimize, instead of having an agnostic solution that works with all the frameworks, to perhaps optimize for each framework. Um, so this is really very, also very interesting. Um, okay, so, I think that's actually it for that kind of stuff. Let's let's get into the interesting uh, discussions. Um, there was two articles this week that I is, that were pretty interesting to me because um, there there uh, there's a reflection going on right now in terms of like the state of React and the JavaScript ecosystem. And the w w one article was written by Kent C. Dodds um, talking about why he loves React. And the other article um, was, um, where was it? Uh, I'm trying to jump ahead here a bit. But it was um, this bye-bye React.js and it's asking like, is React going anywhere? And I want to talk about both of these for a moment because they're unrelated yet they are completely related. So uh, let's 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 start with Kent's article for a moment because I, I have to admit I have an opinion about this because the one thing that these articles have in common is the the need for the author to justify today why like like. Who doesn't know that Kent C. Dodds loves React? Like, I'm pretty sure everybody knows Kent C. Dodds loves React. Why, like, why are we reminded of this right now? Like, why is this a good time um, to, to, you know, bring this up again? Well, for Kent's case, he's relaunching Epic React, his training courses, and his new next case, like, his next moving forward with his, you know, next journey in his career after Remix. So 
and I say after remix kind of lightly because he's still very much involved and in, you know like he's not part of the company working at Shopify but he's he he very much believes in their vision he gives talks I just saw his talk on remix um, at modern front ends um, so like like don't get me wrong th there's a good reason for him to do it right now but it's part of this kind of conversation right where like he's reflecting on when he first heard about react and about like how it was this, you know, jump for him off Angular. But what I love about Kent's story in here was he didn't even care about React at the beginning. Like, he was just kind of like, yeah, I, a few months, like, he's like, I kind of pushed it off, you know. I was so hyped on Angular that I didn't really give React more thought than, hmm. A few months later, I started seeing some of my friends and coworkers try it out and share what they thought was interesting. They encouraged me to give it a solid shake. I put it off for a while. I was busy. Like, he's just, you know, like, this, this is life. This is how these things go. Right, and then he says, like later on, he finally tried it, and he's like, "What?" He just played it for three minutes, and he's like, "Okay, I need to change what I'm doing." Right, and he, I, what I love about this article is he he focuses on React's initial selling value. You can argue what whether this is not still true to this day, but there is a diff difference between simple versus easy. This is a design philosophy that we bake into SolidJS hugely. It's it's actually why if you go into like uh, our website, for example, and and go to like the guide section where it's like there's like a thinking in solid kind of thing. I I'm trying to I'm trying to remember where it ended up here. Think solid. Simple is better than easy. Um, like this is one of our defining traits. This is what we learn from React. And I feel like this article really kind of highlights this. Um, and he's he's talking about you know what makes React simple because it's very clear when state updates what happens. He likes JSX. He likes hooks, um, even though they weren't there at the beginning. And he's like, I I've been able to do whatever the hell I wanted with React, right? You know, and then he uh, he leaves it obviously talking about the community and stuff. You know, and the truth of the matter is like everyone knows this. Like, the most popular framework has the most jobs. Um, I, I, I did actually have a, like, I thought this was a very well-written article and I think that it kind of really portrays, like, it's what I would expect from Kent, um, in terms of this, but I, I had to ask the question. <laughs> yeah. And I understand the criticism a bit to now. Oh, the meta framework problem is SSR. This is a problem for everyone. Isomorphic JavaScript, complicated things. Um, so I, I do want to kind of put that, put that out there that it's the same reason why I created solid start. It was literally just because it's so hard to configure SSR. Um, as, but I don't know if this is like for react core, it's a slightly different question, but I was like, okay, this is my question for like people kind of coming from this mindset. And this is not new. I like, I forget who is it, uh, was I think Corey, like there's been a few similar posts about this kind of idea recently. And I said, reflecting on what it meant to move from Angular and looking at the points presented, I wonder how many newer solutions compare more favorably than reacted at the time of the same reasoning. And what I mean by that is this is something that's real struggle for kind of current frameworks a little bit like Svelte or solid is that people keep on going, Oh, you know, when you get this or this or the community or whatever. But the th funniest thing is like when people first inv invested in react, there was no community. There was this react at that point. Well, arguably better than its competition um, was not particularly like, like it, it'd been around for, you know, six months or a year. Like people started like, it's funny when the people talk about the longevity and the stability question. Svelte's been around in open source for six years. Like, you kind of pushing back on it um, because, you know, it's new or whatever. Like, six years is not new. Like, I, I just kind of wanted to put that out there. And that, that was basically most of what I was saying on, the, on this comment. We got some great responses. React is simple, which is one of the reasons why it can get very difficult. This is, this is the truth about simplicity. Like, I, I, if, if you really want to dig into simple versus easy, you got to, like, get in a mindset where you understand that Redux is one of the simplest state libraries in existence. 
it doesn't mean that it's easy to use. People get confused by it all the time and how to wire it up. And it's been notoriously hard to teach people for some reason, but it is actually very, very simple. So, yeah, I, I mean, there, there's, there's a great conversation on this side, but yeah, assembly language is simple, right? Upfront cost. <laughs> but yeah, some people have felt, you know, I love that Kent is open enough to actually respond to this and go like, hey, you know, maybe, maybe the, today the gap is, is, isn't even as wide. So yeah, a lot of criticism react, but that wasn't really what my, my point was. It was more that I, I just, this is the narrative we're seeing people kind of coming back now because there's been a lot of new frameworks, new technologies, and this feeling the need to kind of justify why we're still on React. Um, and I think it's interesting to kind of reflect on the what got you in, like the way things were when we took on React in the first place weren't so cemented as they are today. Yeah, I think there is one. This is why when I do those generalized graphs that everyone's like, what the hell are you talking about, Ryan? And I'm like, it kind of works the same on multiple axes depending on what you're showing. It's it's these kind of things. Um, generally, uh, the more opinionated you get, it gets, it, yeah, it. The, I, I do see the correlation. Um, okay, so that's the first one. This one wasn't as big of a thing, but I want to I wanna kind of jump ahead um to uh to the other one here which is this one cuz i have more to say about this one i want to talk about the is react going anywhere blog the f unfortunate thing apart about this is this blog was released on like a was it info info excator or something like one of those like kind of generic blog sites it, oh no no this is the guy's personal blog never mind forget about it um the thing was I, they didn't post their own uh they didn't I, I couldn't find this on twitter I, I was trying to find where the original blog post was so that um so that like i could retweet it but instead i couldn't find it i looked everywhere and i ended up just tweeting myself and most people thought i wrote the article not most, but I, from the responses, a bunch of people thought that I wrote the article. What I was trying to say is I have a thread below where I'm giving my response to the article. I did not write th this article, um, but it did not come out that way for a lot of people. But this article is great anyways, because basically it starts with this kind of story where they're like, I was talking to someone, you know, okay, first of all, React is getting old. Yeah, 10 years old. But, but essentially, they, they started the story by talking about someone who said that they had to move off React for the e-commerce solution. It just wasn't fast enough. They just couldn't make it fast enough. Um, and, in, and, and, and the funny thing about this conversation was, oh, you must have found a better framework. So what are you moving to? Any of these? You know, it's views, felt, solid, quick, you know, whatever. No, we're just keeping React for server-side rendering for now and using vanilla JavaScript in the front end. And my understanding is Netflix actually did a very similar move a, a while a, a while ago. And um, the, the funny thing is, yeah, I mean, the truth of the matter is they were probably too invested on React server-side rendering. Because even for e-commerce, like ser React server-side rendering is actually pretty slow. But as we mentioned in the last uh, section when we were talking about WASM, um, the impact on the client side is, is much bigger impact than the server side part. Like you, making your server rendering 10 times faster will improve your cost, like your money, like how much your, it, it costs, but it won't affect your users as much as improving your client side execution. So, um, yeah, if you care, like if the user part is important, then it, like it, that's not like being able to leverage this isomorphic, you know, JavaScript could be more important. But in this case, they went all the way. They're like, we're doing vanilla. And I mean, that's the thing, right? Um, because the, it, it, compared to classic solutions, there there is like, there's a lot of improvements that we've made on the single page app framework side that has drastically improved the kind of developer experience right but i mean you, you could also but i mean there's an argument there 
that it's not just performance or just DX. Cause like arguably there's better DX than react too. Like there's a reason why it's like, that's one of Svelte's like selling points is that it's DX is considerably better or even solid. That generally is the DX is better or view actually pretty much every front end framework pretty much uh, suggests that their DX perhaps is better than React, especially since hooks. So it's not it's not DX, it's not performance. Um, and uh, essentially, is this going to become more common now? Are people moving away from React the same way, you know, the Angular thing? Uh, you know, and I have a theory about that because when you're the big player, it's not that the little guys come in. It's It's that, like, the big guys miss something. I feel like that's actually the narrative. Like they, they give up ground angular to angular two was like a chink in the armor. And that's where things got in. It wasn't like, it's very hard. I mean, it, it was less entrenched then than it is today, but it's a lot slower of a path. If you're just going to beat any existing solution with a slightly better one. But the point is, is react a problem, you know, and I mean, they, they, they talk a bit about performance benchmarks and applications. And, you know, ultimately, as they go through this, yeah, they talk about the cost of rewrites. Like, no one wants to migrate. Um, this is going to be echoed in another third uh, thing I want to talk about in a minute. But, like, <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome is coping mechanisms a captive abusive thing. People develop positive feelings towards the captors. And he, they think it is Stockholm syndrome, and I actually kind of agree. When I when I when it comes down to stuff like explaining to people why components shouldn't re-render, we we've witnessed this kind of thing where people like React has changed the the wider mindset of how things should work. Um, so it it is, you know, and he, their thing is about JavaScript as well, right? Like the fact that like JavaScript's the only option in the browser so we've been kidnapped so long I, I think this is a very good take here that like if you've been kind of forced into this or th seemingly forced into the situation so long you've like come around to like it um it, it doesn't make it not good necessarily it's just interesting um but i i, I just wanted this i just i wanted to stop on uh, like on this point for a moment just to kind of um the kind of like kind of highlight this um because uh sorry yeah just the the idea that there is a certain pres presumption of where we we, we kind of got here right and this is a commonality they have with this and with with kent's post um so let's 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 go here is react going to be here in the next five years short answer yes like not no doubts what about 10 years? And they, this is the thing. I firmly believe that React is not going to be replaced by any slightly better alternatives. I believe their complete transformation is in their future. And then what's it going to look like? I don't know, blah, blah, blah. They start talking about examples of things changing. But then they go, things like resumability, islands architecture, press and happens, all those fancy new patterns are just slightly better, more efficient ways to accomplish the same goal with a better architecture, but hasn't been a major shift in how we write or produce software front end user interfaces. I think this undersells it a little bit, but given that the scope that the author is talking about, I agree. It is actually a new architecture. The same way, uh, you know, I think what's happening with server components and islands is going is like the the same jump is going from MPA to single page apps, like old web thing. I think we're actually at a generational swap. This person is kind of looking at what I feel like is the next one, like that's going to happen about ten another 10 years from now, if, if that makes any sense. Because like they're, they're, they're talking about AI, um, ML, machine learning, like a whole bunch of crazy stuff that doesn't even exist today in prototype like form. Like it hasn't gone to even the point of like proving the concept. Right? Like that, like essentially... There's this thinking that there's going to be this major shift, and and yeah, React isn't going anywhere. And they're talking about like how you can you know improve the stuff around React, 
and don't get into the millisecond war. You know, there's more important problems. This is all right, and I agree with it. You know, in terms of like, it's not going to be performance. There's some slight DX wins at the front of the funnel that are going to make a change. But honestly, this this I don't know if anyone's seen my recent talk about world beyond components. This is a very complacent attitude in terms of like waiting for the clouds to part, you know, kind of like the biblical reference or like some kind of revolution. And I, I, I think it's kind of, yeah, well, I mean, I actually wrote down exactly what I, what I think. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of go over this for a second. Cause I think it's actually important, right? Even acknowledging react aging, everyone can agree that it isn't going anywhere. The investment is beyond anyone's projects. Those who have reason to migrate off it, will migrate, others will not. Even Greenfield development's a challenge to persuade, persuade even with the definitive benefits. You can go like, this is way better for your use case, but people still use React because of hiring or whatnot. Right? Like, but, you know, and, and similarly, you know, it isn't going to be milliseconds. Yeah, I, I know that. Uh, there's been stuff, there's been solutions faster than React since it came out. And, like, you know, in the case of stuff like SolidJS, which is really obvious to me, like, literally, it's like, in, what, April 2023, it'll be like five years now being the fastest JavaScript framework according to some benchmarks. Many benchmarks, but like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, this doesn't, this isn't going to be doing it. And we've seen Svelte and this DX wins. But the thing is, it's not any individual thing. It's the fact that the package makes it perhaps interesting enough that people will try it because have you seen anything to indicate that this would be a revolutionary change this whole field is evolution even within react we tag revolution label after the fact when we you know find the things that win and it's too, too convenient to point at some future we can't yet see the justifier in action to just be like yeah whatever revolution is going to come I'll, I'll come back don't get me wrong it's okay to adopt that attitude but I ha but when People, it, it's interesting that people want to write about it. Like they, they need to like tell others to do it because that, 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 that's what I was getting with the Kent C. Dodds thing a little bit. Although he, his, he's not being so like harsh on that point. It's like, I think it's pragmatic to choose the, the best solution, um, you know, and across all factors, like looking at hiring an ecosystem. But like, like, so please keep doing that. But it's like, it's too, it's just way too convenient to just like, dis, to be dismissive in this zone. Like if, and this is the example I always use. Like if you went to sleep, took off, went for a nap between 2018, 2013, you'd say react was revolutionary. But in my opinion, it's much more nuanced. I have no doubt like these big things are coming. The kind of ideas, you know, that keep us busy for like a decade plus. But like, to me, it's just a matter of like, like, if you want revolution, then just, like, go take a hike for 10 years. You know, the, the longer the wait, the more, like, a revolutional state. But in reality, this is many separate small steps of evolution that then, when they come together, look like a revolution. Right? And th that's the whole thing. Like, go do that. You know, that's that's on you. You can you can choose to, you know, just take off, right? Um I, I, I was fine there, but I added this extra comment because I don't think people really got it. I was like, next time someone suggests you to wait for that AI from Terminator to build your next website, you know, before you change anything like that, you know, don't, don't change what you're using. The Terminator API will come in 10 years. Like just decide for yourself or your situation what, like what, what's important, what you need to do. Like, like if you're not particularly, you know, you don't have, like, if you have a little leeway, you know, things to, like, consider to make, use, you know, different solutions that are actually, you know, beneficial, then it's worth trying it rather than, like, kind of get into this mob think. Um, and don't worry about those people who told you otherwise. Like, you'll see them again soon. Like, progression has a natural way of just continuing forward. Right? <laughs> Or jQuery, I think, is is actually um, a more similar c comparison, right? Like, but maybe Angular is because, I mean, if you don't mean Angular JS, you mean actual Angular. Maybe maybe that's similar. Um, uh, 
I think the part of the reason people don't care about going off React is because of the mentality that doesn't value quality. Yeah, I mean, I had a great conversation with Dan uh, Abramoff in London, and I, that's what I was suggesting to him. Like, if if the message is good enough, is good enough. How do you sell them on even new parts of React if that good enough isn't good enough? You know. So, like. There's lots of places where you can do improvement. I'm not saying that anyone's going to drop React, but that's like the obvious thing, right? Because like, I, and the reason I wrote this is because there's this like back and forth, right? You you see on social all these shiny things, you know? The people follow me, you on my stream. I show the coolest stuff as it comes out because these are the hints of innovation that will eventually get incorporated into the next things, right? Wasm, all this stuff, right? You, but realistically, you're not going to pick it up, right? Like everyone knows that you don't. You're not going to like, like five years ago when uh, you know first, Solid first showed up in the JS framework benchmark. You're not going to come in and be like, okay, let's rewrite uh, GitHub in it. Like that, that's that's not how this works. But at a certain point, there is enough of push that people feel the need to explain why they can't. And this is the part that got to me, even long after it stopped being shiny and new. Because like when I think of stuff like Solid that's been in development for so long, and it's felt especially, that pushback is kind of like, like, d did people push back on React for six years before they adopted it? Like, using, you know... This, this is kind of the thing, right? Like... I don't know if, if it requires the explanation because like this is what you deal with every day. You work, come into work, you work on a project, you think for a moment like, oh, this would be cool to do in Svelte. And then like, you're like, well, but it, that's very unrealistic. We're not going to rewrite it. So like while I'm kind of sympathetic to this kind of scenario, on the other hand, like change doesn't happen by doing nothing. I want to, I don't, I want to emphasize like things don't need to change. You don't need to migrate. But I, I think Focusing like this counter argument is misaligning stuff. It, it, it makes this discussion stop being about the possibility. It's just like like it's like a dead stop. You're just like yeah, ecosystem hiring. Like that's what it's about. We we should be talking about the future. We don't have to talk about right now necessarily because the danger is that it creates a narrative that stop gaps the future on the practicality of the present. Like this, we need a revolution. You know, we need something to be 10x better like this inaction is self it's a self-fulfilling prophecy you know like it doesn't need that kind of push right like if you have a fire in the desert it'll kind of put itself out right you don't need to pour water on it you know you can have these kind of considerations at the same time and a healthier narrative is one that recognizes the ongoing cycle that every you know every stage is different you got to be considerate of the future and the past you know and, and the present, and but not cling too hard to the past so that you can allow things to move forward in little pieces. You know, progress is incremental at many levels. So, like, while I can appreciate that this is kind of like a trickle-down effect here, because, like, the the author of this article mentioned at the end that they, they got this a lot of these ideas from talking to Kent C. Dodds and Jay Phelps and Ben Lesh and, um, you know, a, a number of others. Um, I, I just want to throw it out there to the thought leaders, invest, you know, that be fair a lot of them are vested very much in react because that's how they built their career like like and that's why they're very much in the stack quote like remind them where they started because they likely invested with in react in the first place with far less right like that's why ken's article is great here he lit or not this one this one is he he literally tells us that he basically invested on react with nothing. Right? Yeah, first mover thing. But the thing is, Re React wasn't even a first mover. Because that, that would have made it like very revolutionary. There, there was already declarative stuff. There was Angular. There, there, there was other solutions at that time. It, it isn't even the first mover thing. It is, like, it is now because it's harder to, like, the, the space has become more entrenched. But, like, it's not even it's not even that. And like as I as I mentioned before, like there is like, uh, where am I looking for here? Is it this one? No, this is solid one. It's this one. Uh, 
With all due respect, I will not, yeah, here we go. I will not stop using React until something 10 times better comes along and today that thing does not yet exist. There's literally nothing that I can't do with React that I can't do with other frameworks, plus the ecosystem is massive. We have things like Vercel and Next. Every large company in the world still uses it. Get off my lawn. So this is the, this is the reason. The, like the influencer types are getting nagged by people to look at other frameworks and other solutions because they improve on things in like a slightly different angle and they're just like go away you know i'm i'm i that that that's that's sort of the the scenario here right and I, this this is kind of where i was getting into this cuz i was like look but you could say that about vanilla js right you can literally do everything with 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 anything right like that's that's the whole point but like there are constraints that come in like you can't make react smaller or faster you can't fundamentally change how it renders you know it doesn't even take you know crazy new i think crazy sorry but like inventing like new patterns like quick is doing or marco like in resumability to make that claim like literally there are places where because of the structure of stuff you can do stuff that react doesn't do mechanically granted but it has implications on how you author apps architecturally even the fact that people need to point this out right basically speaks v volumes though like and that's what i'm wondering like why does everyone right now want to double down on on this message right like uh, brian larue who i don't usually agree with basically said that they felt the same way about you know, web standards. And that's what I'm saying. Like you can literally do anything with anything. So like, and, 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 and Nadir said, well, it's because I've been seeing these blog posts about react dying and it's, it, it is, but what I was getting at is these blog posts that talk about react dying come to the same conclusion, you know, 10 X revolution, you know, it's just an amplification for the status quo. And it, I mean, it feels like a bunch of people patting themselves on the back to be like, it's okay, guys. Don't worry. They, they have us down right now, but, you know, we'll get there. And it's, it's weird because it's like the championship team doing that when they're already leading by, like, I don't know, X number of points. Like... The blogs that declare that React's dead don't actually ever declare that React's dead. That would be crazy. Right? Like, yeah, you, you, you don't get to move. Like, the, that's the thing. I, I mentioned the thing. There, there is whole ecosystem of training, people hire. Like, React is not going anywhere. Oh, and what I'm getting at is that the dead thing is sort of like a... It's like a thumbnail like on a youtube video it's like a hook to just like sit there and and just go react is the best because it's the best it's like it's it's not an interesting narrative and it's it, it it's it's like it's fine that that's true but i feel like it's the thing that doesn't need to be said because you know that so i mean that's that's where that's where like this whole conversation kind of went to i think i think it's interesting because like i i think it's pragmatic from a company standpoint to 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 like go look i'm on react i'm not going to touch it until like there's a, a reason like a migration step story but i think it like from a mind share standpoint this kind of like pushback is kind of whatever i i don't have to say anymore i think i think anyone who actually looks at it and reads it kind of gets gets like gets it you know so um yeah uh there 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 is some you know conversations about the individual points where i talk about you know like this this comment about react being revolutionary always pulls people out i actually had a great conversation in here about like knockout and how MVVM was like components and, you know, but I think the high level kind of takeaway from this, from my opinion is like, no, React is not getting replaced. I don't know if there's ever going to be another React.js. 
like I don't I don't know if 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 we should be expecting that. But like the, the this revolutionary revolution thing that that they're talking about here might be decades out, right? Like the promise of like like what is it like no code, you know, builders and like all this stuff, you know, it's been going on for decades already. Like nothing in the last thirty years makes me think that like the revolution is happening in that sense right now. What we're seeing is the same progression we've seen that about every decade or so we learn better on our architecture and we're in one of those swaps right now. And React is part of the previous one and they're they're making a move to the new one, but there might be new solutions that align with the new one better. Right? Right. I, I think we're at a point in time when the best things of React will cause a migration, point people to migrate to other frameworks. Perhaps, yeah. And you mentioned Preact. Um, and that's the thing, Dan, Dan you know, I, I don't know, like, I, I I can't help but feel that the the React team, you know, has to be, sorry, Dan and the React team and Seven, all of them have to be considering about, like, is are things kind of forking like that when preact goes in and like writes their signal stuff into the into the compiler and go look look you can use react with signals and doing this like the, like are we at a point where people are kind of starting to fork react um i think it's a consideration Even if the revolution happens in five years, do we have the way worse tech? I'm not going to call React worse tech. I'm just saying, like, generally speaking, these things, people, there's like a bus factor, or not bus factor. I don't mean bus factor. That's the thing they talk about when someone gets hit by a bus. I mean, like, the the frame rate. I mean, like, the Super Mario 1 speedrunner uh, bus factor, like, where even if you get there earlier, stuff gets kind of batched together, Um Basically, everything's in a group of frames. But if you're not, if you don't watch speed running, that probably makes no sense to you. Okay, and, 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 but like essentially, there is like these things move in groups. Like you rewrite your app every five to seven years. So when those things happen, you look for the next thing. Um, I I think what's happened is we've we've kind of stagnated on the current status quo for too long, and people are using that to justify the the next thing. So yeah. Yeah, it's a very different bus factor, yeah. <laughs> yeah, banks are still using COBOL. Like and this is fine. A web moves faster. It's like a it's like a five to seven year cycle instead of like a like a several decades cycle. So yeah, I mean I mean I am this project it will exist. It's I'm, I'm actually talking to an AI company that's looking at code mods to do this. Um, but, <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think it's, I, I just want to kind of get out there that these things are always moving and it only looks like a revolution from a, from a, from a far distance. So it's fine that like when you're doing your stuff to kind of phase it out, don't worry too much. Do you work in your area, but don't use that as a justification to tell others to not, get into new technologies because you're going to wait till something's 10x better. Uh, the truth of the matter is, with that attitude, you won't recognize the next thing even if it came and hit you in the face. That's that's the truth. It's fine. You don't have to be on the front of the edge, but you literally will not see it coming if that's the kind of attitude you take. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? Like... Um, you, you, when you have users, you have to move slower. You have to figure out the right best patterns. And React's going through one of the most... They're, they're having their Angular 2 moment. People just haven't realized that yet. And they're doing they're handling it amazingly. That's that's what the truth is. Mitosis AI, yeah. And honestly, yes, that's... that's I, I've, I actually talked to them about using Mitosis maybe to help seed the intelligence. I, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll share more as stuff kind of moves on, but yeah. Anyways, that that that, that this is a this has been a topic. Um, all right, where are we going? Let's let's get back into our stream, and it, it's it's semi related but not completely related. Um, 
I want to I want to mention uh, that this kind of ties into I don't know if everyone saw this um, Theo and uh, Alex Russell had a had a conversation um, about uh, fuck, sorry just gotta do some moderation um, Theo oh, there we go gone. No, I haven't talked about this debate yet. So this this is this is what we're on to. Uh, one comment. I'm learning React from C plus desktop. So far loving. I love to switch solid right away, but component libs for React are very convenient. Um yeah, if you, there's component libs for other for solid as well, like if if that's what you're into. Um so um I I, I mean I don't let that stop you, honestly. You could just poke into the Discord, see what's going on, and then you'll get a, get a get a good thing, you know. I, I think the ecosystem argument from a library standpoint is overblown. I think from a hiring standpoint, it's very real. So people should care about that. But I think in terms of like what you can do with the framework in terms of libraries and stuff, the ecosystem argument is, is thin. Oh, okay, yeah. So, <sighs> yes. Okay. Theo had a conversation. Alex talked to himself. That was kind of the takeaway a lot of people had. I was in there... I was there in person. Me and Nikhil, we we popped up from from San Jose to 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 be there. I didn't talk about it because the video hadn't been published yet, um, right? I I did. I, I you could definitely tell that. But to be fair, it wasn't designed in a debate format. There was no moderator, right? It was like uh, Theo doing an interview, which meant. In order for it to get rolling, Theo had to basically go, Alex, what's your platform? And he did that. Um, the beginning of the talk, Alex kind of, they, 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 they basically introduced their positions a bit, which was, and their positions had a strange lack of overlapping in the sense that Theo's like, I'm a guy who makes apps, you know. I, let's see if I still got the Excalibur draw from last time. He's like, Theo's like, I live over here. Right, and and I, I pretty much live completely over here. And Alex is like, "Okay, that's fine. Um, I I'm I'm helping people with stuff basically up to here, like this this side of things, right? Right, where like maybe maybe this line. This is Alex's line. Alex was on this side, so they're 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 like not overlapping at all, which was kind of amusing at first because I was like. I've, people talk about Alex talking on this platform, but part of me was like, man, like I knew Theo wasn't going to engage him on benchmarks or anything, but part of me was kind of like, oh man, like Theo talking about his experience on ping might have no relevance to this, uh, conversation. Like, you know, but the truth of the matter is that comes down to the question of who do you think the majority of web developers are? And that was the first part of the debate's like real consideration, right? Because like, you know, Alex's thing is like most development happens in existing spaces. Um, it, so you're like remaking existing products or working in a place that's fairly known. And Theo's working in startups. So clearly it's like the opposite side, making, paving new stuff. I've worked in startups. I understand like it's, it's a very different, different zone. Um, but But yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the the challenge, of course, of having that, that kind of separation is that like they don't really care to talk on those points. Because like, honestly, even if I was in this position where Alex was, I, there was no point engaging Theo on like what matters for a startup because he, in his head, he's like, yeah, like, that's like the 5% case. Like... That just I'm I'm giving like a little balance here from 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 that kind of scenario, whereas like, um, Al Alex keeps on walking into these these projects and then basically needing to like unscrew them like they're like completely messed up and then he has to fix it and he sees it over and over and over and over again and it, it's it, it, it for me it's a position that I can like 
I feel like I can relate to, especially when I was the time of working at eBay and seeing kind of the support issues and understanding the difference between what it's like working with like a small team of developers building stuff in the startups versus like, like working in an environment where people might not like, especially, uh, you know, a lot of the junior devs really not understand the tools they're using yet be expected to put code out at an, at an incredible velocity in order to like hit metrics and stuff. So like, like I, 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 when I was sitting there in the chat or sort of like actually physically there, I was like, I'm glad Alex is getting a chance to see that, say this, but I, I'm, this was not the debate anyone agreed like thought they were coming to because like at one point they're like oh should we use react for e-commerce and everyone was like like theo and alex were like no like both of them like they they were agreeing almost too much for it to be a debate so like this this is like up to the half point you know of the debate and you, you can watch in more detail but like it, it, the, it, it became about management and I think that's interesting because it's about the decision making process of like when to choose React which is very related to what we were just talking about where at the same time React is getting more popular and being used in places it wasn't originally d intended for and then like it's kind of like if you choose React in that environment it's kind of on you and like do you need to do the costly rewrite in something that doesn't even fit? Like what Alex kept on seeing in his world was that people would like try and take something, rewrite and react, and then just fail because, and like it wasn't impossible to make react work properly in that zone. It just wasn't really made for that situation. Um, so yeah, at the halfway point, I was like, oh man, this is just going to like two guys talking past each other. The second half was a little bit more interesting in that Alex went out the gate much harder, um, especially on the React sentiment. This was supposed to be like a single page app thing. So a lot of people thought we'd be talking like Astro versus, you know, or like that kind of thing. And it wasn't. Um, and I think my favorite part of the whole discussion was when Theo quite smartly at the beginning of the talk got Alex to agree on some of the principles that he believed in, like, like not even principles, but like if you have a React app, you shouldn't migrate it. And all like already, like it doesn't make sense, you know, you're there. All those things. And at a certain point where where Alex had kind of got the heaviest of the arguments off, like the peak pinnacle where Alex was like, Yeah, you know, and I, I you know almost felt like clapping for him, like he said it. Theo was like, Yeah, well, what about this? Which you said. And that's where the real switch happened. And that led all the way to the end of the debate when the Q or the discussion when the QA happened, which was kind of really where, uh, you know, finally, I guess what Theo's perspective was coming through. Because the truth of the matter is, the problem, wh where the disconnect is, is even if everything Alex said was true, which I, I generally agree with, and seen with large teams, I think this, I think his perspective is largely undervalued, like immensely undervalued. I think, I think everyone who's like, huh, you know, just talking to himself, should actually stop and like, listen to what Alex says like another 10 more times. Um, but on the other hand, when it came down to like, okay, so what do we do about this? There wasn't really a, a solution. It was like, oh, maybe you can look at web components, which you like, th that's not a solution. Um, and I think that's where the the gap is because the thing that I, like w kind of was awkward about that, how should I put it, like that, that part of the discussion was that it, it felt like you only had two choices. You use React or you use like whatever this web component like thing is. And the truth of the matter is it's possible to satisfy Alex's side of the discussion and get the DX and developer experience of React if you just don't use React and don't use what Alex suggests. Like th there's a whole realm of solutions that would probably make Alex much, much ha happier walking to those scenarios and also not be any harder for a developer to pick up than react of course training is the problem and the the whole ecosystem around it but it's like i felt like we were set there choosing between two terrible options right like and 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 theo addressed this at one point he was like you know if the new beta docs for um React were written in solid, like they're amazing for just learning web dev in general, then I'd do that. And I brought this up before, you know, patterns.dev, 
this is basically even though it's written by the Chrome team oh, and, and Lydia, so that's fair. From, from like this is basically a Next.js like this is basically just Next.js. Like how do you, they talk about some few design patterns, but when you get to like the the web fundamentals, it's basically a Next.js course. Like the stuff is built in React because that is the standard. So like, yeah, I mean, so the solution is solid or quick. Any number of solutions, honestly. Right? Um, like th there's, there's, just, there's more options out there if we aren't constrained to just those two. The problem is the stuff has gone so hyperbolic because of some kind of warping that we're kind of stuck here. That's that's what I what I took away there because I'm like okay, this wasn't a debate. Alex did talk a whole bunch about his platform. He said a lot of really good things. He didn't really engage Theo. Theo managed to finally force him into engaging him at the end. In which point Theo's you know perspective about startups and getting stuff basically was very relevant and important. In the takeaway that people walked away the the fact that Theo got there at the end actually made the little bit that he did say that much more impactful. Um, but like, the truth of the matter is, because it's so binary, this conversation, that we're like missing the fact that like, it is completely solvable. I, I, I remember Theo made that joke when I was on stream with him a couple weeks ago. He's like, man, you're gonna make my debate with Alex Russell that much harder after I showed him the movies app demo, which, you know, which if you all remember was it movie was solid movies that, that it, it, it's it's like it's a, it feels like a single page app essentially it, it has like the same kind of you know it has the fast load of an mpa but then it has all the animations and the triggers and stuff single page app it's basically like a single page app the thing is like 13 kilobytes of javascript like nothing this is a this is the smallest version of the movies app out there right now and it's a, it feels like a single page app like this is this is this this kind of approach, kind of like server component S approach, is game changing for that huge portion of stuff, and we've talked about that previously. Like there are solutions that are potentially out there that will satisfy satisfy people if we can figure out how to kind of push them out there. Because like the truth of the matter on 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 that stuff is yeah. People, DX is still going to drive stuff. People are going to use React. They're going to use what makes sense. But it's like, if you have the opportunity to make the choice, um, like maybe there's there's more options out there. That's, 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 that's essentially, you know, where, where that kind of sits. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Let's. I think that was most of that part of that. Let's continue on. Okay. Um. Oh, yeah. So there was so many little spoils or reveals this week that I mean, like things that kind of came up. Um, like I just gonna take a moment here. Like the vconf. Uh, Veet has been publishing the separate videos for the talks now. Mine isn't up yet, I don't think, but like the framework discussion talk is up, which is great. Um, another great one is uh, Tanner's uh, Tanstack router intro from Jamstack Cop. This is a very, very like well pulled off um, talk. He he coordinated his slides with his video. It, it 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 feels it felt like like going to like a reveal from like like when like a car company releases a new car like it just it, 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 it had that like 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 wow factor just from like his presentation it's only 10 minutes just watch it um okay so yeah let's uh, sorry it's funny there's one more thing i want to say about the alex russell's conversation and it keeps on slipping my mind i remember it for like a second and um I, I, it keeps on slipping. So if, if, if it comes back, I'll, I'll bring it up again. But I, I just, I keep on, uh, I keep on, there was like one really good point that I just can't remember. So um, anyway, 
I want to take a moment to to plug. Um, next week, I am speaking at Is Serverless Ready um, with a, a number of other awesome people, including Fred um, from Astro, um, Dax, in that like they're just it's great people. Jacob, um, yeah. So, yeah, this is this is going to be fun. The funny thing is this: if you haven't been paying attention to this one. There's this is serverless ready um, account, and it's basically it's been like a meme account. Um, if you go back to the beginning, they just they they created this account like somewhere in October, and it's like is serverless ready? No, you know it's it's, it's just all like <laughs> it's managed to get three thousand followers before posting anything else other than just memes about about ser- whether serverless is ready <laughs> it's anyway um as a kind of a viral uh campaign what they 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 wanted us to do was um was to basically will serverless ever be ready and then basically answer that question with a quote um And uh, the uh, people chose different ones. I uh, let me see your quote tweets. So there's there's a there's a bunch of great ones here. Uh, Theo, I think, was the first one. Service will be ready when deployment is easy as merging with GitHub. Um, but uh, I, I I I chose a spicy one. Service will be ready when it supports stream responses. Um, which, if for 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 any of you who don't know, most serverless services do support stream responses. I, by that I mean like HTTP chunked encoding. That means that like you as a developer can like respond with a stream and, and the and the HTML will come in pieces that you control. HTML standard or sorry HTTP standard does actually stream content. It gets big chunks that sends them across. Like you like you, you're not gonna send it all at once. It does get broken up in a package that streams. Um, but to control how it streams, there's a standard that was created in 1997 um, uh, um, HP uh, 1.1 time period um, called uh, chunked encoding. So that's what I'm talking about. And basically every platform, uh, th- most of them support it now except for AWS. Um, and, th- you know, I knew that serverless is very close to AWS. So I like asked Dax if it was okay. And he's like, yeah, no problem. This is coming, which is sweet, honestly. I- I'm- I've been waiting for it. Um, and I'm aware many serverless and edge, you know, like because pe- people started like replying, like like uh, f- like I think uh, Dane, this like uh, <laughs> who's in charge of like R and D at Cloudflare, was like, look, we got streams, you know, like this is a good opportunity actually for a lot of the providers to talk about that. That you know, the Remix guys are big on streams, you know, um, it, you know, the uh, Cloud Run apparently has streams. You know, so this this was kind of fun um, until it wasn't fun. I want I want I want to actually I want to I want to actually show this for a second because uh, the, the, I don't know. We 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 we, t- we talked about this conversation with Brian before, um, but uh, it, it, it kind of calls into question whether HTTP streaming is important. And basically points us that we should be um, using web sockets, which I, I think is a little bit unfortunate because like they really have no, like they're for different purposes. Um, like I, I don't I don't know, like basically AWS doesn't solve this one, so it's like okay, important. But frankly, if initial renders a problem, HTTP streaming is a solution. It's like just just fix your database, right? Get yeah, just just migrate off whatever you're using and migrate to DynamoDB. That's the solution. And it AWS supports many primitives, blah blah blah. There's so much more to learn beyond HTML. Okay, thank you. Um, but like, there's a reason. Like initial. There, there's an architectural reason why we're looking at HTTP streamed responses and not 
web sockets, you know, things like not wanting to have long sessions on the server necessarily. Like there's a reason why this technology is good. Like, but it, it felt like, like it was like a little bit, you know, I don't know, condescending a little bit. So I was like, okay, fine, fine. Like assuming it was that simple and that we like talking about front end devs, like we're sorry, front end think it's, you know, like they have no clue. Would you criticize them for trying to maximize what's within their range? Like, is there anything wrong with adopting streaming? Like you might as well adopt it because it'll make things better. It doesn't make things worse. Right. Like these aren't mutually exclusive improvements. Right. And, and the problem is if, if, if we're basically telling front end devs, they don't know anything. And that's a perspective like, a, a, you know, a back end dev would take. Do you think anyone would listen to the front end dev who's telling them that, oh, no, the solution is just uh, you guys need to replace your back end. Like, like, I, I don't know how practical that is in many situations. Um, like, you know, then he's like, there's other types of streams, sure. But like, we're not interested in that because like, there is a specific problem being solved here. It's a, he, he criticizes it for terrible UX. It's not a terrible UX. It actually... If you think about it, it's the same UX that you find in um, single page apps, essentially, where you can get the shell super fast and then the data loads as needed, right? Like, I'm a front end dev too, but I don't see assumptions for front end framework marketing, especially ones that claim good performance to demonstrate anything. But I was just like, what? 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 What is this about? this isn't marketing. This is like, I, I learned about this stuff at eBay. Like this is, this is large scale e-commerce. Like this is, you know, and, and this isn't about like selling frameworks. This is like core technology. So he, he accused me of, of doing, I don't know, like anyways. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know where this was coming from or why he was so angry about suggesting that people could improve user experience and performance by streaming. But yeah, I'm gathering I struck a nerve because AWS doesn't have this feature, but yeah, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, if, if you want to know about the, the reason I brought this, this conversation up is because if you want to know about the UX of, of, uh, of, of it, someone, someone actually was asked me that question. They're like, I don't, I don't, get it. it can you give a demo of streaming at hp and compare the experiences right and the problem is streaming matters the more requests and stuff scale simple demos never show it off right but um like if you want to understand the difference this is the difference between streaming and not streaming essentially the left hand side is like if you wait on the api and the right hand side is if you stream this is this is essentially the difference in experience you will paint hold on the on the on the left hand side, but essentially I showed this and you're like, oh, so it's like a single page app. Yeah, it, it does feel like a like a client side rendered app. The difference is it's server rendered, so you do all that data fetching everything at the very beginning, right? And that means that you can send the static stuff right away, serve the stuff in the data, and you don't have to wait. If 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 you if this was a client app, you'd have to do like three handshakes before you could even request the data. Like you have to get the HTML back. And then you, it reads that there's a script tag. So it goes back to server, gets the JavaScript. Then it runs the JavaScript and goes, okay, now I know I need to make a request. And if it's, so then it fetches and then it goes again. You, have, you do three round trips and streaming lets you do it in one round trip. Like it, this is not rocket science. Like anyway. Uh, yes, this is Twitter being Twitter. But I, I, I want to I take a chance to just defend streaming and it's coming to AWS soon. So soon every platform will have the ability to do stream responses. So just a interesting little side tangent here. Um, let's get back out of this. Okay. But I want to end this week in JavaScript with a couple much more positive things.
First of all, I thought this was great. Dominic Ganaway, big fan of his work, creator of Inferno, happened to just go on the JS framework the other day because he, he's been working on some something. He's been working on kind of like a new framework idea. Um, and he was like, what the hell happened? Apparently, in Chrome, the latest version of Chrome, Chrome 108, every framework also scores 108. Um, uh, not every framework, but essentially, we, we were looking at JS Framework Benchmark earlier. The the fastest ones that aren't vanilla, um, I, I, we are missing a couple that um, in here. There's a couple more in between. But essentially, Inferno, Solid, Melina, and BlockDom are all scoring the same average score um, in the benchmark. And he was commenting, he's like, I, I haven't, like, no one's touched the performance in Inferno in like six, seven years. Like, um, it just suddenly got faster in the last couple versions of Chrome. And it's funny because I was like, yeah, and I want to add, I, I haven't touched the performance in Solid really in five years. It's, it's been like at the front of the list for about five years now. Um, but like this, this is kind of just showing how uh, JavaScript engine optimizations over time kind of like help push things forward. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that was kind of the interesting thing. What I love about this actual example is, and this is what he was pointing. I was like, look, VDOM not slow, is that actually we have we have multiple like the solid fine grain rendering, Inferno, VDOM. Melina, this is actually based on Svelte's approach, and uh, BlockDOM, which is like a VDOM that does node cloning. And you can look like they, they, they're slightly faster than each other in like little niggly bits in different places. But from the point of view of this JS framework benchmark, we basically got to the maximum now where like, like this benchmark no longer can differentiate between the fastest uh, approaches. It's been that way for a couple years now, but um, that's how far the JavaScript engine optimizations get. Like, don't get me wrong, you guys have seen, you know, other frameworks are much further behind. But, like, the front of the pack is actually almost kind of collapsed. Oh, okay, so apparently someone from the Solid Discord told him to go look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that 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 makes sense. Uh, Solid Discord, by the way. Here's a little push. You guys should all go in there because that's where framework authors hang out. If you if if this is the kind of conversation you like, like what we've been talking about here, understanding how frameworks work. Um, literally, like everyone working in this the performance space are in our Discord. And we're always chatting about you know on certain channels at least about like you know, I have conversations with Greg from Leptos or Dom or Fabio from Vovi and all that, like the, the just um, very close community on the front end on the performance side. So if that's your thing, do come on by. Um, but yeah, I, I, this this for me was a very, it, it's, it, I love this story because I've always said that the VDOM isn't slow, like it, not from a rendering standpoint. I do th have concerns that the way that framework get you to author in the VDOM causes end users to write slower code but optimizing it from a render standpoint um is is essentially like like it's all the same like we we you can express in very tight code really nice uis and it'll render faster if you write the perfect code you can use any fast library and get fast uh you like it's not true necessarily of every library, but you can use every fast library and get good results regardless of these VDOM or not. It's just that I think that certain patterns around um, like re component re-rendering puts more of the user code like under the bus, so to speak, less isolation, more unnecessary work, you know, that kind of thing. Yes, basically, I think, I think so. I I I don't I the, I I actually believe so. I don't think they've actually made significant changes in the last several versions. Inferno's a, yeah. I mean, if you, let, let's just pull up the JS framework one more time. But I I, I didn't put Inferno in there um, earlier because it was kind of distracting from what I wanted to show. But yeah, I mean, uh, let's 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 just go in here, like. 
where are we? Let's remove not all the implementations because they added a new category um, that eliminates stuff that we that I don't feel is worth. Yeah, implements like eval. It's a security thing, but I don't, I don't think it's important. Okay, so let's do that. Let's pull everybody in here. Um, Inferno and Solid are here basically both. Oh, I guess they're 109 on this run, whatever. They're basically all the, like the, the four of us are basically all the same, right? And then if you scroll here, do, 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 where are we? Lighter HTML, view, Imba, Sycamore, Elm, Svelte is over here. Do, 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 do. Preact is over here. Yeah. And then Mithril, and then Angular, and then Stencil, and finally, oh, Marco, and then React. Yeah. So. I definitely should. Thank you for reminding me that. So yeah, we need we need we need we need new benchmarks, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the the obviously, like, yeah, I mean, what's happening over time is the front of the scale is getting heavier. So while Preact is like kind of significantly back here, probably, well, maybe right in the middle of the chart, so to speak. It's because we're just getting more and more libraries um, in the front of the chart. Like that's what's happening over time. Um, Preact has pretty been like has been pretty much there for the the longest time, kind of right, you know, very slightly ahead of middle or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's but yeah, this is this is kind of where things are at on the JS framework benchmark at least. And there's other benchmarks you can do, but Unsurprisingly, almost all synthetic benchmarks actually reflect very similar. Yeah, I, it, it's getting, it, 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 there's so much data in it. Uh, I'm zoomed in right now, which makes it even harder. But like, usually you just kind of like, at this point, I, I'm almost always choosing which ones I want to focus in on. Um, and sometimes just using the filter to like, just drop everything off, just go none, just makes things a lot easier. Because then you just, you're like, okay, I'm just going to, you know. Get rid of anything that has like a weird flag on it, but anyway, okay, not terribly important. Okay, let's let's uh, let's get back in here. So for me, this was this is cool, right? Like, like the, this the, this is this is like a nice progression, and I, I love this n narrative. Like, it. I wrote this article like two years ago, um, JavaScript framework performance comparison, and I, I also performance champions and then I finally got the performance elite I like I put solid and inferno in this category even though at that point the gap was much bigger because I wanted to point out that these frameworks whether these virtues on or not doesn't matter and um, that funnily enough that the fastest frameworks here were using JSX like because there was a kind of myth that templates were like better for optimizing so um, anyways, I just always good to see that, like, we have a good example of like, of it's always nice when the examples, um, actually line up with like the theory, so to speak. So I'm super happy about that. The other thing that I'm happy about, and probably the, the, the last bit of news on this, uh, is Milo, modern me, um, Milo is the youngest core team member on the on Solid JS core team. Uh, he he joined on with us when he was still in high school, um, and really, I, I hope it's not disparaging to call him a kid, but he's really smart kid, and um, he, he's he's been kind of like working in a way at different stuff, trying to understand how the like solid code works, but like he, he, he got it right away. I, I mean, his early contribution to solid involved like playing around with different rendering patterns and stuff like always really got into it. Um, and uh, when I started the uh, working group for solid uh, 2.0, uh, um, which, which I advertised a few months back, um, him and a few couple others 
really wanted to get on to looking at what the future of reactivity would look like in that model. I said there's a few stipulations. I want to look at better lazy evaluation of memos, you know, our create memo. I want to look at um, potential for serialization. So um, I, I thought, like, I, I kind of pulled a bunch of them together. Um, uh, Milo, uh, Sh Shane from uh, um, uh, Cairo, fa fa super fast uh, reactive library, um, you know, and even, uh, you know, talking a bit with um, Ben Kaleidowave, uh, Crit Esno, like, there, there are some really smart 20, 21 year olds, like, you know, first year university students right now working on some really complicated patterns. Like they just, they came up in this wave and they're just like, they're, it's part of what they do. So I started just like connecting them with each other. Uh, it, it led to some good discussion. Um, I'm not sure that it ultimately, uh, you know, I'm not sure that like it, ultimately they, they, they didn't end up necessarily working completely together, but I think I, I like to think that sharing of ideas at least got the conversation rolling a bit. And Milo was like, okay, I'm going to go and see if I can apply what I've learned about this reactivity and make it more optimized. Cause I always talk about in solid that I didn't optimize it as much as I could have because I wanted to do some features like uh, time slicing and stuff. And I, you know, I just got to a certain point where I had the time box and move on. And I, like I have examples in Solid Repo of more performant reactive implementations. We just don't use it because like I want to keep the features and the performance. Let me make this straight. Improving like performance on this reactive level is not going to like even budge the JS framework benchmark, like not by anything substantial. So like with DOM operations and like, like you're not going to necessarily see the impact of this reactivity, but Obviously, if we can optimize, we can make it better. And that's what Milo did. And he wrote this article. I, I believe it's his first article. Um, I, was trying to, I was like, oh, you're going to share it on Twitter? He's like, I'm not on Twitter. I'm like, okay, no problem, no problem. So I, I shared it for him. Um, and that's not the reason why you want to read this article. The reason you want to read this article is because he actually explains in a, like, it is complicated, but in a fairly visual way, how reactive algorithms work. And he, he shows from like MobX how it works, how Preact evolved that thinking, and how he took some of the ideas from SJS and Solid and from Preact and managed to get something even more optimal. Right? And this is just, this is great, um, honestly. If you want to understand reactivity at that next level, to understand like how, like, it actually works. This is an amazing article from that perspective. But what's even more amazing to me is that, I mean, maybe not more amazing the article. Honestly, to try and explain this stuff is actually really challenging. Um, so I'm very proud of this. He, he succeeded at everything he did. Reactively, he, he tested wide graphs. What wide graphs are is like when you have like single dependencies, they're dependent on by like a whole bunch of stuff. Like, like, so you have a signal and you have like a, thousand effects deep graphs are like when you have a signal and you have like a bunch of memos in the middle like a bunch of derived data and then uh you basically see what's on the other side and dynamic graphs are when you change up the dependencies so like first run it depends on some things second run depends on other things and this is important to measure and understand the impact of because frameworks like svelte for example and React don't have dynamic graphs. So they're, they're, they're always kind of starting, they don't take the overhead of bookkeeping it, but they, they, it leads them to having to perhaps overrun things they don't need to overrun, like executing things too many times. Um, Preact had a bug, so he wasn't able to benchmark it there. But what I loved about this is actually really displayed at stuff, because from Solid's perspective, wide graphs are really the only thing that really matter. And Solid, it, Solid's performance on wide graphs was actually pretty good um let me see if i got here yeah pretty good right because think about it when you're building user interfaces you have a bunch of signals like in your components and stuff and maybe in like context and then you have a bunch of places you use it 
you might have some like derived value. You might have like, you know, the, the, the double count, so the speaker or date format or something. But usually the depth is like one or zero, maybe maybe two, three tops. You, you're, you never really have deep graphs, but you have wide graphs. Sometimes the, you know, maybe not like thousands wide, but if you think about it, like the number of different places you might call um, in global storage, you might call a specific signal across your page, like user information that you use in your avatar to show the name in the page, to show profile stuff. Like, like you might actually use the same thing. Like it, it, I'd say the order of magnitude difference between wide and de- um, and deep, like, like it, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, it's like a whole order more likely to have a wider graph than a deep graph. So that's what we optimized for. But what's sweet about this is reactively top solid on the wide graph, it top preact on the deep graph, which is, and on the square graph too. And on dynamic, it literally, it literally surpassed us in, in all of these benchmarks. And the thing is, what people saw recently when Preact released Preact um, signals, they did a benchmark that was floating around from the Maverick guys, which is this benchmark. It was basically the deep case, which, as I said, is not very useful for real apps. But this is what was getting getting thrown around. Um, so he he went further and was like, okay, let's let's benchmark other dimensions. And I think this is a much fuller picture of what that reactivity looks like. And then using that fuller picture he made the library that was fastest across them all. So big props to Milo on this, right? Um, uh, and if, if you don't, like, I, I posted this in here. It's also on the, the Twitter reply is, I don't know if everyone's familiar with, with him, but Jin, the creator of a small framework, Russian guy, writes great articles about reactivity, but they're a little dense and the translation loses it a bit. He said he was impressed. He literally is never impressed about anyone else's library. Like on reactive side, he's always like, oh, like they don't know what they're doing. All reactive libraries suck, blah, 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 except mine. He, he said he was impressed and he did it in his benchmark and it scored the highest. So um, I think we have a legit fastest reactive uh, state library right now. A new, a, new, a, new, a new champion has been crowned. Cairo was that for a while. I haven't checked Cairo recently. I know they made design decisions which have slowed it down a bit, so we might have to compare that. But for for all purposes, Milo has has done it. He's pushed uh, uh, reactive state manager. Like, don't get me wrong. This is not like solid or preact, like the full like actual rendering performance or stuff. This is just like the signals, like just the reactivity part. But he did it through clever use of algorithms, and he explains how he did it here. Um, and I, I mean, you know why I'm excited about this, because this reactively is going to be a library that is going to go out there and you can use, you'll can you be able to use it with React and Lit, and this is going to be his project on that. Um, Solid has different constraints because of time slicing and transitions and all that stuff. So we might not get to hit this speed, but... Um, the intention here is with uh, solid 2.0, we're going to adopt this sort of pattern, which should should improve our speed across the board. If not, get all the way to where reactively is. Um, definitely improve significantly um, where from where we are today in the framework space. So I'm very excited to incorporate this kind of improvement into the next version of solid. So yeah. So yeah, I I think this is huge. <sighs> right. And I think with that, that's this week in JavaScript. All right. Yeah. So how's it going, chat? Some of you are still here. That's awesome. What what what, what time are we? We like four p.m. See, this is what happens. You start half an hour early, and you're not. We're not competing for my sushi time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm I'm free to ask answer some questions. We got time today. So what's up? 
Um, will Solid 2.0 have a lot of breaking changes or mostly those under the hood? It's mostly under the hood stuff. I think the biggest one is we're struggling. There's, there's two APIs that I introduced for necessity that I'd like to do something about, and that would be the, the breaking changes are. Um, one of them is Create Computed. Not many people use it, but I want to find better patterns there so that we can like get it out of, of the way. And the second one is class list um, on JSX. I, I, I think I think those are like where the visual kind of breaking changes are. The rest of the stuff might be, there might be some breaking stuff in the reactivity, but not in the sense of like, I know this is like the worst sense, but not in, this, not in the sense of like API changes in that um, if the memos are lazy, in, there might be a few places where that like changes the initialization behavior. It's not going to change the, um, it, it, it's one of those things where it's like, shouldn't change like 95% of code, but like, it, but it might change the behavior and like even more like 99%. It's like the last 1% might end up with a different behavior slightly. Um, so that's what we're going to look to, but it's not an API change. It's just like a slight I don't expect much of a change, but it should just make most code more optimal, better performance. But it, uh, I think those are the three kind of areas. <laughs> yeah, you guys are crazy. 2 a.m. here. But that's the thing. When you do a stream worldwide, what, what can you do, right? I feel asleep. Start over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're good. We're, we had a really good stream today. The Rust content was amazing. Like, honestly, top shelf. And um, there's a lot of great conversations this week in JavaScript about the future of the web. And I think these conversations are going to continue um, for the next little while just because, I mean, the React developer influencers have noticed us, right? Like, not, not just like us solid, but like literally us other libraries that exist. Otherwise, they wouldn't be like telling everyone like, hey, you know, like they, they view it as like, you know, the tales of React's deaths are largely overplayed, but no one... All, if you read all the React's dying articles, none of them actually say React's dying. So, like, I it, this is a uh, yeah. I don't know what's up. Something in the water. Um, I think I think there's a I think there's a there's a bit of wind on the on the seas or whatever. Kind of see you know time of change kind of situation. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think these are. I, I think this is very interesting times. Bun 0.3 released late late tonight if all goes well. <laughs> Man. I, I haven't I haven't I haven't talked to the rest of the team, but if, if they're anything like Jared, yeah, I mean that's awesome. Um I, I want to do more work with Bun when I get a chance. Jared Jared like majorly stepped up. He actually built like a solid Bun compiler, like right before he did the release, which is crazy. You're like Okay, like if you're, I mentioned this before on stream, but like if you're doing a release like next week, do you just like take a day off and write a compiler for a random framework? Oh, Jared Subner does. That's what he does. That's how he gets work done because he, he, he sees something he wants to do and then he does it. So, yeah. Oh, right. It's good times. Yeah, no, thank you for joining. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been great. I went React to Vue to HyperApp. Oh, good. You HyperApp was a cool. That's cool. I, I like that. That's like a bit of a yeah. So now I'm debating vanilla JS to avoid the headaches. I mean, it's fair, you know. Like these things are going to keep on evolving, right? Um, the the like this is the fear you have, right? What you put there. If if you if you move too quickly, then you might move to things that are essentially the same, right? Because you could argue that all of these are essentially the same on the same like on the same thing. Like they haven't fundamentally changed the way um, um, you're building apps. Don't. But the funny thing is, like within them, they are changing it. Like SvelteKit is an example of where I consider a reason to maybe be worth moving off, you know, from something to something else. But uh, yeah, this is this is the challenge here. Um, like if you if you can handle vanilla JS then yeah, but often that's not the case, right? Um, like you want to be able to scale it up with declarative UIs and whatnot. Do you think JavaScript frameworks will be server side first in the next five years, or is that just a current hype? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I there's there's a couple players or things in there. I don't think it's hype. Like I think these kind of trends take a long time coming and 
I, I feel like if I was to say that it was hype, that would be like calling single page apps hype. Some people still think that though. So like, I, I, not everyone's going to agree with this perspective or take, but like, cause I saw someone who was saying like they're I guess I'm gathering they're a rails developer. They were like, Oh yeah. You know, they're like, they said that single page apps improved the DX like 5% or something like, like they, they pulled some number out of their hat and arbitrary, like, you know, but then you lost so much and it's like, no single page apps did a lot. And for the cases that needed them, they were amazing. Um, I do think the server focus is, is legit. I think, I think we swung too far the other way. Um, I think the more interesting question is whether I always talk about the problem with writing two apps. This was a problem in the past during the multi-page app. It's funny calling it that, but during the classic web serving page time, you know, you had your HTML server app and then you had like your JavaScript app and you had the two apps that sucked. We don't want to go back there. Definitely not. But then in the single page app, we'd like brought it all together and then eventually led us to being isomorphic. And then you kind of got this question. You got to ask yourself, you're like, what, what I'm saying is now is it's not an intra, It's not whether it's going to be server uh, first, because server first, I think it's going to be legit, real. It's whether um, we believe that the authoring experience is isomorphic or dedicated. And by that, I'm dedicated. I mean actually optimize for the platform. Like if 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 you're suddenly in a realm where you're actually saying like most of your code is server only, it's weird to write it isomorphically. Like you almost want to say like, no, this is server code. I can make this more performant, more optimizable. And I think that's where the struggle is in the migration from because it's it's unclear where that goes. Because on one hand, we've really enjoyed developing that stuff in the single page app world because it's isomorphic. It just You just write one app. I don't think necessarily having dedicated server perspective stops us from writing one app because when you get into the isomorphic stuff, it still works on both sides. But it's, I think it's a more interesting question. Yeah, I think that's going to be awesome. I mean, it's, yeah. What comes after everyone adopts singles? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, in my opinion, what comes after signals is that you people actually change the way that they're rendering. I think, I think whether it's through compilation or other means, I think that it, it, it like, I think the component rerun model of React and the, like the VDOM stuff changes. Even, even, uh, it's funny, uh, Dom, who was talking about, who's like, look, it's a VDOM and it's fast in Inferno. His new project isn't really a virtual DOM, not in the same way. He uses reactivity, but like, if you ask Dominic Ganway what a virtual DOM is, he, he tells you it's the holes in the template. It's not like the template. It's not the actual virtual DOM you generate. He, he basically describes it the same way I describe a reactive system. So in my opinion, what comes after signals is actually the fine grain rendering. Um, you know, it might be hidden behind compilers or stuff and DX considerations, all that, but essentially the mechanics that you see in solid, that's, that's, that's where it's view vapor already took a stab towards it. I think we're going to see more and more libraries try and get more like like that. How does Rizzly break the current ecosystem? If it affects comp composability, completely. If it doesn't affect composability, um, that then then not really at all. It, it's the composability that I'm concerned with with it, um, because if you if you start having to worry about serialization stuff, it gets um, pretty pretty poor. I would never, like, resumability isn't that important that I would ever sacrifice um, composability. We, we Like, we'd have to, like, think of a different solution or a different abstraction, um, or, you know, a way to work around it. You, like, um, composability and being able to, like, build up behaviors and have modular apps is way more important than resumability is. Because, like, as I said, resumability is, like, the last 10% or whatever. Like, if you already can eliminate most of the JavaScript code, you know, other ways and even like coarse grain lazy loading you you know like astro level of stuff like resumability is just like the, the little bit at the end so i think it's good i think it's important i think it's how we optimize things moving forward but it's it's we we there's things that just can't be sacrificed it's more return to the old in a new fashion better tech yeah that's what we keep on doing and that's you know the whole stairwell versus the circle 
metaphor people talk about like the spiral staircase um yeah it's because we swing too far in the pendulum right the funniest thing is people who this is what i find repeatedly people who never swung back are where i look to to understand where the next thing's coming from right i've realized i myself was that person for a while because like i never swung to the vdom um but on the other hand uh another example that is the marco team and like islands and partial hydration and it's funny this is why i'm always so supportive on Re react side of things like even if i don't think that's where things should be right now i feel like i i will learn more from react in the future like after they get through this next hump Awesome, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I mean, uh, signals are behavior subjects, except they have the auto tracking. The problem with RxJS that makes it hard is that, like, everything's too fixed. It makes it, like, it was kind of what uh, Greg was talking about with Leptos. Like, the it kind of pushes you more towards these core screen things. You don't have to, you, you can definitely do things fine grain, but it's like clunkier. So like it just ended up like the idea is the right idea. It just, the execution is, is harder. So I, and I think that the, the, the real insight there was what, while we did, you know, solid shown how you can decouple the kind of like view architecture from the, um, signal uh, or like reactive architecture, we didn't try and force it like MVC. We didn't say like this over here tree, this over there tree. We, we overlap them because they do sit together. We just have to recognize that they're not always like the same thing, right? Like they, they, they layer on top of each other. They interlace with each other. They just like, that was the problem with the component model because like it says, yes, state one for one with view. This is more like, you know, there's still an ownership. There's still a hierarchy. Like from this point on down in the code, that's where the signals live because you don't need it above. You know, it's 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 this component that needs this kind of state, but it's not the same. It doesn't cause us to have to like re-render stuff. It's the combined latest problem with RxJS that makes it more challenging for these kind of synchronizations. See, the thing is, when I used Rx, I want everything to be a behavior subject. I want to be able to pull the value everywhere, and to do that required like this overhead of just like to behavior on the end of everything. I, I literally built S solid with an RX kind of flavor early on, like in the 2016, 17 period to kind of like see if I liked it. And I was just like, I, after I, like six months or of playing with like that, I was just like, man, I, I, I'm just like wasting my time. Why am I fighting this so hard for standards? And it was it, because I thought it would become a standard the same way that I've kind of felt about web components eventually too. I was like, why am I fighting so hard to like, for something that's not like not really solving my problem. Yeah, I'm just kind of catching up with the comments here. JS frameworks are ideal for demanding UI performance in large application systems. Yeah, three or four apps. And mobile. Okay, where are we going here? What's going to happen to classless? Everyone wants to know the classless. This is a problem. Everyone loves classless. The problem with classless is there's two ways to go. I move it into a directive, but then you can't pass it through. But it solves my problem. Because my problem is that composing it through component props is really awkward because you have multiple ways to set classes and trying to merge it for someone from an authoring perspective is basically impossible. Um, I, I could... Um, the other option is I fold it into class. The problem with that, which drives me nuts, is that if someone writes, and I'll, I'll show you, you all this really quick here. If someone writes this, uh, let me go here, playground. Um, doesn't matter, okay. If someone, it doesn't really matter what code I have in here, this is from a presentation. If someone goes in and writes like, um, let's, let's do something, let's just go div, And, and writes um, class class equals something. Okay. We can do count so it doesn't error on me. If we do this, it's ambiguous what this is. This could be an object. Maybe we get a race syntax. And the thing is today in solid, we know that literally we can just like call, we can just like set the class on this directly. Like, um, 
it's like it, it de-optimizes the most base case in Solid's class system. I think I'm probably re- forced to go this direction, admittedly, because that's what people want from a DX standpoint. But it just it, it does definitely like I'm very aware that this basically forces us on a path where we we have to essentially um, de-optimize the base case. All right, where are we? Yeah. Yeah, use a platform, write better abstraction, change the platform, use platform. You know what the hardest part about standardization is? Is that you know that you're always going to be behind the gambit. You're always going to be like, um, like you're never going to be the latest thing. And so you've got to leave room for the latest thing to develop and then learn from it and pull it in. The challenge is, is if you pick a target that is too ambitious, things might move at such a rate and you're, the thing you built, designed out, might be too big to actually like ever become the thing. I, I, I feel like this was a bit with web components because I was like, I think they... I think back when web components were created, they were exactly what we thought we wanted from a component library. Like, like, like it, it could replace frameworks. But now it's like, no, they can never replace frameworks. Like, it's just not even the same problem. It's like completely different thing. And I think that's like, like, and you use frameworks to author them. Like, I think that's where the, the challenge is. Like, at this point, like, I wish if we could like kind of backpedal and like look at like what the fundamental building blocks were in a smaller chunk and see how we could get that into the platform because the the whole story um just isn't compelling enough and things move and too much you know like we might have learned that this wasn't the direction you know if we'd gone with smaller steps i don't know it's so hard because it, the problem is the i've heard the opposite complaint i think it was rich harris saying that this thinking of the problem of the web platform is the fact that they think that if they can just make small incremental steps over time that they can like build towards something and reality doesn't work that way. So, I mean, this is not an easy problem. It's, yeah, the right tool for the right job, right? I actually made a, an RX type library for solid. The problem was I found like every time I was doing it, I was just like, why am I writing these uh, like like I could write the same code in solid with like less code for the simple cases. When you get to the complicated stuff, nothing matches RX on that side. But the, if you go into solid primitives, we have a bunch of like helper operators that work with memos. So you can like use them. You can basically use, you can functionally compose um, our create memo to basically work like RxJS if necessary. Yeah, yeah, they put the function in it because you feel like this is a problem you need to solve. Yeah, but man, you know, like the compiler, can, we can do such. Am I? St- I'm not showing my screen. Can I? Can, uh, the reason class list is so sweet here, and people have pointed this out to me before, and they they're like, I can't believe Solid does this. Is like if you're like I don't know, let's say something, and you do something like this. Like, we, we toggle the specific property based on the count. Like, the compiler, like, when you inline the objects, can do really powerful things. So then we can be like, oh, this. So, all right, let's do something else. And then, like, um, I'm going to make something else up, count two or something. Like, we, we actually can, like, go, okay, like, we can, we can update the individual classes independently using optimal APIs from this compilation. I... I uh, you see, like, it's like, oh, if this one's changed, so I'll go this one. If not, I'll go this one. I, I wish... <sighs> this is not something you can do with just a runtime library to have that kind of performance thing. I, I like it. It's just, it's it's the challenge, right? What's the next thing after JSX? That's hard. Um, better JSX? I don't know. It's, that's The problem is, the reason JSX is good or is powerful is because of 
um, like it isn't because of hyperscript. It's because like like every tool out there, like Babel, and this this is this is kind of like the re- React effect in another way. But like every tool out there knows how to parse JSX, um, and I don't mean like compile into hyperscript. I mean literally just parse it. And once you know how to parse it, you can build custom transforms and you can do all that kind of stuff. And just made it really really easy. Plus, I like how port from a client side perspective. I think. Like I wouldn't say the same for server side templating, but for client side templating, JSX's portability, like div equals div, is incredibly powerful for composition. So like, I think JSX has features that I wish were there. I, it'd be really cool if, like, I don't know if this is a world I want to go into, but I, I imagine others might. Is like if do expressions were inside JSX natively, and then you could use for loops and stuff, and if statements and turn like in JSX, then the syntax would actually be analyzable. It'd be like possible to actually do optimal control flow without using like components if that was what you were into, kind of way that we do turnaries. I don't know if I want to go there, but like other than like that, which is like kind of way out there, and like maybe what's the other thing that I that I liked? Uh, um, like punning, like like the ability to like have some like syntax shortcuts. JSX basically does everything I I would want it to do. Like and it's and it's it does it tightly and in a way that makes sense without introducing um, new conventions or syntax. And what I mean by that is like, like, uh, like if you like, I know passing a function to JSX is weird to some people. Like use it, passing a callback, but it, I mean, it's still an extension of the JavaScript. Like you can picture it. Um, the ch- challenge I have with a lot of different templating le- languages, especially ones that use directives, is that like they they're, they're changing the semantics of what an attribute is. Um, I like that there's, there's like none of that, like, like you don't have to like read the attribute to know what it does. Like it literally like syntactically tells you functionally what is going on because of like the, the way it works. Like an example of breaking that rule right now is ref ref is not, is a special property. It is not the way an attribute is supposed to work. We are kind of missing that in JSX or in all the templating languages, but like other than ref ref, React is pretty clean on that, and uh, JSX is pretty clean on that, and I, I I want more of that rather than like I'm just not a like either like Svelte does where they have like the specific language, but then um, it's not composable like handlebars. It's like you don't get to compose them the same way you compose components. So really, like for me, JSX actually is checks pretty much all the boxes um, of what I'd want out of a t- templating language, especially for client side rendering. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's tricky. Yeah, the problem is a lot of this, like this is what you will find. A lot of the stuff is small startups and like closed source stuff. You're not going to find this stuff out in the public yet. Um, that's just the reality of where we're at right now. Um, we're only get we're we're like starting to get people and be like, hey, be a case study. Like, it's just like a lot a lot of our adoption has happened post 1.0. Like, people played with it, but now they're building real projects. It takes six months to a year to start seeing the output of that. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping that we will see more of this in the wild. Solid native people come and saying, let, let let me pull you, pull up something. Like, okay, there's different ways you could build solid native. And I'm just going to go, like, anyone who says solid native, just, this project might be dead right now. Someone made a wrapper over React Native, but they what they were saying, like, don't think of this as React Native. Just think of this as the first step. We get this working with React Native, then we can build our own thing eventually, and we build it up. This is a very pragmatic view of this. Because the truth of the matter is, trying to make something like React Native and solid would be, like... I, 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 like, I don't know if people realize this, but like, there's the React core team at Meta, right? You know, who work on the React stuff. They, they don't make uh, React Native. Like, they have. I think there's, like, there's more people around making React Native and supporting the ecosystem. I think Microsoft helped them a bit too. Like, than people making React at, at Meta. Like, it, 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 like, there are other teams and platform stuff around React. But like, what I'm getting at is like, React Native is huge amount of effort that like that's not something like an open source project can pull and make themselves um you know easily without making it like a priority and for me the web side of stuff is more of a priority like if we change our focus like the same way we change our focus in solid start we can make solid native happen but it's not like compared to everything else going on there's no way i could prioritize that um i could help organize it and if there's interest kind of push towards a project but this is 
this is what I'm kind of getting at. It. There's nothing in Solid's custom renders and whatnot that would prevent us from having Solid Native. People have made Solid Native, like a basic version of it. People have done stuff with uh, Native Script and stuff, um, you know, and also uh, obvious things like Tori and, uh, you know, Electron and that kind of stuff. But what I'm getting at is like, this is completely within our wheelhouse to do. It's just like, it's, it's very hard for me where I'm sitting to prioritize it. But if there's interest, we could definitely foster an environment where we can like work towards it. And I, I don't know where this project ended up, but um, I think this is, I think this is interesting. I like this. What's the next thing after TypeScript? I don't know. Is it Esno or whatever? <laughs> like, I, 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 we started the stream where I was talking, being kind of critical of TypeScript, and um, I think that's that's actually like more fair where I'm thinking of. It's actually TypeScript that I find like it. I don't mind typed languages um, at all. It's it, TypeScript is actually the only one that rubs me wrong. Um, so, like. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm still trying to write TypeScript like JavaScript, and that's the problem. And I refuse to give up JavaScript. But I mean, I wonder if there like a different approach. And I know ML languages are out there, uh, like Reason ML and all that, where you know people are doing like smart stuff where they actually build a better language to actually work with the types in a way that's actually makes sense. Yeah, it's a hard one because like someone makes a language that actually you want to use as much as JavaScript with that flexibility and works with types and isn't like messy like TypeScript. Like, will anyone move to it? Like that's, that's the problem because like trying to get people to use a new language is super, almost impossibly hard. People talking about Esno, yeah. Esno looks pretty cool. I, again, another super smart kid. Sorry, I, I stopped calling him a kid, but when when I'm almost double their age, I get to do that, right? That's that's my right. That's old man talk. Um, and is, yeah, people talking about React Native. Yeah, I heard the React Native team is three times the size of the React team. Yeah, I, I that yeah, I especially probably more now because I think the React core team is a lot smaller. Yeah, you can definitely do a lot of great PWA development right now. So yeah, don't worry about that. Oh man, Brandon, you're asking all the great questions today. Um, how do you decide what to build around solid instead of just building the primitives? Yeah, I I struggle with this. I didn't I didn't want to, I, like I I always say how I didn't want to create solid start. I hope other people did. I I'm like happiest sitting there working on the primitives. Um, I felt like SSR was a place where it was so complicated and hard to configure that like we needed to think about the primitives there too. Like maybe there's like fundamental stuff. That's why we have stuff like server functions, and why I'm spending so much time looking at server component type stuff because I'm trying to think of like if there's like the web is a unique place like the thing is you can when you, when I'm looking at like the zones you can go like you know like solid native for example most things that aren't the web that aren't the client server model have different natural needs like the the I, I'm while a mobile app talks to a back end you know it's like not being served in the same sort of way. Um, and I know, realize like a lot of people like draw the comparison, like trying to make React Native more like React Web, you know, like that kind of thing where like, you know, you can like have server components and that kind of architecture. And there's probably reasons to do that that I haven't seen. I, so the, thing, the difference is Meta has been using Relay to ship components as JSON or like JSON-S format for a while now. Um, and actually eBay has something similar called the experience service. So like when they talk about this stuff, it's like not the same as the way like we think of it or using it, like from like the public consumer standpoint. And I, I think, 
I think it's funny because like if you split there, like almost everything that's else that's app like doesn't have that same initial load consideration that the web has. You know, the restricted resources, the device consideration. Um, I mean, IoT does care about size, but it's not because of the network. You know what I mean? It's just because of like limited resources, right? So, like, I consider that in the same category as like solid native or whatever, where we could just focus on making the most powerful app like primitives and, and build that the web requires a completely different consideration. Cause as much as you try to hide it, like you're only get in trouble if you ignore the fact that the client and server are different things and that this is part of a full equation. So this is a much trickier problem and why I spend most of my time there. But that's that if that I, I don't hope that answers the question a bit of like why I, I'm been focusing more on that side. Um, but yeah, I, I am always thinking about the primitives trying to streamline it. Like 2.0 is more of a, an opportunity to figure out how to streamline, lower the number of primitives, you know, or deprecate some or transition them and change the boundaries. That's where that's where I enjoy working the most. Um, I keep on trying to you know, write articles and give people ideas so that they can go and build stuff. But then maybe I'm not very good at conveying it and I end up having to build it myself or core team, like people close to me end up building it. Um, but like Meta Framework was one. <laughs> Even the Islands router, the stuff that I showed off for the Solid Movies app demo, I, I, I was like trying to explain people how to build it like last January. You can go check out my dev too. I have like a, I have like a funny article about like the return to server side rendering. Like I've been, I've been trying to like, I was like, I went in the Astro discord in January. I'm like, you guys need to build this thing. And they're like, what are, what are you guys talking What are you talking about, Ryan? I'm like, no, no, trust me. You want to build this thing. And they're, they're like, I don't, I don't even get what you're talking about. I'm like, no, it's like server components. I'm like trying to explain it. And they're just like, I have no clue what you're talking about. I'm like, okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back again later. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't have the privilege, I guess, to all, I, I want to keep on moving things forward. So um, I, I, I do try and be pragmatic by looking at if anything's too big of a chunk, I don't want to take it on. But sometimes I, we don't have a choice if it's important enough. I haven't touched it. I, 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 we've had a handful of libraries. I've got some feedback. I would love if someone like Nikhil took a big interest in it too. I'd, I'd love to try and get some of the feedback back in. Like someone did make a PR about a couple things. I wasn't sure though enough. I needed. To, I don't have enough people tell like talking together about the direction of the custom renders enough to know which of the decisions are the right decisions to make. No one's that invested on the custom renders much. They're more just toy projects. So yeah. Uh, people talking about coffee script, espresso script, tea script. Thank you. Yeah, app stores and PWAs. It's it's a little bit fun because you then you try and wrap it in like one of those like web view things, and Apple has like a whole policy that says like you can't do that. But it's it's unclear because I've seen I know companies who have done it. If as long as they catered the the UI in a way that felt like it was Apple. And, but yeah, the Apple, like, like Apple will not let you just like put a PWA in there and like not use their controls for navigation, all that stuff. So it is definitely tri trickier. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Vitigami, my old startup, uh, made a PWA and got in the app stores, but got an Android. Apple struggle. I, I don't know where that story ended. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I talked to Fred last week, and I think we're now finally on the same page. But that's the thing. It's just the timing and when we can put the effort in to kind of think through this stuff. So I've definitely talked to the Astro guys a lot recently about my thoughts on RSCs and the the future of hybrid routing. Why do frameworks use virtual main domain? Um, uh, well, I mean, Kent C. Dodds already gave us the answer to that. Um, where is it? Uh, yeah, I, it was in here. Something about virtual DOM is actually kind of simplistic, um, to be fair. I mean, uh, there's different versions of simple, but like, I feel like virtual DOM let us 
go to a, a place where we could just be like, okay, just re-render it again. It's almost like a game engine kind of mentality. You just like throw it away, re-render it. Um, and it does it in a way that the performance isn't particularly bad. Uh, I think it also, in that sense, it provides a really nice safety net because like you can't get yourself in trouble. The problem is you also give up a huge amount of control, but like the... I mean, don't get me wrong, you can do terrible things with a virtual DOM, but, like, there's, like, a certain floor for most things. Like, don't get me wrong, you can just keep on piling it on there and just trashing your app. But I think it, it it's fairly sane, is the term I'm going to use, for, like, a default of how to render. It's also easier, as the Leptos guy was mentioning, like, for someone coming in and going, okay, I render this function, now I just render it again. Like, it just it removes the whole concept of, like, what updates. You, of course, how do you ever optimize it? I feel like hooks for React were like, they were like realizing that they actually needed a language to describe change. Like they introduced hooks because they needed to get away from that simplicity. It was like too simple. They didn't give them the control they needed. So they invented a language for it. And in that sense, um, that simplicity has disappeared. And I, I think like, yeah, it really is just that initial benefit of simpler model. Um, and now that we've optimized past that point, um, even like those on the virtual DOM side of the argument will just say, oh, virtual DOM is not important. It's a um, implementation detail. Well, yes, you want to say that because it's no longer simple enough to just explain the whole system as a virtual DOM. Um, and it is a fairly important implementation detail if you have to think of the whole world as always re-rendering. But that's where they're going. That's where the direction they're heading. Yeah, I haven't played with much of it. I know Nikhil's been back to making 3D demos this last few weeks. So yeah, um, I, I, I just need to push him to actually publish it for real. Do you know why it isn't? Nikhil is like a tinkerer. He likes building stuff. I don't think he really cares to maintain Solid 3 in the same way. He, he enjoys 3D, so he's going to play in it. And if you know he'll he'll probably fix bugs and maintain it just because he loves it. But the second that he's not interested, he, I don't think that's where he wants to be at. So if we really want to take Solid Three to the next level, I think we need more investment with people with Nikhil to kind of like bring it in a more organized way. But I think I, I think I think it's uh, I think it's I think it's pretty sweet, honestly. What from what I've seen of it, yeah. Yeah, I'm describe. I'm exactly describing the, the React model in terms of where the simplicity went out the window. I think the VDOM still has all the traits that we were talking about. I but I, I think I think others even on the VDOM side are they need to solve the same problems React solved. Like like Vue did it with reactivity. And Preact is now kind of going, okay, maybe not hooks. I want, and that that helps a bit, but it doesn't actually change the fundamental thing that you're trying to solve. But you get to a certain point with the virtual DOM, you're like, I want to optimize, and you realize that your your choices are limited. Like you can optimize from like a rendering library standpoint, like um, like Dom does. You know, he's doing crazy work there, and he did crazy work back in the day with Inferno. But from like an authoring standpoint, um, standpoint, you need to kind of that's what keeps like that's what's leading to stuff like hooks or signals driving it. Like signals driving VDOM isn't really like naively is not better either. It's actually almost kind of worse. So like I, the, the, there's there's definitely a, a place that like a question being asked to be solved. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Mark. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Mark is amazing. Mark is my hero. All right, we're at five hours right now. Unless there's anything else, I think I'm just going to call it, order my sushi, and have a great weekend. Well, I don't know about all you. Um, let me check Twitch chat, make sure I didn't miss any subscribers. You know, I, I haven't been in here for a while. There we go. We, 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 earlier when I wasn't paying attention, we received a level three hype train emote. So, um, 
there we go. That's that's a new that's new for us. So, no, Twitch looks good, YouTube looks good. Um, thank you all for joining us. This was an epic stream. Honestly, the rust stuff just blew my mind. Um, thank you all. Have a great weekend. See you all next week when we talk. I think about next JS thirteen. <laughs>